morning, everyone. Amanda Zitzman joining you on our live stream this Friday. It is now day 47 in the Aurora theater shooting trial. We expect the defense to rest its case today and then closing arguments are set to start on Tuesday. Now court is expected to resume this morning at 9 a.m. a little later than usual. And over the last three days, the jury heard from the defense's expert witness, Dr. Raquel Gurr and jurors really showed how closely they're paying attention here asking quite a few questions. So as we wait for court to begin at 9 a.m., just a little less than 15 minutes now, we want to begin by going over some of that as it played out in the courtroom. All right. Okay, let's bring the jury in, please. Please be seated. The record should reflect that the jury is back in the courtroom. Members of the jury, welcome back. Thank you for your patience. Uh, there are a lot of questions that you have submitted for Dr. Gurr. Before I ask Dr. Gurr the questions, I have a question for all of you, and I just need to you to answer it by a show of hands. Did two of you, by chance, um, submit questions on the same form? No. Okay. No, for the record, nobody raised his or her hand. Thank you. Uh, please don't infer anything into why I asked the question, all right? Don't speculate as to why I asked the question and don't infer anything from my question. All right, Dr. Gurr, the jury has submitted uh, some questions, and based on the rules of evidence and other applicable rules of law, I have determined that most of them are appropriate. The first question is, how do you know what you inquired about but did not document. Do you have a list of questions that you intended to ask Mr. Holmes? That's a two-part question. So let me repeat the first part and have you answer that. How do you know what you inquired about but did not document? I know from a report and I know from the notes that I took uh, during or immediately after and primarily, but I remember from the many of the documents that I reviewed over time, some of them several times, I remember the details that were uh, provided. The next question is, do you have a list of questions that you intended to ask Mr. Holmes? Yes. The list of questions related to the way that the report is structured were that I refer to as a timeline, starting with uh, the background, where he was born, going year by year, you know, kindergarten, law school, the neighborhood that he grew up in, the move, 
what he will do, what he likes to eat. These are routine questions that I ask everybody, uh, every person clinically that I evaluate. Uh, hobbies, preferences, this is in the background section. Then in the academic history, I go over classes, subject matter, teachers remembered, what was the topic, these are the routine things, one after another. In the social history, starting from friendships, what did you do with your friend, who called, who visited, who came to your home, this is like routine. And for the psychiatric history, probing for presentation of any symptoms that are child appropriate from a lifespan perspective, perspective, attention deficit, anxiety that are more common in children. As we go into adolescent, oppositional defiant behavior. As we go into adolescent presentation, when, when a depression is more likely to emerge, substance use, psychotic symptoms, these are standard questions that I go through and it is based on a, a structured interview that I've conducted many, many uh, times and is applied to every participant. And then it includes also any help-seeking behavior or that parents were looking counseling, seeing a mental health professional, a counselor, activities, playing soccer, any activity that gives me information on the person and reviewing appropriate medical records that relate to each segment in the development. The, the next question, doctor, is since there is no video or audio of your interviews with Mr. Holmes, is it possible that you suggested answers but do not recall? I did not suggest answer to Mr. Holmes. The next question is, since Mr. Holmes did not show neurocognitive deficits across the board, is this a contraindication of schizophrenia? No, it is not, because high-functioning individuals, which are a small portion of people with schizophrenia, because they're a small portion of the population, uh, and I mean th two, three standard deviations from the mean, it's, r it's rare. Most people are within the mean. Most of us are within the mean. To have this level of... Uh, cognitive abilities is well higher than the mean, and the follow-up, so in the neuropsychological eva evaluation is concomitant with IQ. It is highly correlated with IQ. Important in people like that is variability, and there was variability in his performance. Furthermore, the follow-up evaluation showed decline in IQ, commonly seen and documented in people with schizophrenia. The next question is, as a doctor, what are the effects of Vicodin, if you know? Yeah, it's for pain, so it's a pain medication. Um, the next question is, you mentioned that schizophrenia has an onset period of two to three years. Do you find the fact that Mr. Holmes had delusions of murder for at least 10 years prior to the murders a contraindication of schizophrenia as a diagnosis? No, I do not. I said that the common, common, and when we talk about common, it's always a range, always a range. And commonly, when people come to an academic center across the United States, multiple studies, each two to three years, is it possible that the parents will become concerned in a teenager or young adult after one year? It's possible. Is it possible that it will go undetected for many years, and a person coping and gradually decompensating? Absolutely. The next question is, what was Dr. Mel Lepsey's diagnosis that you referred to regarding Mr. Holmes? Uh, I think that I recall that it was, but I have to check that it was a, a adjustment a disorder, but I will have uh, to check more. Uh, I think it was a just adjustment uh, disorder. The next question is, did you ask Mr. Holmes about why he went to such elaborate means via his gear at the movie theater to protect himself if there's no meaning to life? For example, helmet, 
neck guard, leg protections, or leg protectors, excuse me. Yes, no meaning to life was part of his delusion, and I've asked him repeatedly, why didn't you kill yourself if there's no meaning to life? He was afraid to die. The next question is, did Mr. Holmes discuss with you why he chose to commit the murders at the Batman movie? Did his decision have anything to do with the content of that movie? Chaos is in my notes over the notebook when I went over the notebook with him. The movie is on chaos and his perception of the universe and his status was it sitting is in chaos. The next question is, is it possible that antipsychotic medications could change the size of the ventricles of a person's brain even slightly, if you know? There is a large literature, I'll say it briefly, there's a large literature, isn't it? And it is a debated topic in the field. To do the that, you need longitudinal studies. The next question, when you reviewed information from the counselor who walked to the park with Mr. Holmes as a child, in your diagnosis of Mr. Holmes, did you consider oppositional defiance disorder or autism spectrum disorder? Why or why not? What made you rule out autism spectrum disorder, narcissism, or a defi defiance type disorder? For, the, for positional defiant behavior, there was, it was based on an evaluation one time based on some difficulties at home. And my, looking at the record, my evaluation consisted of a quick change that the parents and guidance to the parents of dealing with a firstborn that they might, might not listen as much and increasing communication between them. There was no evidence of any oppositional defiant behavior later on. When seen at age eight, a diagnosis needs to be made in the record for insurance purposes. It has to be made, and this was the best that fit the complaint or the reason the parents looked for help. For all Go ahead. For autism, I considered it, and as I referred to in my uh, written note after the first evaluation, it was a consideration to get more of a developmental uh, history, and this was a question, one of the questions that I provided the attorneys, investigators, who went out to meet with his parents regarding the language. That's how I knew about the language and the grandmother that I, uh, information that I provided to the court. There is overlap, especially in males, higher proportion of males with autism and with schizophrenia. You see it in all neurodevelopmental disorders. And um, there is an overlap in the features. Autism starts much earlier, is associated with significant motor language and inter social interaction deficit. He did not have significant difficulties in articulation, in being clear, in not being engaged with activities that you might see in autism. So I did not think, and his motor behavior, so I did not think, or abnormal like I showed, like a cholelia and repeated movement, I did not think that he met criteria for autism spectrum disorder. But autistic features, especially in males with negative symptoms of schizophrenia, are present. Uh, the next question is, did you discuss with Mr. Holmes, uh, with respect to his notebook, what he meant by a dark night rises? Did he indicate to you that he was the dark night that was finally rising? I discussed it with him. He was not the dark night that was uh, finally rising, but it was more the chaos that, is, that led to the selection of the movie, the specific movie, and that things are changing, but he did not 
see himself as the Dark Knight. The next question is, given your testimony regarding your interest in an experience in schizophrenia, did you consider any other potential diagnosis for Mr. Holmes? If so, which one? Yes, I considered autism, autism as a potential diagnosis, and I considered major depression with psychotic features as a potential diagnosis, but looking at the lifespan perspective, all the information, the presentation was most consistent with schizophrenia spectrum disorder, among that schizophrenia. On what basis did you rule? Good morning, everyone. This is the case of the people of the state of Colorado versus James Egan Holmes, case number 12 CR 1522. The record should reflect that Mr. Holmes is present with his attorneys, Mr. King, Ms. Brady, Ms. Nelson, Ms. Higgs, and Ms. Spengler. And the people are represented by Mr. Brockler, Mr. Orman, Ms. Pearson, Mr. Edson, and Ms. Teach McGuire. We are outside the presence of the uh, jury. Uh, the jurors are just making their way up here, so they're not quite ready yet. Uh, since we have a few minutes, uh, let me inquire if counsel have a position on whether we inform the jurors about the request I granted to wait three hours if a verdict is reached before the verdict is announced. Uh, it seems to me that if I don't tell them in advance that they could tell us at four o'clock someday that they have a verdict and then we would say, oh, uh, we're going to wait three hours and they will not have made plans to stay here till seven or actually eight because it'll take uh, if they reach verdicts on all the counts, it'll take a while um, for me to read the verdicts. So um, it just seems like it makes sense to plan ahead uh, to say to them um, that in the event that they reach a verdict, that um, we'll need three hours to get everybody, to give everybody plenty of time to get here or enough time to get here. Uh, do the parties have any thoughts on that? I, the, the situation I want to avoid is that they return a verdict, say, at 4, uh, one afternoon or at 5, and then we say um, we have to wait three hours, and then they say we can't stay three hours, so we'll come back tomorrow. And then at that point, I would be in a position where I would have to send them home uh, knowing what the verdicts are, uh, and I would have to tell you, come back tomorrow so that I can read the verdicts at 9 a.m. Everyone would know they've reached verdicts, and I don't think that's a good situation for them to go home and to then say to them, but you can't talk to anyone about it and uh, have that risk. So I think the better course would be to say in advance, here's how it's going to work. Uh, and I'm not going to put any limits on your deliberations, but to the extent that you reach uh, any verdicts, um, it'll be a few hours before we can announce them. So what do the parties think? We agree with that suggestion, Your Honor. All right. Does the defense have a thought on this? We would object, Your Honor. I think the concern is just that this may affect their deliberations in some way, and so we would prefer to just let them deliberate as they, you know, as they do. Well, I, I don't know how it would affect it. I mean, I'm, I'm going to tell them that they're not going to be limited in any way, and I have two situations here, neither one of which is um, a situation we want. And I think that the best situation of the two is to tell them in advance how it's going to work. And they can plan ahead and they can do whatever they want in terms of um, if and when they reach a verdict. I mean, I, I, don't, I, I thought about this a lot and I, I don't see how it prejudices anyone and I don't see how it it affects their deliberations at all. It's just telling them in advance this is how it's going to work. And I, I'm not going to say why we're waiting three hours. I'm just going to say, other than to say that we're going to give people enough time to get here, the parties and people, everyone, enough time to get here. So um, I, I think be, be between the two situations that, that 
uh, are possible, I, I would prefer to go with the one where we announce, we tell them in advance how we're going to proceed. So that's that's how I'll do it. I, I actually also don't think it's fair to them to wait and, you know, to tell them until in the event they reach a verdict that they have done so. Uh, because if they reach a verdict at four or five, again, I don't think it's fair. They will not have made plans in advance. I'm sure they'll feel like, well, we wish we would have known. Uh, so I just, um, I, I think it makes sense to, to tell them in advance. So that, that's what I'll do. All right, is there anything else uh, from the parties that we need to chat about on behalf of the people? No, Your Honor, thanks. Uh, Mr. King, uh, do you prefer to call your investigator first and then publish some of the exhibits that you want to publish in full or in part, or how do you want to proceed? Or Ms. Higgs? Yes, Your Honor, we're going to be publishing the exhibits uh, throughout his testimony. Oh, okay. Yes. Right. Okay. Um, and as the exhibits are published, if they're lengthy, I would ask that he, I mean, he can remain on the witness stand or he can step down. Um, we'll do the shortest ones first and the longest one at the end. Okay. I'll, I'll let you um, decide how you want to proceed in terms of the order of publication. Uh, and then I'll let you inform me that you've decided not to play the other video in its entirety, the one that started playing the other day. So you can just... Uh, uh, I'll, I'll in initiate and say that you want to publish some uh, exhibits and you can tell me that you know, you've decided that exhibit whatever it was, the videotape that started playing the other day a few days ago, that you've decided not to play it in its entirety. All right? All right. Uh, let's bring the jury in if they're ready, please. If the jurors are ready, please. You're good. It's gonna be an, it's gonna be an easy day for you. It looks like uh, one of our jurors, jurors 378, is not here yet. So rather than keep you standing, why, don't, why doesn't everybody have a seat? I'm going to step down. As soon as that juror is here and we're ready to go, then I'll take the bench again. All right? Okay, the court will be in recess. Thanks, everyone. Well, good morning and surprise, here we are again. We're waiting for a juror who is not yet arrived at Arapahoe County Court, and uh, so far we don't have an explanation for why yet. Uh, if you've been listening with us, we, we are starting late today, admittedly. Um, the judge called for today to start at 9 a.m., but now a uh, juror is not here and it is 10 past, so we've got some, some more waiting to do. We're gonna cool our heels 
uh, we can resume playing the video that we started the day with, that Amanda started the day with, with all of you, the, uh, the Q&A that we had interrupted when court began, when the judge was asking for some clarification about uh, how to handle the three-hour warning for the um, upcoming verdict and deliberation phase, um, at, at what, and, and how to inform the jury, should he inform the jury, that if they deliver a verdict, say, late in the afternoon uh, on one of the days of their work, that they will still be held there for that three-hour window while the court convenes and all the survivors are contacted and families are contacted to come in and hear the verdict read. The judge doesn't want it to be floating around overnight, people knowing that a verdict is out there. He doesn't want to risk any leaks or anything of that nature. So he's uh, basically going to give us a three-hour window at whatever time they decide to determine their verdict. And he's going to warn them of that for their scheduling purposes. Um, uh, with that, we'll go replay that video and uh, hang out with you while we wait for this one missing juror to return to the court. And the bizarre delusions in nature that are not as common in major depression. But he was depressed, and I did consider schizoaffective uh, disorder, but believe that this was not the most prominent features in his behavior. You may have answered this question already, but I'll read the question anyhow. The question is, could some of the five domains of schizophrenia uh, spectrum disorder also be included in other disorders? For example, disorganized thinking. Yes. Can be major depression with psychotic features, might have some disorganized thinking during exacerbation uh, of psychosis. You can see it in more, you know, older people with dementia, but uh, most prominent, it will be in schizophrenia. The DSM-5, as shown to the jury, says that schizotypal disorder is a personality disorder. What does that mean? People can carry behavioral features that are part of the personality that are long standing and a sort of, this is who they are. So this is considered more of an axis to a second level. I did consider schizotypal personality disorder, but as I pointed out in my report is that the features did fit better um, schizophrenia, and at times, as documented in the DSM-5, if there are previous features that are consistent with personality, you can have schizophrenia and schizotypal personality disorder. But the schizophrenia will be first, and that's on top of the ongoing features. The next question is, because Mr. Holmes always had anxiety regarding oral communications with other people and never had issues of cognition and drugs or alcohol, doesn't that seem inconsistent with a typical case of onset of schizophrenia? Anxiety. People with schizophrenia across age group, before the onset of the psychosis process emerge, it's characterized by high level of anxiety. So the fact that Mr. Holmes has experienced it at a young age made him more vulnerable and likely to have a more severe illness than somebody who was relatively well adjusted, was communicating and at friends, will have a milder form of illness. When multiple factors coalesce, like in any other disorder in the body, the brain gets a, is hit more severely. The next question is, could Mr. Holmes be manipulative regarding the call for action? I do not believe that he was manipulative. He used similar words of floodgates opening. I needed to do that. 
mission with me and with other professionals. Call for action. If you Google call for action, you will see that there are about, in quote, there are about 30,000 references in Google for call for action. It is common. It's used many, commonly. I did not tell Mr. Holmes to use a call for action because it was the last chapter in my book, call for action for mental health to the public. Let's do something about it. I did not use it. Are there any tests shown to show a level of manipulation in a person or client, if you know? Yes, you can check on malingering as part of the personality evaluation. And when it was checked repeatedly, there was no evidence of malingering by the psychology, the psychologist who evaluated him. If he was capable of manipulating, is there a way to know when he was being uh, manipulative? Manip I will use manipulative here in the extent of not revealing all the information and not lying. There were times, and I repeatedly said it in my report and in the presentation here, that it was very guarded. It was like pulling teeth. This was why I repeatedly, part of why I repeatedly saw him. If you'd have been, you know, eloquent and just saying one thing after another, it would have been relatively easy. But I did not see evidence for manipulation. I asked the questions in different ways and repeatedly, and in looking over my note, it was consistent. And in looking at other reports, it was consistent. I did not learn anything new. So I will say guarded. And at times, maybe difficult to, to say, to let me know how sick he was. What states are you licensed in? Pennsylvania. I, tr I t was trained in Pennsylvania and lived in Pennsylvania throughout my professional life. Does having a mental illness make a person insane? No. As a person progresses in their mental illness, does that change? It will depend. Some people progress in the mental illness and remain totally sane and able to function or live in the community without support, sometimes with support, but they're totally sane. As a mental health clinician, isn't it important to document everything in case you are not able to testify? I'm not sure if something precludes me from testifying, like I'm ill or, or what. If this would have come up, for example, it's a good question. If this would have come up and I wouldn't have, I mean, I'd have made every effort uh, to come, but if this would have come up, um, I'd have provided maybe more explanation of my notes and would have asked uh, the defense to have somebody else evaluate uh, Mr. Holmes uh, in addition to me, because people can get sick. The next question is, wouldn't documenting help you defend or support your opinion? And then the, the, per, the juror says, I don't know if defend is the right word, maybe support is better. I don't think so. I think that, you know, when the whole thing is done, sort of at the end of the day, and you ask me if I'd have had to do it again to obtain the information, I'd have done it. Thank you. Back on the record, this is the people of the state of Colorado versus James Egan Holmes, case number 12, CR 1522. The record should reflect that uh, Mr. Holmes is present with his attorneys and the prosecutors are present as well. Let's um, bring the jurors in, please.
Please be seated, everyone. The record should reflect that the jury is now in the courtroom. Good morning, everyone. I should say good Friday morning. Yes. <laughs> it's good to have you back. Uh, Ms. Higgs, you may call your next witness. Thank you, Your Honor. The defense would recall um, Mr. John Gonglack. Good morning again. Good morning. You saw Ms. Sora affirm under penalty of law that the testimony you're about to give will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. I do. All right, please be seated. You te you've testified before in this trial, but why don't you remind us of your full name, please? Sure. It's John Gonglack. Last name is G-O-N-G-L-A-C-H. Thank you. Ms. Higgs, you may proceed. Thank you, Your Honor. Good morning. How are you? Good morning. Um, I have just a couple of questions for you with regard to the um, what, what we've sort of called or has been titled the galactic colonization um, writings that you, we introduced through you the other day, and that was Exhibit DTR-94, okay? Yes. Now, um, when did you get these from Mr. Holmes? I received them from him on February 28th of 2014. Okay. Now, did he volunteer to you that, oh, I've got these writings, please come get them? No, absolutely not. Okay. Um, it, did, did you have to kind of pry that information out of him? Yes. I, I, I actually went in there and was visiting him, and then during the visit I had, had asked him you know, how things were going and what he's been up to and just always very minimal answers. And then I actually asked him about the writings or if he had been writing in his cell. Objection if hearsay is coming, Your Honor. Uh, it's untimely, overruled. Now, um, why, did, why was it that you thought to ask him if he had been writing in his cell? So for some time we were receiving um, video from the jail through discovery and on those videos it was a fixed camera in his cell that showed him 24 hours surveillance of him in his cell and during some of those clips he could it looked like he was writing on a tablet or a notepad uh, and that's that's why I asked him about that okay um did you was that on uh, during the time frame of sort of July to August of 2012 Yes. Now, were you able to see him on any video in September or October of 2012? No, and so at some point uh, near the end of August, the jail stopped uh, re recording or copying the footage of that cell, and so we only received uh, discs of that video footage up until near the end of August, and then after that, we weren't provided anything. Okay. Um, your Honor, at this point, uh, I have some more questions for Mr. Gonglak, but I think it's appropriate at this point to publish for the jury uh, D-TR-94, and we do have 19 copies to just hand out and let the jury read through. Okay. And are you intending to have uh, give the jurors a chance to review the exhibit, the a copy of the exhibit, or are you intending to continue to ask questions while they have the exhibit in hand? No, I, th I think it's appropriate for them to just review it. Okay. Why don't you give it to my staff, please, and then uh, Ms. Robinson and Ms. Robinson will distribute them. And members of the jury, this is the same procedure that we've used with other exhibits, where we're going to give you a copy of the exhibit and then we're going to retrieve that copy after you've had an opportunity to review it. This will just expedite the publication of the exhibit. Your Honor, do you have an indication of how long the jury can review this for? Or if Mr. Gonglack needs to stay on the stand, it's fine if he does. Mr. Gonglack, you can step down or you can stay there. Whatever's most comfortable I'm, I'm fine for here. You. Okay.
while the jury's doing that, would Mr. King and Mr. Orman please approach me?
Your Honor, can I approach Mr. King? Yes.
Yes. All right, folks, it looks like uh, most of you have finished reviewing that exhibit, almost all of you. Uh, is anyone still reviewing it? Just one of you? Okay. Do you, I'll give you a few more minutes if you need a couple more minutes.
Okay, the record should reflect that the jury has now finished reviewing Exhibit D-TR-94 and my staff has retrieved all of the copies of the exhibit that were distributed. Ms. Hicks, you may proceed with the rest of your direct examination of Mr. Gonglack. Thank you, Your Honor. Um, sir, th this is not something that you reviewed with Mr. Holmes, those writings, is that right? That's correct. Left that to the doctors. Absolutely. Okay. Um, I want to talk to you a little bit, just a couple questions about the videos that um, you received from the jail staff uh, from November, okay? Okay. And you're familiar with <clears throat> those three videos that have been introduced into evidence. I think it's DTR-67, 68, which the jury's already seen, as well as D-TR-69. That's great. Okay. Now, were those the, the, the sum total of the video that was preserved by the jail during that November time period? So yes, during that time, so aside from the video surveillance that was continuously going in his cell, there were three other separate incidents that occurred in November that we received on, uh, in DVD form. <coughs> and so there was no other video um, in November that we received from the jail, is that right? That's correct. Okay. Um, now with regard to um, D-TR-69, that's the one video that the, the jury has not seen. Um, is, that a, is that a pretty long video? Yes, yeah, so it's, uh, it's a couple of hours long, and again, it's a, a camera that's fixed in a, in a different cell, and it's running continuously, and that, I think it's a little over two hours okay. in length. And is it, is it fair to say that sort of the last part of that video is just Mr. Holmes sitting in an emergency restraint chair while the deputies monitor him? That's correct. So they put, they place him in an ERC or the emergency restraint chair, and then they leave him alone in the cell for a very long time. And so a great portion of that video on the tail end is just that. Okay. Your Honor, we would like to publish um, the first part of D-TR-69 at this point. Um, if, if the jury, the jury will have it available to them in the jury room should they wish to view the entire thing, but for time's sake, we would just publish the first part. Okay, you may proceed. Thank you. And There's no sound, right? That's correct. All right. Uh, did, did any of the videos from the jail have any sound on them? No, no audio. Okay. All right, would you like me to dim the lights, Ms. Hayes? Yes, please.
Okay, the records reflect that the defense just finished uh, publishing at least part of D-TR-69. Ms. Hicks? Thank you, Your Honor. Um, uh, after that, you were watching that video, after that is when the deputies put him in a, in a, in a restraint chair and leave him for the next several hours uh, while they monitor him, is that right? Yes, and I think it just ends with them coming back in. They take him out of the chair and kind of put him in the corner and then leave the room. Okay. Um, last, I just want to ask you a couple questions about... Um, you recall talking to the jury the other day about D-TR-95, um, which is the surveillance video from Denver Health? Yes. Okay. Um, now... Uh, you also recall seeing Dr. Weintraub testify with regard to um, Mr. Holmes being at Denver Health Medical Center. Is that right? That's correct. And and you recall that he testified that he saw Mr. Holmes on November 19th at around 11 in the morning. Is that right? Yes, I think he saw him just a few hours before I did. Okay. Um, do you recall Mr. Dr. Weintraub talking about... Um, addressing with Mr. Holmes during his treatment of him that he had uh, remained in restraints, put a blanket over his head, told them he had been seeing shadows and may have been frightened. Do you recall that testimony? Yes, I do. Okay. Um, and just to give the jury some context, this video from Denver Health Medical Center that is the subject matter of D-TR-95, um, that uh, time frame is earlier in the morning of that same day that Dr. Weintraub saw him? That's correct. That, that part of the video, I think, was in the early morning hours of the 18th going into the 19th. Okay. And so then he the, met with him several hours after that okay. in the afternoon. So either late night of November 18th into early morning hours of November 19th. Yes, that's correct. Okay. Um, Your Honor, we would ask to publish for the jury d tr dash. Um, 75, not 95, sorry. 95, okay. And how long is this one? Um, this one is about 30 minutes is my recollection. 30 minutes, and you're going to play it in its entirety? Yes. Okay, and again, no audio, correct? That's correct. All right. Um, and just for, so I can clarify for the jury, Mr. Gonglek, the, the surveillance that we received from Denver Health Medical Center didn't have any audio on it, is that right? That's correct. Okay. All right, members of the jury, everyone okay uh, for another half hour? Does anyone need a break within the next half hour? No? Okay. Would you like me to dim the lights? Yes, please. Okay.
The record should reflect that the defense just finished publishing Exhibit D-DR-95. Ms. Hicks, do you have any other questions for Mr. Gangla? Your Honor, I do not. Does the prosecution have any cross-examination? Your Honor, very briefly. Mr. Gangla, when you went to the jail to visit the defendant on February 24th of 2014 and picked up his jail writings, he was aware that you worked for his attorneys? Yes. And those are the same people sitting to my left, correct? Yes, ma'am. And the jail videos that we've seen in the hospital videos were all taken in um, November of 2012, correct? That's right. The one that we just saw um, at the Denver Health 
actually gapped about a three and a half hour period. Is that correct? Yes, you're right. The video was about half an hour, but it, the total time was probably three or four hours. And all of the videos that we've seen this morning from November of 2012, those were all, those were all taken almost four months after the defendant killed 12 people and shot a dozen more at the Century 16 Theater, correct? Objection, Your Honor, to the form of the question argumentative. Sustained. Rephrase your question, please. These November 12th videos all um, occur almost four months after the shootings that occurred at the Century 16 Theater. Isn't that correct? Yes. Thank you. No, nothing further. Do you have any redirect, Ms. Higgs? No, Your Honor, I don't. Thank you. All right. And the jury does not appear to have any questions for this witness. Um, so, Mr. Gunglek, thank you. You thank may you. step down. Mr. King, call your next witness, please. Judge, we have decided not to play any more of the exhibit. Um, which was, hold on one minute, ETR 76, which was the uh, video of Mr. Holmes in the um, cell at the Aurora Police Department. Uh, and so at this time, the defense rests. All right, thank you. All right, members of the jury, let's go ahead and take our morning break at this time, okay? Please make sure that you comply with all my admonitions during the break, and I'll see you back here in 20 minutes. Thank you. Please be seated, everyone. The record should reflect that the jury has exited the courtroom. Does the prosecution plan to present uh, any rebuttal evidence, Mr. Bruckler? Uh, Your Honor, um, the people uh, don't need, see the need to put on a rebuttal case at this time. Okay. All right, so what we'll do is when the jury comes back in, I'll ask you that. And you can uh, say that you're not introducing any uh, rebuttal evidence. And then I'll have some instructions for the jury in terms of reminding them about the uh, admonishments I have been giving them throughout the trial, uh, and also uh, instructions about scheduling and what to expect uh, next week on Tuesday in terms of closing argument, um, in terms of um, the alternates, although I'm not going to announce who the alternates are until after closing arguments, but the fact that we're going to have to, um, by statute, sequester the alternates uh, and keep them here while the uh, other jurors are deliberating uh, and that sort of thing, all right? Yes, sir. Is there anything else at this time before we take a break on behalf of the people? Can I have one moment, Your Honor? Yes. Presuming you're going to tell them that. Just, just a point of clarification, and I, I presume you're going to do this, but... Once we get past closing and there's the issue with the alternates and sequestration, that there would be some instruction that if there is a penalty phase, they would also be required to come back and be, I guess, available for that? I, I, have, I have mentioned that to them before, and so I'm sure they're aware of it. Yes, sir. Um, what I was planning on saying is simply that there's still a chance that they may be needed. Um, somebody may become un unavailable. Uh, for example, during deliberations, and leave it at that, and I think they'll get the point. Yes, sir. So, anything on behalf of the defense? That's okay. Right. No? Okay. Enjoy your break. I'll see you in about 17. Thank you. Wow, uh, um, some interesting things have happened, and so you're getting a look behind the scenes as uh, we, we work frantically to send out all of the push alerts and things that we promise you. But basically, at this point, uh, got to remember to put on microphones. That's what you got to remember to do at this point. Thanks, Andrew. Sorry, Andrew, and sorry, everyone watching. Um, 
the defense has rested their case, and unlike what we expected, the prosecution is not going to call a rebuttal witness. Uh, prosecution will not call rebuttal rebuttal witness. So if you have a 7 News app on your phone, and I certainly uh, hope you do, um, we are getting ready right now, I am getting ready right now to send out that push alert uh, notifying everyone who isn't watching here with us today exactly what's happened. The defense has rested their case. District Attorney George Brockler has just elected not to call Dr. Resnick as we've been expecting uh, f for, for months now. So th he is not going to call Dr. Resnick for his rebuttal case. Um, so things are changing quite rapidly at this point. Um, bear with me a second, folks, as I'm trying to get the, the world aware of what's going on right now here. Um, we, we, are not, we were not expecting it to all happen quite this way. Um, certainly uh, a surprise for all of us here. Um, Defense rests in theater shooting trial. Prosecution will not call rebuttal witness. That message is going to be sent so that everyone here who's not watching with us is aware. Um, and then I have um, Anika, Deb, Andrew, everybody here is, is working frantically to make sure this call gets updated in our 11 a.m. show, online, everywhere else, so that we'll have complete coverage for all of you. But let, let's summarize quickly what happened there today. Um, we saw two videos presented by the defense uh, through their investigator who was recalled to the stand. The first video was to do with the gunman first running into a wall naked and then smearing presumably feces on himself. The second was naked in a hospital bed and, and guards and uh, nurses coming in repeatedly to, to tend to him, cover him, um, etc. Um, so Wow. Uh, let's take a, Andrew, can we take a few minutes, get these alerts me messages ready? Um, Andrew's got some video ready for us to replay just for a minute um, uh, while we get our thoughts in order. But this is some uh, sound from survivors. Um, originally, we thought we would use this to transition back into the prosecution's case. Uh, now we're just going to use it to take a breather for a minute since things are changing rapidly. So, Andrew, let's hit that video for a few minutes and we'll come back and rejoin you very shortly of your friends. Sure. Um. Okay, so I was seated um, somewhere around here. Uh, Petra was sitting in between us because Ethan was sitting right there. Right, please tell the jury about what you witnessed in the theater that night. Well, the we, we got there probably around 1130, like in the theater itself. So we sat there and, and talked. It was, it was a pretty normal night at the movies. Um, and then the previews came on, um, and I remember, uh, well, during the previews, I remember distinctly seeing, uh, you know, people who were very excited to see, them, see these movies. Um, and I remember seeing a, a very large gentleman sitting maybe three seats in front of us during the Superman preview in particular. This stands out in my mind, and him getting up and just being so excited to be there. Um, but then the movie started, and about 15 minutes, 15, 20 minutes into the movie itself, I would say, um, I remember seeing an object uh, basically pass through my line of sight when I was looking at the screen, and it made this like hissing noise, um, and I had no idea what it was, but it landed somewhere around here, um, and as soon as it landed, I remember seeing up here by the emergency exit, um, this flashing light and this very loud noise, like a booming noise. And it sounded to me like, like fireworks. Um, and so I, I'm seeing this light, I think it's a prank, I, I don't really know what's going on, I was very disoriented. Uh, but shortly after that, maybe two seconds afterwards, I noticed that people were screaming, were getting out of their seats, uh, the room was starting to fill with smoke. Um, and about that same time, I just instinctively held my hands in front of my face. And in that same moment, I felt this immense pressure on my chest and basically my whole upper body. And I fell forward in, in front of my seat. Could you describe for the jury how your body was positioned when you fell forward in your seats? Um, so I just, you know, fell into the, I guess you call it a row in front of the seats. and. 
I think I, I fell on my knees, but I think I, I then sat backwards, so I was just sitting in front of my seat. Right. What do you recall happening after that? Well, um, the first thing I remember is that I couldn't feel my left arm at all. It was suddenly completely numb, and I actually thought that it had been blown off or something. And I actually had to look at it to confirm that it was still attached to my body. Uh, and the other thing I remember more than anything was that uh, my neck was just swelling with, with blood and it was bleeding very profusely. Um, and I knew that I had been shot, but I, I really didn't know the extent of my injuries. I just knew that there was something in my neck. And I, I mean, I was scared to death because I thought, you know, what if my artery has been hit or you know, my neck was, was severely injured. So I, I mean, I just remember sitting there and thinking, uh, this, this could be it. This, this is, this might be the end. What's the next thing you remember happening in the theater? Um, so while I was sitting there and I guess taking stock of my own injuries, I remember next to me, Petra screaming at the top of her lungs. And I remember on her right side, Ethan, uh, calling 911. He was on the phone. He had the presence of mind to do that right away. Um, and all along, there was just this, that booming noise. It kept, it kept going. Uh, and it was, to me, it was almost like one every second. I was, it sounded methodical to me. Um, and so that, that was continuing. I was sitting in my own blood. Um, and Pedro was screaming. Ethan was screaming as well. And What do you recall after Pedro screaming and hearing all those gunshots? So at some point, the gunshots stopped. And I don't know why they stopped. I didn't know. Uh, and in that same moment, I saw light coming from this area of the theater. And I looked to my left. And I didn't realize beforehand that there was an emergency exit there. And people were rushing out of it. And I, I didn't really think about it. I just got up and went out the exit. All right, I don't have any further questions for you up at this model. If you could retake your seat on the witness stand. Thank you very much, Mr. Barton. Please tell the jury about what you recall happening after you went through that exit door. So after I went out that exit, um, there's a stairway that leads into the lobby. And I remember going down that stairway with a lot of other people many of whom were covered with blood. Um, and in the lobby, I remember hearing a couple more gunshots and wondering if there was another shooter. Um, but I, I was just you know, moving with this whole group of people out into the parking lot. You didn't see another shooter in the lobby? No. Okay. What happened after that? Well, once I got out into the parking lot, there were, I don't know, maybe 100 people out in the parking lot, sort of confused, Objection, milling about. 403. Cumulative. Sustained. Were you transported for medical treatment? I was. Um, I was transported first to a triage area in the parking lot, um, and then in uh, to the medical center of Aurora. How were you transported to the medical center of Aurora? In the back of a police car. Was there anyone else in the police car with you? There was. Relevance 403. Um, overrule? You may answer the question, Mr. Barton. Yes, there was someone else in the police car with me. He had a... All right, hold on. Next question. Did you observe any injuries on the person in the police car? Objection. Relevance 403. Sustained. <laughs> what injuries did you sustain as a result of the shooting? And just uh, for the record, sustained under Rule 403, cumulative. Thank you, Your Honor. Um, I received multiple shotgun wounds. Uh, so... Do you want me to describe that in further detail? Please do. Um, so I had a, four pellets in my face, um, at least three in my neck, um, three in my chest, three in my right shoulder, uh, three in my forearm, um, one in my right hand, and one in my left hand. You know, if I may approach Mr. Barton with what's been marked as People's Exhibits 4874-2022. 
All right, that seemed like a good moment to interrupt the testimony of Stephen Barton that we were replaying there while we took a moment to catch our breath, and I think we've done that now. Um, in the meantime, we're, we're going to talk for a minute about what just happened today, and let's review, because uh, it is substantially different than what we came into today expecting. So, the defense, as expected, called their investigator and used him to introduce two pieces of evidence the video from the jail cell and the video from a hospital room. Uh, in the jail cell video, the gunman, naked, ran into a wall, smeared, presumably, feces on himself and in his hair, then was held down as five or six uh, guards, officers, came in to uh, get him under control. In the second video, in a hospital room, naked for periods, um, people, nurses, guards, again, coming in repeatedly to cover him or restrain him. Further. And, and so all of that we knew to expect. We knew that was what the defense wanted to conclude with. Um, but both sides have shortened their cases in the last couple of days. We, we expected originally the defense to call a Dr. Gray. They canned that plan. The prosecution, they were expected to call rebuttal witness Dr. Philip Resnick. That has been canned as well. Um, this despite months and months of arguing between the parties. Uh, Dr. Resnick was only introduced in the plan for the prosecution after the defense, at a late notice, introduced Dr. Gurr, who we heard from for the past several days. So George Brockler is apparently quite confident in the way that he handled his cross-examination, almost two days of it, or roughly two days of it, of Dr. Gurr. And so he must feel very confident about the way he handled it, especially after those 70-some-odd jury questions that we heard uh, asked yesterday, and some of those very pointed questions, he must have been pleased with that. That's, that's the, as the best I can guess and speculate. He's, he's pleased with how that went, because they're not calling their rebuttal witness, who was put on their list, following the announcement that Dr. Gurr would be on the defense list. And so um, this is certainly an advancement. It certainly uh, accelerates our timeline. And uh, frankly, besides some finalizing of the jury instructions, not, I'm not sure what else might have to be accomplished prior to closing arguments, which at last word were scheduled for 11.15 on Tuesday. Will that be changed? We'll certainly wait and see. Uh, how the closing arguments are going to go. This is the plan as it was last expressed. Starting at 11.15 on Tuesday, and again, that's now all uh, up in the air. I assume, we're, we're assuming, we're still running with the, with the plan that it's still going to be Tuesday, but at this point, uh, it's, a big, it's a big fat question mark. Assuming everything does go according to the plan that we heard discussed yesterday. At 11.15 on Tuesday morning, court will convene. The parties will be called in. The jury will be called in. George Brockler will be the first to go. He'll have up to two hours to present his closing argument for the prosecution, for the, for the people. Uh, but he says that he wants a warning at about one hour and 15 minutes or one hour and 30 minutes to stop him so he can save some time for a rebuttal to come later. When George Brockler concludes that first appearance, we'll have 15 minute recess. Then the defense will get their two hours to deliver their closing argument. Another 15 minute recess will follow. And then George Brockler and the prosecution will get to use the remainder of his time, presumably around a half hour or 45 minutes. When that's all wrapped up, we'll also get a chance to uh, here, the jury read their final instructions. Uh, there was a list of about 24 of them at last count, and uh, those final instructions will lead us into deliberations, at which point the 12 voting jurors, remember there are 19 jurors now, we started with uh, 24, five have been dismissed over the course of this trial, mostly in a two-week period, um, about a month, maybe less than a month ago during, during June. Uh, there was a two-week period where we lost all five of those jurors. Um, the 19 remaining jurors, mostly females, we'll, we'll have the 12 that are actually voting jurors named for the first time. We don't know. The court knows. The attorneys know, but no one else knows. The jurors themselves don't know. They'll be called out and sent into one room, while the uh, alternate jurors will be sequestered, and that's the word they've used, sequestered, in a separate room, and the judge said he wants to put that on a far area, a far away part of this court complex, which is two separate buildings connected by uh, a breezeway. Um, the judge wants to separate them, uh, just so there's no chance of them bumping into each other at a lunch 
break or a bathroom break or something like that. So uh, sequestered doesn't mean sequestered overnight. Uh, it doesn't mean they're going to be put in a hotel, but it does mean that during working hours they're going to be expected to be there waiting in case something happens to one of the other 12 voting jurors. Uh, assume, assuming nothing happens after um, some deliberation, we'll get a verdict, we'll get a three-hour warning for that verdict, and the judge has said that he wants to do it about three hours of warning, that he wants to give the jury notice of that uh, when he gives them their instructions so that they'll know uh, whenever they deliver a verdict, doesn't matter what time of day, they're going to convene court three hours later to have it read aloud. And the judge also said, depending on how they find, um, it's going to take about an hour to read these aloud. Remember, there are 165 counts in this, two, various, uh, two mur uh, kinds of murder for each of the 12 victims killed in the theater, seven, uh, um, two counts of attempted murder of two different kinds, for all of the 70 people who were wounded or injured in the theater or the escape from the theater. And then there's the one count involving incendiary devices uh, at the apartment on Paris Street. So all of those will have to be read aloud and what the decision is on each individual one. Um, of course, everything's going to start um, three hours after the jury announces they've reached that verdict. So at this point, uh, what Andrew and I would like to do, while well, we have a few minutes left uh, before the, the judge resumes court, returns to his bench and resumes the court, we, we've pulled up that old montage we had of segments from the opening statements. Uh, since these will resemble in, in, in format and in kind um, the kind of procedure we're going to have in closings, we thought it would be useful to look at that again. Uh, it's going to start with George Brockler, uh, and then if we... Uh, Assuming we have enough time, we'll get into the defense with Dan King and Miss uh, Spangler as well. So, uh, Andrew, would you, would you hit that for us, please? On a cool July night a few years ago, about 13 miles from where we sit right now, 400 people filed into a box-like theater to be entertained and one person came there to slaughter them. Hello, 911, where's your emergency? Well, I can't hear you, what address? came there that night covered head to toe in armor to protect him from any injury. The man who brought with him four weapons and hundreds of rounds of ammunition. He's in the courtroom with us today. Now what I'd like to do is just talk to you about victims in this case. What I'd like to do is to focus us on those who were most affected by this conduct. But here's the thing. He made so many victims that if I were to stand here and merely spend one minute per victim, Back on the record, this is the people of the state of Colorado versus James Egan Holmes, case number 12 CR 1522. The records reflect that Mr. Holmes is present with his attorneys and the prosecutors are present as well. I think I'm seeing on my screen um, a list of exhibits. <laughs> so, all right. That the record should reflect that we are outside the presence of the jury. Uh, are the parties ready for the jury? Yes, sir. Sure. All right, let's bring the jury in, please.
Please be seated, everyone. The record should reflect that the jury is back in the courtroom again. Welcome back, folks. Right before the break, the defense rests, and so let me inquire at this time to see if the prosecution uh, wishes to present any rebuttal evidence. At this time, Your Honor, the people of the state of Colorado do not. All right, thank you. All right, would uh, Mr. Brockler and Mr. King please approach? All right, members of the jury, as you heard, the evidence has now be, been completed. Let me talk to you uh, about to expect from here on out. The next step in the proceedings, as you know, is the jury instructions. Uh, and I've mentioned this to you before. Uh, the jury instructions uh, contain the law that applies in this case, the law that you are to apply to the facts as you find them. I give you that law. I give you the instructions. Uh, we've done a lot of work already on the instructions and have made a lot of progress, uh, but we still need to do more work on them. And, um, and then once they're finalized, I need to make copies for each of you. And that's a lot of copies because there are a lot of you. And, and so these are things that take time. Uh, so uh, what we're going to do is uh, adjourn for the day. I, w the lawyers and I will still have some work to do. But I'm going to give you the rest of the day off, which I'm sure um, you can use to catch up on things that uh, you have perhaps neglected as a result of being here for the past few months. 
Uh, and then we're going to take Monday off because the last thing I want to do is have you waiting for us on Monday. Uh, what we're going to do is when you come in on Tuesday, uh, the instructions will be final and copied already and ready to just be distributed to you. And so first thing on Tuesday morning, and we will start at 9 on Tuesday, so you get to sleep in a little bit. First thing on Tuesday morning, um, we will distribute a copy of the instructions to each of you. Each of you is going to have a copy, and I will read the instructions word for word, verbatim, uh, and I will ask you to follow along on your copy as I'm reading them to you. Uh, and then we will... Um, you will get to take your copy of the instructions with you to the jury room uh, for deliberations, at least those of you who will deliberate, the 12 of you who will deliberate. I will ask you that you leave them here throughout the day on Tuesday uh, when you're not in the courtroom. In other words, when we take breaks on Tuesday, just leave your copy of the instructions here on your chair. Don't take them back with you uh, to, to the jury rooms. Uh, leave them here in the courtroom, please. Um, and then there will be an original set of instructions uh, uh, as well that will go back to the jury room with the jurors who are deliberating. In addition, um, I'm going to distribute some um, verdict forms for all of you. And um, uh, what I have planned on doing is having uh, a sample of the verdict form so that I can go through them. And I have uh, randomly selected just one of each type of verdict form. And I will read those here. So there should be five. And I will read them word for word and have you follow along as well as I'm reading them here to you in the courtroom. That's all going to happen first thing Tuesday morning. After I'm done reading the instructions and going through the five sample verdict forms, if you will, we will take a break. And we'll take about a 20-minute break or so, the usual type of break that we've been taking. Uh, and then we'll start with closing arguments after that. The prosecution goes first. Um, and... Um, after the prosecution's closing argument, we'll take a, our lunch break, and we will take a shortened lunch break. We'll take a one-hour lunch break, if it's okay with everyone. So plan for that. Instead of having the usual hour and a half, we'll have an hour lunch. Uh, I have limited the parties to two hours for closing arguments. Uh, that's similar to what we did during opening statements. I don't know if you remember from April 27. I know it's been uh, a few months, almost three months, but... Uh, it's um, the same type of time limit, two hours per side. Now, because the prosecution has the burden of proof, the prosecution goes first. But also, if the defense makes a closing argument, then the prosecution has an opportunity to make what's called a rebuttal closing argument, to rebut or, or attempt to rebut or refute uh, the defense's closing argument. Again, that's because the prosecution has the burden of proof in this case. Uh, the defense doesn't have to make a closing argument because, as I have been reminding you throughout the trial, the defendant is presumed innocent, and that presumption of innocence remains with him and must be given effect by the jury throughout the trial. But if the defense elects to make a closing argument, the prosecution has an opportunity to make a rebuttal <laughs> closing argument. The two hours that I have given each party includes both of the closings that the prosecution may have an opportunity to make. So it's two hours total. It's not two hours for the first one and two hours for the second one if there is a rebuttal close. Does that make sense? Okay. And everyone's nodding their head and saying yes. At the end of the prosecution's rebuttal closing argument, assuming that there is a rebuttal closing argument, um, I will announce, announce to you who the alternates are and who the deliberating jurors are. I want to remind you that um, the selection of the deliberating jurors and alternate jurors has nothing to do with your performance during the trial. It has nothing to do with anything that took place during the trial. Uh, we, uh, the lawyers and I, um, picked certain seats ahead of time, and whoever landed in certain seats is a deliberating juror. Whoever landed in alternate seats will be an alternate um, juror, all right? And so um, there is a, a, a statute in Colorado that requires me to keep the alternate jurors here while the deliberating jurors are deliberating. Even though the alternate jurors are not deliberating and are not supposed to talk about the case and are not allowed to talk about the case, and I will give the alternates that instruction, 
the instruction about not discussing the case will continue to apply with respect to the alternates. I still have to keep you here. I just want you to know that's not on me. <laughs> that's on your legislature. That's the statute. And so I'm following the law. Don't get upset at me. It doesn't make a whole lot of sense to me either, but uh, I have to enforce the law, not apply, not, not make, make up the law. So the alternates are going to be kept here. Now, it's important that the alternates have no communication about the case with the deliberating jurors. And to avoid any temptation or any accidental discussions, what I'm going to do is have the alternate jurors uh, go to a separate place that's not on this floor, a separate place in the courthouse. And in fact, we're even going to change the parking arrangements so that you're not running into each other um, during deliberations. And so that the deliberating jurors will park in a certain area and the alternate jurors will park in a separate area. My goal is to avoid all types of, any kind of contact. And that's going to be my admonishment to you is that Deliberating jurors can have no contact with alternate jurors during deliberations. And so, um, because you may be an alternate juror, just uh, plan ahead uh, after Tuesday in terms of uh, coming back and just, you know, bringing a book or something that you can keep busy with. I'll try to, I have tried my best to, to give the alternates uh, a, a, a room that has a lot of space uh, so that you're not all crammed in there, but there will be seven of you. And so that's how we'll proceed. In terms of deliberations, um, th there is no limit on deliberations. Uh, given the plan in terms of the schedule for Tuesday, my um, best estimate is that it will be uh, close to five but the, by the time we're done, maybe four, between four and five. And it, it just depends. We can't always predict things, but it should be between four and five by, by the time we're done. But just in case, please try to be as flexible as you can on Tuesday so that if we need to stay late, that you can do that. I will try to get you out of here before 5, but um, it, it, we may go after 5. Uh, once I announce who the deliberating uh, jurors are and who the alternate jurors are, uh, depending on the time of day, I'm probably going to uh, simply uh, adjourn for the day, have you go home and come back fresh the next day. And if you're a deliberating juror, we will give you instructions as to where you're going to show up. And if you're an alternate juror, we will give you instructions uh, as to where you're going to go the next day. But you all have to be here uh, when the deliberating jurors are deliberating. Um, and um, even though you're going to be kept separate. So um, in terms of how long deliberations last, that's entirely up to the deliberating jurors. There are no time limits. Uh, in terms of scheduling, uh, I leave that up to the deliberating jurors as well. And so the deliberating jurors can decide within reason. I can't have someone tell me, well, we're going to get here at 430 because the courthouse is not open at 430. So within reason. Uh, so, for example, if you want to get here at 8 or at 9 or 930, whatever it may be, uh, as long as the deliberating jurors are all in agreement with it, I'm okay with it. The, in, yeah, and then uh, in terms of the end of the day, the courthouse closes at 5.30 usually, and you come back the next day, uh, and then the next day, and how, whatever the, the, the deliberating jurors decide. Um, so you generally set your own schedule as to when you get here and when you leave if you're a deliberating juror, as long as the whole group agrees with it, and as long as you let us know and we can accommodate you. Um, let me see if there's anything else on my list that I needed to tell you about. Uh, all of the exhibits that have been admitted into evidence will be sent back to the deliberations room. Um, and so the de deliberating jurors will have all of those, all of those exhibits uh, with one exception. Um, one of you submitted a question about lunch during the liberations. That's a good question. Uh, usually during the liberations, we have lunch brought to you uh, for the deliberating jurors. Now, we're going to do the same thing for the alternate jurors, uh, just to be fair. But remember, the alternates...
cannot have any conversations about the case. Only the deliberating jurors can. And you'll hear one of my instructions that I will give you on Tuesday says that you can only deliberate, in terms of the deliberating jurors, you can only deliberate when you're in the jury room and when you're all present, all 12 of you present. So if one of you steps out for whatever reason, you have to stop deliberations. Or if all 12 of you are together, but you're not in the, in the jury room, in the deliberations room, you can't deliberate. You can only deliberate if you're all together, all 12, and if you're in the jury room, okay? But the rest of you, those of you who are alternates, you cannot talk about the case. Talk about other things. Um, and like I said, bring a book, bring a, a puzzle. Um, we'll try to have some snacks for you to, to help you <laughs> get through the day. But um, it's not my doing. I'm required by law to do it this way. Uh, the final thing is um, those of you deliberating, um, We'll, we'll need to work with us in terms of schedule because keep in mind that the alternates have to be here as well when the deliberating jurors are here. And so we have to coordinate everyone's schedule that way. And so we'll work with you, um, but I ask that you work with us. Uh, the last thing is that uh, we need about a three-hour notice upon um, the jury reaching its verdicts uh, because I need to give the parties and the lawyers enough time uh, to get here for the announcement uh, of the verdict. So upon the jury reaching any verdict, uh, just understand that there will be a three hour gap uh, before I can bring you in the courtroom and before I can read the verdicts uh, to give everyone an opportunity to get here. All right? Did everybody understand all that? Okay, and I'll, I'll probably repeat some of this on Tuesday after the closings, but I thought it made sense to tell you about some of it now so that you can plan ahead over the weekend, number one, and number two, uh, because I think sometimes it's helpful to hear it more than once, especially when on Tuesday you'll be hearing it at the end of a long day, and, and, and so I think it's just helpful to know in advance about that. Mr. Orman, you're standing up. Can I approach with counsel? Yes. telling you about the uh, evidence, um, and I said that anything that has been admitted into evidence will go back to the jury room for deliberations, and so it will go back to the room uh, where the deliberating jurors are, with one exception, and I forgot to tell you the exception. The exception is any, and, and this is a policy that applies to all cases here. It's not just a policy that applies in this case. Any live ammunition will not go back to the jury room. Uh, the, the firearms that have been admitted into evidence will go back to the jury room. If the deliberating jurors wish to have or to, to see the um, live ammunition, uh, they can send out a note, the foreperson can send out a note and ask for that. And what we would do in that case is take back the firearms and give you the live ammunition. So there's a policy that prevents any jury from having both at the same time during the liberations. You can't have firearms and live ammunition at the same time. That's a policy for all cases uh, in, in this courthouse. So that was the one exception that I wanted to, to tell you. And by the way, on Tuesday, you'll see that one of the instructions I'm going to give you addresses um, the, 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 um, whether you have, a, if, if you happen to have a question, how you communicate that to me. So when I mentioned just now that if you wanted to see the live ammunition, the four person can send out a note. There's an instruction that you'll see in the jury instructions on Tuesday that addresses uh, how you go about uh, letting me know that you have a question or something along those lines, okay? All right, was there anything else on behalf of the people or anything else on behalf of the defense? No? Okay, all right, folks, so it's 11.30 on Friday, uh, and so you've got more than half the day to yourselves. Enjoy the rest of the day. Get some rest this weekend. Get some rest on Monday, and then I'll see you here. Please get here on time on Tuesday so we can start on time. Since we're starting at 9, why don't you plan to get here uh, maybe uh, no later than 8.40, just to be safe, if that's okay with everyone. Plan to be here at 8.40, and then we'll start, okay? All right, thank you, folks.
Hold on, hold on a second. Oh, yeah, thank you. Have a seat, please. You almost got away. And the problem is I have astute staff. And they reminded me that I told you that I was going to give you the admonishments. And so I'm going to give you the admonishments. But this time, you can't be mad at me. You have to be mad at Miss Robinson. So it's nice to not be the one that you might be upset at. Okay. So, all right, folks, we started, we started, you know, we selected a jury on April 14. Uh, closing arguments are now scheduled for July 14, exactly three months later. This has been a long process, and as you know, we started selecting a jury uh, in, in January, January 20th. And so um, you've been complying with all my admonishments, and it is important that you continue to comply with all the admonishments. Every single one of these admonishments is extremely important. Uh, and I've mentioned to you before how critical it is that you don't take an attitude of uh, who cares if I just violate one of these one time or nobody's going to find out. It, it, it is problematic to have an attitude like that. And, and so I ask that you please, please continue to abide by all these admonishments because you could create great problems if you don't. Um, the evidence has now been completed and it may be tempting to want to start deliberating. You have to resist that temptation. It is improper to start deliberating until I tell you that you can start deliberating. And that won't be until the end of the day on Tuesday. And on Tuesday, I'll tell you that you can only deliberate when you're all together. If you're one of the 12 who's deliberating and if you're in the jury room and all 12 of you are present. So you have to resist the temptation to deliberate. Even after that, in your own head, on your own, the whole point is you have to deliberate together. And it has to be only when you're in the jury room. Only the, the 12 deliberating jurors are in the jury room. But certainly, for all of you, it's improper to start deliberating, even internally, in your own mind, about the case uh, during the weekend or during this uh, time that we're going to take off, these few next few days. So my admonishments continue to apply. Um, number one, please do not discuss any aspect of the case with each other through any means. You're free to talk to each other and be friendly with each other, but not about the case or about anything related to these proceedings uh, or anything related to your juror service. Number two, in addition to not being able to talk to each other you, about the case, you may not communicate about the case with anyone else through any means. That includes your spouse or significant other, that includes your friends, that includes your co-workers, that includes your acquaintances, that includes strangers, everyone. All you can tell people is that you're on a jury in a trial in Arapahoe County in Division 201 and that we anticipate that the proceedings will be over in uh, no later than August. You may not have any contact or communication with any jurors who have been dismissed. We've gone over this one before, and there have been a handful of jurors who have been dismissed. You can have no contact at all with any of them. There's a juror who's been here watching after she was dismissed, and that has been with my approval. Uh, there's nothing wrong with her uh, visiting and, as a member of the public, watching the proceedings, as long as there's no contact with her and the jurors. That's you. So you can have no contact with her. Please do not talk with any witnesses, parties, or attorneys about anything, whether related to the case or not. To make sure that witnesses, parties, and attorneys do not talk to you, it is imperative that you wear your juror badge whenever you're on the courthouse premises and that it is visible to everyone around you. Your juror badge will also reduce the risk that people will talk about the case in your presence. If you hear anyone talking about the case, please remove yourself from that location immediately. In the event that despite your best efforts, you hear something about the case, please let my staff know that you need to talk to me and then we'll chat. Please do not talk to any members of the media about anything, not just about the case, until the case is completed. You must not read, view, or listen to any news or media reports that may refer to the case. Because there's media coverage of the trial, please be particularly vigilant while listening to the radio, watching TV, 
reading the newspaper and using the internet or any other electron electronic device. I've mentioned this before. The best thing to do is just avoid news channels, avoid news uh, programs uh, to the best of your ability. Uh, perhaps turn the TV off when you know news are going to come on or, or be ready to change the channel. Same thing if you're in your car and news come on. Just change the channel quickly, change the station quickly. If you're on the internet, I have not prohibited you from being under, on the internet, but if a story happens to come up or come on uh, while you're viewing something else, just exit the screen immediately. Uh, don't read anything about the case. Um, same thing with the newspaper. If you see that there's a story about the case, quickly turn the page. And perhaps the best thing is avoid the newspaper. Uh, then, then you have no issues there. Um, Next is you can, and, and by the way, uh, there, as, as I've mentioned before, there are times when the attorneys and I talk about things outside your presence, and the media may report on those things. There are times when the media reports on other things related to the case and not necessarily the proceedings. So it is improper for you to be reading any of that or to be uh, learning about any of that. But even if what the media is reporting on is the proceedings that you're watching, it is still improper for you to be reading about it or, or listening about it or watching it. So you need to avoid all media coverage of the trial. You cannot visit any locations mentioned in the case or conduct your own investigation outside the courtroom. Uh, yesterday, I think an expert, Dr. Gurr, said something like, if you Google this term, uh, you should not understand that to mean you yourselves. You're prohibited from Googling any terms. And she wasn't trying to ask you to do that. She was talking in, in the general sense of the word you. Uh, but I want to remind you, you're not allowed to look anything up on the Internet. You're not allowed to do any investigation or any research on your own related to the case. The reason for that is that your verdicts in this trial must be based solely on the evidence presented in the courtroom and the instructions of law that I give you. Uh, and I've given you uh, this particular admonishment um, using different terminology in the past or different words, it means the same thing. Your verdicts in this trial must be based solely on the evidence presented in the courtroom and the instructions of law that I give you. Next, you, can not, you cannot start forming any opinions about the case until I tell you that you can start deliberating and you must keep an open mind throughout the trial. Uh, this is what I've been, uh, what I was referring to a moment ago. Uh, and, of course, only the 12 of you who are deliberating jurors can deliberate once I tell you that you can start deliberating. But that's not yet. So you have to wait. Those 12 of you who are going to be deliberating jurors, you have to wait until I tell you that you can start deliberating. And then you have to follow my instructions about when you're allowed to do that. Neither sympathy for nor prejudice against the prosecution or the defendant may affect any of your decisions in this case. And finally, remember, folks, that the attorneys have a job to do. They're required to make objections. Please do not hold it against them when they make objections. Uh, they're doing their job. Similarly, please keep in mind that I'm neutral in these proceedings. I'm doing my best to apply the rules of evidence and other applicable rules of law. You should not infer from many of my rulings or from anything that I say at any time that I'm for one side or the other. That would be an improper and inaccurate inference for you to draw. Uh, again, I'm just doing my best to apply the rules of evidence and other applicable rules of law. Um, these are all extremely important, each and every one of them, and each and every one of them is mandatory. So be careful out there and, and make sure that you follow each and every one of these, okay? All right. Does everyone understand the admonishments? Yes. yes. Okay. Everybody's saying yes and nodding their head yes. Thank you. I know you know them by heart, but it helps me sleep at night when I give them to you, so I appreciate your indulgence. In addition, I'm required by law to give them to you repeatedly throughout the trial, and so I'm doing that. All right? All right, folks. Have a great uh, long weekend. I'll see you back here on Tuesday morning. Thank you.
Please be seated, everyone. The record should reflect that the jury has exited the courtroom. Um, I would like to finalize the instructions if we can. And uh, so we've had already uh, a conference on instructions, and we may need more than today. I'm hoping that today will be the, the last one that we need, but if we need another one, then I may ask you to come back on Monday. So how do the parties wish to proceed? It's about quarter to till 12. Uh, do you folks want to take a lunch break and then come back, or do you want to just work, um, continue to work um, and uh, get through them? I spoke to Mr. Orman about this at the break, Your Honor, and I can tell you what my preference is. Um, I would prefer to just take a break now and then come back. Um, I'm also happy to start working on the instructions now, then take a break and then come back. I would like a break at some point, and I explained to Mr. Orman, I was anticipating submitting a theory of defense instruction at the close of all of the evidence after the prosecution's rebuttal and obviously didn't learn until late yesterday that they weren't presenting a rebuttal case. And so I was, I haven't had a, an opportunity to put the finishing touches on that theory of defense instruction, but I think I can probably do that as well as get all of the other instructions we intend to submit to the court together if I have a, you know, a lunch break at some point um, how, in order to, to get that together. Okay, how many, how many instructions are you tendering, do you know? I think four. Four, okay. Mr. Orman? Your Honor, six and one half dozen to me because uh, I agree, counsel should have some time to get that instruction together and, and, and finalize their, their proposed instructions. If we take our, a lunch break now and we take an hour and a half and then come back at what quarter after one, we could do that, or if we could go 15 minutes, half hour, whatever, and then take an hour and a half. I don't know that, I think it'll probably be more efficient just to break now and then come back and, and try to knock it through. That would be my preference as well. So, Ms. Nelson, does it give you enough time if, if we come back at 1.15? I think so, Judge. Okay, then let's do that. Let's, let's uh, plan to take a lunch break and then come back at quarter after one. Ms. Higgs. Your Honor, um, I just have one thing that I'd like to let the court and, and, and obviously the prosecution know. You know, should this matter go to, go to sentencing, we have had, we have struggled to organize our sentencing witnesses because we don't know exactly what the schedule is. And we had anticipated the case going a bit longer than it has and really had sort of thought it would be in August. And it turns out that we have six witnesses that um, are not available the last two weeks of July, would have been available in August, and are available next Thursday. I recognize that we have no idea if we would start, get to penalty or start penalty by that point in time. But if we cannot have them testify in some manner, um, we will not be able to put them, um, we will not be able to present that evidence. So uh, based on Mr. Holmes' right to a fair and reliable sentencing hearing, his right to present a defense, his right to due process under both the United States and Colorado constitutions, I'd ask the court or in the prosecution perhaps to entertain an alternative um, just due to the nature, the dynamic nature of, of this case, the length of this case, and just all the unknowns. I don't know if it's possible to present them, um, have the, the defense question them, the prosecution cross-examine them, have that videotaped so that it's then therefore available to play for the jury should we get to penalty. Um, that would be the option that I would suggest. These people are going to be basically out of, my understanding is out of the country, a couple of them. Uh, on pre-planned matters, um, and some of them, it's due to work or research or uh, other things that they're doing that that's kind of the only time in the last, between now and the beginning of August that that would be available. So I wanted to let the court know that. Um, perhaps the prosecution can think about it, and we can finish discussing it at a later date. Well, when are they available? You said they're available in August, but not in July? Correct. Some of them would be, uh, my understanding is, would be available, you know, in the beginning of August, but I, I think that... Well, if you're... Or, or next Thursday. They would be available next Friday, but we're not in session next right. Friday. Well, in, in, you know, I don't know whether um, the beginning of August will be an issue. It depends on how long the jury deliberates. It depends on when we start with the sentencing phase, if there is a sentencing phase. It, obviously, it's not an issue if there's no sentencing phase. So, um, 
I, I'm not sure that it's right for ruling at this time. Uh, I, I appreciate you giving me a heads up and uh, giving the prosecution a heads up, but um, you know, if we started, for example, uh, say, on, let's say the jury deliberated for a week um, and a half and we started on July 27, it probably wouldn't be an issue because your mitigation case is a couple of weeks long. So um, if we you know, start before then, um, we can, you know, then, then at that point, if it's an issue, then we can talk about it. Uh, but um, I'm not sure that it makes sense, too much sense to talk about it right now. I just wanted to give the court a heads up that that would be an issue we'd like to continue to discuss. All right, Mr. Orman. If I may, Your Honor, there is a procedure in the Rules of Criminal Procedure for requesting a in-court deposition for an unavailable witness that has a specific procedure that needs to be followed. And if the defense files such a motion, I think the court should entertain it. But I just want to say, in case that happens, um, I, I don't think that that procedure uh, came about in an era where jurors could ask questions. And if we followed such procedure in this case, that would completely deprive the jurors of any ability to ask questions. And this juror, jury has shown that they like to do that. And uh, I, I don't. I think that we need live testimony, because the, even even if the witness claims some type of unavailability, and even if the defense can establish unavailability to the satisfaction of the court, the jurors should be able to ask questions. So we would object. If okay. That occurs. All right. Well, we'll play it by ear, and then uh, we'll address it if it if it is an issue. Okay. All right. Uh, let's take our lunch. Oh, Mr. Brock. Sorry, Your Honor. One small logistical matter, and this might be for Mr. King too. Maybe he's already addressed it. In terms of exhibits that we might want available for closing argument on Tuesday uh, morning or the afternoon, as the court has set out, if we give your court staff. Uh, a list by is 15 uh, three o'clock on Monday sufficient time to pull that together before do you want it prior to that no three o'clock on Monday is fine the only the only uh, you, you mean in terms of having them here in the courtroom on Tuesday right yes sir I think both of you have asked for copies of different exhibits uh, we're happy to make copies we don't have the ability to make color copies but we're happy to make copies we can't let the exhibits um, out of our custody. In other words, we can't give you an exhibit so that you can go take it and copy it. Uh, that's going to be pro a problem. So, Your Honor, I think one of the things I'm aware of is we were going to try to copy um, some CDs that, that, or DVDs of the court calls. And I've been told by the smarter people on the team that we could do that inside the courtroom with whatever laptops we have. If that's permissible to the court, we, we'll make that happen. That's permissible as long as it's in the courtroom and my staff can be monitoring it and, and present for it, that's not a problem. But once the exhibits have been admitted, they're in the court's custody, and I can't just let either party or anyone take them uh, without our uh, being present and, and knowing uh, what's happening with them. So Understood. Okay. And same thing goes for the defense. So, all right. Okay, I'll see you back here at quarter after one, Ms. Nelson. I'm so sorry, Your Honor. Just one more thing, just on the subject of exhibits. I just wanted to let the court know that we have, um, with the exception of the, any exhibits that were added to the list that the court staff provided to us this morning, we have gone through and done a very careful comparison of our list of admitted exhibits with the court's list. We have about 10 or 11 items, which actually I thought was not bad considering the number of exhibits we have in this case, where we have some questions or possible discrepancies. And I just wanted to inquire about how the court wanted us to go about resolving those. I can email the prosecution and Ms. Robinson. We can do it in open court. It might be a little bit tedious to do that. I, um, I don't think we need to do it in open court. What I would li I'd like to do is have you confer with the prosecution and then with my staff and then... Um, try to figure out why the discrepancies are there. Do the people have any discrepancies? No? Yeah. All right. That tells me that it's probably on your end. But we'll uh, have Some you, of them have, well, we'll have some you. of them are related to um, descriptions of items and things that we obtained directly from the prosecution. So, but I'm happy to confer with them. First. All right, yeah. And if you would confer with my staff, then as well. Okay. All right. Enjoy your lunch. Back inside the 7 News newsroom, I'm Phil Tenser here with Marshall. Um, 
I mean, just wow. Everything has changed today. You and I have both been working on this along with so many people here in the newsroom for nearly three years. It'll be three years in just two weeks. And suddenly we are jumping days closer to finally getting some definitive answers in this case. And it's really going to come down to who's likely been picked to be on this jury. I mean, you've had all of the testimony right. for ten and a half weeks, I think, or is we fully eleven, ten or eleven weeks. I've right. lost track already, and that's a lot to take in. Um, but they get a day and a half off. They get the rest of today off. They get through the weekend, uh, and then Monday they have off now, and then they s hear closing arguments Tuesday. I wonder for the jurors that go through the weekend here, the seven jurors that we are, that the judge and the attorneys already know are, are alternates, mm -hmm. how frustrating that might become after closing arguments. And right. then those seven are like, by the way, you're going to go into this room and you're going to do nothing because you're not the 12, right. but we need you just in case. That'll right. be, that'll be interesting for those seven. Well, we, we have Dan Recht, our, our legal analyst, who's been helping us throughout this case. He's, he's ready on the line, and I think, uh, Marshall, you wanted to start with a question about well, that. Dan, so you have selected this jury months ago, and now you've gone through all of the testimony. You've done everything you can to persuade the jury as a prosecutor. You've done everything as a defense attorney to instill reasonable doubt. Mm -hmm. Does this decision come down to were you convincing as an attorney, or was this predetermined two and a half months ago when these jurors were selected and maybe there was a juror in there who was going to do one thing no matter what, when you're sitting there as an attorney, do you think that your persuasion did it or do you think it was going to happen no matter what? Oh, I think, you know, a, a jury trial of this length comes down oftentimes to the persuasiveness of the attorneys and their case. I'm not saying it's theatrics, but certainly a skilled, experienced lawyer has a better chance of their side prevailing than an inexperienced, um, not very good lawyer. So uh, it's a combination. Um, but the uh, skill of a lawyer, just like the skill of a surgeon, I suppose, um, is important. On screen, as I ask this other question here, um, with this change of no rebuttal witness, is the you know uh, ABC News producer Carol McKinley just tweeted that the prosecution can now say uh, that they paid for no opinions. Would that be a reason why you don't have a rebuttal witness? It might be. You know, it's curious that they didn't call a rebuttal witness that they said they intended to. It might be that that rebuttal witness. Um, said to them, look, Dr. Gurr did a good job and I'm not going to be able to help you attack her credibility. Um, at, but one doesn't know. It could be what Carol says. I doubt it. That is normally not a big factor, whether uh, you paid the expert or the state paid the expert. Every juror knows every expert gets paid. So I often think that's much ado about nothing decision, a conscious decision that uh, the DA would make to say, you know what, the jury's probably on my side. I heard the juror questions to Dr. Gurr. I don't need to try anything more. Or, hey, I don't want to bore the jury anymore. What, what would go into your thinking of, as to whether or not to call a rebuttal witness? Right. So it could be that uh, George Brockler is thinking um, my cross cross-examination was very effective. I want to leave it there, and that's the last um, they'll hear from any expert. Um, or, as I said, it could be that he wanted the expert to testify, but what the expert was going to say um, was not helpful given how Dr. Gurr testified. So we don't know, it, um, and maybe we'll never know, but certainly as we sit here now, um, uh, it's it's totally not clear why they chose not to call that last expert. Dan, I wonder, this is Phil jumping in now, Dan, I wonder uh, if you can talk to us. When we come back from this lunch recess, we're going to be talking uh, about the jury instructions. And from your experience in courtrooms and, and doing these trials, uh, criminal trials, what things will the sides be debating and arguing over? What things should we expect from this debate? 
Well, you know, the jury instructions are complicated and difficult um, because you're, you, you're having to instruct the jury on the law they should apply to this difficult, complicated case. So it's, it will be a lot of legalese, and frankly, um, I, I suspect no one's going to find it um, very interesting, um, no lay person. Uh, but keep in mind that it is an important factor because what happens right before the closing arguments next week is the judge takes time, and it will take time. I, it could take an hour or so. I'm not sure what, if the judge has indicated what he predicts. Um, where the judge literally reads each of the jury instructions, and they have to do with um, important, very important constitutional protections. Reason, what's the definition of reasonable doubt? Um, how is it that the burden is on the prosecution? What are the elements of the crime? What is the definition of sanity? What is the definition of insanity? Um, uh, what, what determinations does the jury have to make? Um, how do you deal with the credibility of a witness? How do you deal with the credibility of an expert? This is all going to be laid out for the jury, and the very language of those written instructions is going to be discussed and argued about this afternoon, apparently. Dan, isn't that stuff written in state law that the judge essentially is reading from state law? This is the definition of that. This is the definition of the other thing. What, what kind of input are the attorneys allowed in terms of what the jury is instructed? Yeah, um, well, it's actually, in, it's sort of in state law. Um, the elements of a crime are laid out in the statute clearly, but then the instructions to a jury come in a, um, the standard instructions anyway, come in a jury instruction book that is approved by the Supreme Court but isn't the law. So those instructions can be changed depending on the case. It's advised by the Supreme Court. So the bulk of the instructions, you're absolutely right, um, come right out of the forms um, that are in this book. However, there are always tweaking um, issues in a complicated case like this, and always um, case-specific instructions um, that have to be uh, parsed out and worded separately and that there aren't any form jury instructions for. So those are the ones that they will be focusing on this afternoon. And I, I, you know, as I said here, I don't know which those are. I'll be curious to see. Well, at the last opportunity we had to hear about them, there was a list of, of nearly 24. Uh, so there's going to be quite a bit of discussion on this. Uh, anyway, Let's, let's look at the next logical step. After they hear the closings, they hear their instructions. I wonder, Dan, if you can give us any idea from past history here in Colorado, how long might we expect for deliberations on a case that's now lasted, what, 10 weeks, 11 weeks, uh, that's been three years in the making, that has 70,000 potential pieces of discovery in it? Uh, w what kind of timeline are we looking at for deliberations, Dan? You know, there won't, there, in a case like this, there is never a real, real quick verdict. Like sometimes in a, in, even in felonies, um, in simpler cases, there can be a very fast verdict either way, like within an hour sometimes. Uh, I, I would say no matter which way this verdict goes, it's going to take some time, um, hours and probably um, days maybe. Uh, there, are, there is no guideline on this. And it could take days, uh, or it could be within a day. Um, I suspect uh, it will not, um, it'll, I, I don't know. I mean, it's all reading tea leaves, frankly, because there is no guidelines uh, for the jury deliberations. But from um, past experience, uh, I'm going to say it's going to take a day or more, but not a week. Thank you for that. Uh, if I can just for one more question about the next step after that. When they do reach a verdict, the judge has said that we're going to have a three-hour window, and he doesn't want that, it seems like he doesn't want that to go overnight. Uh, he doesn't want it to be, you know, if the verdict comes in at four o'clock, he seems to want to hold the jury, have it read that evening. Um, is there, what do you think that reasoning might be, and is this kind of three hours warning common or uncommon in Colorado courts? 
totally not common. Um, the three hours is an accommodation to the parties, the, vic the victims' families, and the media, frankly. Um, normally, in a case that isn't garnering any uh, publicity, uh, the judge will get the verdict from the jury and let the lawyers know who have been required to stay around the courthouse, and, it's r and the jury verdict is read within a half hour or less. So the fact that he's giving three hours is unusual. I think appropriate because so many people want to hear the verdict, um, but it's unusual. Joining us at this uh, early lunch hour because the defense is rested, the prosecution does not call its rebuttal witness, and essentially the testimony, well, the testimony phase of this trial is now complete after uh, 46 days of testimony. We're on day 47 because day one mm -hmm. was the opening um, statement. Stan Reck, thanks for joining us. I Thank look you, over 12.02. We know the court will reconvene at 1.15. Um, we've done this throughout the 47 days, but this trial is about uh, what happened on July 20th, 2012. We've heard from people who talked about what they discovered and found as a result of investigating that, but this really uh, hinges on the 12 people who were killed, the 70 people who were injured. That's why there's 164 counts directly related to people. Right. And that's, uh, that's two counts of murder two various, in Colorado, various kinds, uh, and two of attempted murder for the 70 who were injured. And it's definitely a trial, the whole pursuit of this trial is pursuit of justice for them. And so throughout this, we've both made this point, but um, it's about their, the way that this crime affected their lives. Whatever the verdict is, this has been a window, and in some ways an intrusive window into what happened to them, and they've, put up with that in order to seek justice in court in this case. Uh, and so what we were hoping to do now uh, is play some survivor sound. And you've, heur you've heard some of this, most of this before, um, mm -hmm. but for the next 75 minutes you'll be hearing uh, from the survivors of the shooting uh, and the people talking on the witness stand of those who did not survive the shooting. So we'll uh, get you back into the courtroom at 115, but for now, uh, the people directly impacted by the events on July 20th, 2012. One of my uh, trips back into the theater, following a trip outside for triage, someone had brought uh, Veronica Mosier down to the front of the theater um, from farther up while they were treating other people. She was um, just inside the door when I walked in. I bent down, felt for a pulse. There was no pulse. The only wound I could see was a wound in the abdomen on the right-hand side. Um, <clears throat> At that point, uh, I saw Sir, um, Sergeant Hawkins, who was an officer at the time, coming down the stairs. I uh, got his attention, said I want her triaged, I want her out of here. He picked her up and carried her out. He uh, felt for a pulse. Uh, later had mentioned that um, he thought he felt one, but he hadn't because his own pulse or something to that line. But Even though, when you first saw her, did you feel that she was still alive? No. Given that, why did you choose to not leave her in the theater? <clears throat> um, her age. I wasn't keeping a child in my crime scene. You know, if there was any possibility, she needed to go. I didn't want my officer stepping over. I didn't want her at the scene. Um, my next recollection is uh, Sergeant John's guard uh, motioned me over, and there was a a girl about six years old on the floor. Did he ask you to do something with regard to this little girl? Yes, he lifted up her shirt and showed me where she had been shot once in the abdomen. And I tried to obtain her pulse and I could not. Why not? Uh, at that point, my own hands were really tingling and pulsing, I would guess from adrenaline. Were you asked to do something with regard to her? Yes, Sergeant John's guard yelled for me to get her and go. Did you do that? Yes, I did. And you picked her up? I picked her up and I ran out of the front entrance of the theater. Were there paramedics around? Yes, yes there were. Um, 
Were you aware of whether or not they transported her? Um, I was aware of the way they looked at me that she had probably died and they did transport her to Children's Hospital. Did you ever learn who that child was? Yes. And who was she? Uh, it was a little girl named Veronica Mosier. After you had taken um, Veronica Mosier and she also known as Veronica Mosier Sullivan? Yes, ma'am. After you had taken her outside, what did you do? Um, I, after I placed her on the pram of the ambulance, I turned around and went back to the theater, at which point I encountered uh, two girls carrying a teenaged black boy who had been shot in the leg. And I said, can I help you girls? And they gave him to me, and I carried him over to where a fire engine was, and I set him with other wounded people next to the fire engine. And then I decided I needed to get inside that theater right now because people were still coming out and yelling, you know, help, help, help. He's, sh he's shooting, he's shooting. How did you enter the theater? Through the uh, rear exit door, emergency exit door. As you were going through that emergency exit door, what did you observe? I could see trails of blood, um, lots amount of blood. Uh, leading up to that back of that door, um, I then saw a saw uh, AR type rifle, um, you know, so a machine gun type rifle had the magazine in it, and it was basically the barrel was pointing in a southeast direction. It is laying on the ground there. Are you familiar with assault rifles? Yes, I am. Are you familiar with an M16? Correct. Does the AR style rifle look like an M16? Yes, exactly. What was the footing like at this area outside of the theater? I stepped over the uh, the rifle to enter that exit door, and I almost fell down. I wasn't sure what happened until I looked down and realized it was the amount of blood that I slipped in and almost fell in. Um, there was just there was so much blood. Once you got into the theater, what did you see? Uh, there's a, like a small hallway, and it felt like forever um, going through that. And I, I know it's probably only feet. Once I got through to it. I, it opened up into the theater. On my right was the screen, and on my left was all the seating. There was some, you know, seating above and some other seating, and then you had the floor and the, the and the uh, theater to my right, the actual screen. Um, it was absolute. It, w it was horrendous. It was a nightmare. Overruled. It was looked like a war scene. Now he's uh, describing what he saw. This is his observation. Overruled. The, the objection has been overruled, Miss Brady. Ms. Pearson, ask your next question, please. What could you hear in the theater? I could hear some type of alarm going off and cell phones. I remember the cell phones. I, uh, after seeing what I saw, you could hear cell phones, and I wanted to pick them up and answer them. But, I, you know, you just, I didn't have time, and you can't. But that was, it was hard. Were you aware of tear gas in the theater? Yeah, as soon as I entered, uh, my lips, my nose, my eyes started stinging, um, which is common with tear gas. Were there people still in the theater, patrons? Yes, there were several people in the theater, officers, patrons, victims, people who were dead. What was going on in the theater at that time? What were people doing? Uh, screaming, yelling, uh, crawling. Other people were trying to help the others that needed more help, trying to get them out of the theater. Officers were trying to help people get out of the theater um, by carrying, by dragging, by having them crawl. Do you have any sense of how many officers were in the theater at that time? I couldn't tell you. Six, five, six, that I remember. Any sense of how many patrons were still in the theater? I want to say a couple dozen. The kinds, what kinds of injuries specifically did you see as you looked around the theater? Um, lots of trauma, such as, you know, holes in legs, holes in arms. Um, People were shot in the face and the head. Chunks of flesh and skin were just missing. Um, some were absolutely unrecognizable. Um, just a whole variety of different types of injuries. Did you take 
action yourself to try to assist the people who are in the theater? Yes, ma'am. What did you do? Uh, going back on my fire paramedic training, um, I uh, decided to start checking to see if we could, if people were alive or who we could, you know, get out of here, who was actually mobile. Um, so I started going around checking pulses and, and breathing and, and talking to people. How did you do that? Did you walk around the theater? Walked around the theater, um, assessing bodies that I saw on the ground. Did you walk up the stairs into the stadium seating? Yes. What did you do to try to, to help the people that you were finding that could be helped? Some, um, you would check for a pulse and couldn't find anything. Um, breathing, couldn't find anything. The ones that you found, I would try and sit up or at least roll on their side so they wouldn't aspirate on their own blood and, and vomit and whatever else was happening. Um, some, you just knew were dead and there was no point in checking. At the point that you had entered the theater, had you seen any fire trucks behind the theater? No. Were there any firefighters in the theater? No. When you were finding people that could be helped, what did you physically do with them? So it was so chaotic. Um, I remember checking the ones, most ones I checked were dead. Um, I remember, of course, the one that I will always remember is the little girl. I had to step over her because I knew she was gone. It continue on, which is absolutely the hardest thing I had to do. But going back on my training, I had to save the ones that I knew I could try and save. So with the absolute knowing that this was far beyond what we're capable of, I exited the theater and I got a hold of Sergeant Redford. I said, we need to start getting these people to the hospital now. And what did you do? I went to my patrol car. I emptied it out what I could to make more room for as many people as I could put in there. I got into it. I drove it up to the rear of the exit and I started loading people into my car. Who do you do you recall the kinds of people that you put into your car on this trip? A couple of them, yes. On the first trip, yes. How many trips did you ultimately make? Four. And you, four trips to hospitals? Four trips to hospitals. Did you go to more than one hospital during that? Two day? separate hospitals. How many people did you transport? Six. When you got your car to the back, was somebody put into your car? Yes. Do you recall what kind of injuries that person had? Uh, they were bringing out a, a female that was uh, shot in the head and I believe in the leg. Did they put her into your patrol car? Yeah, I helped grab, open my door, and then I went around the other side to pull her inside. And um, that's when uh, I remember Officer Williams, I was just telling him I need to hold her airway. You just drive. So he got in the seat of my car and drove us to the hospital. Did you get, uh, where did you get into the car? In the back with her. Which hospital did you go to? We went to university. Is that the one that's down on Colfax? Yes. What was that trip to the hospital like? It seemed like it took forever. I was just trying to hold her airway. She kept gagging for breaths. And it just took forever. Did you ever learn who that woman was who was in the backseat of your car? Yes, it was Jessica Gowie. When you got to the hospital, what did you do? Um, there were people there already. Um, they came out and we helped load her onto a stretcher. And then as they took her inside... Um, I just got back with Officer Williams and said, we need to get back there. So we went back to the theater. What did you see when you got back to the theater? Um, it, there was still, it was hard to get back in to the theater. Um, I believe we almost parked at the same spot and walked, walked back into the back side of the theater. It was still, there was still a lot of people around. Crime and progress are for life-threatening emergency. Okay, is this the Century 16 leader shooting? Yes, Do you know yes. anybody who's been shot? Yes, I do. Okay, who's been shot? 
Just remain, just remain inside the theater. 
if you're safe there, just remain inside the theater. What is your name? My name is Chi Chi Pao. I'm here with my husband, too, Derek. Okay, are both of you are both of you okay? Is there anybody around you injured? I know my husband is okay and uh, I don't know about anyone else. But I think there yeah, are some people injured, someone in front of me and like someone on my side. <laughs> okay, did you did you hear gunshots or fireworks? I thought I think you I saw fireworks. Not fireworks? I know, but, uh, yeah, that's what I saw. <laughs> okay. We do. Like I said, we have multiple officers on scene and the fire department is on the way with paramedics. So just remain in there. If you're safe there, just remain there and they will come and get you. Is where you are is where you are full of smoke? Yeah, I'm choking. I'm just the old couch on the floor. Okay, say that again, I can't hear you. We're crouching on the floor. Okay, and, and is there, there a lot of smoke in there? Uh, yeah, there's still a lot of choking. No, I can't help. I think there are people in here. Please send help. Like I said, we have them. There's multiple officers in, on scene, and the fire department is standing by, so we're getting them in there as quickly as we can. They have to secure the scene first, so just remain there. We'll get the fire department in there. Send someone here. Please, please, send someone here. Ma'am, can you actually see anyone that's injured around you? The police have come in. The police are there? Yes, I'm fine. There you go. got onto my back. Uh, we got the tourniquet on, and Denise would lay down uh, sound, um, right next to me. Uh, as laying down as flat as she can, and D um, Brandon was on top of her. Did Brandon try to do anything to tend to your leg wound? He looked, and he actually was pushing the muscles and tissues that were hanging out of my calf and tried to push it back into my leg. Are you on your back now? Yes. And, and describe for us, if you would, again, using this jury as the screen. Is your head facing to your right, their left, or the other way? They were facing um, to my right. The seats were just to my left. <laughs> and where was your head pointed versus your feet? My head was pointing towards the back of the, uh, into the aisle, but towards the seating. <laughs> you have any idea at that time what's going on around you with the other people? During the, all of the screams, uh, there was a point where I can see between the seats. You can see the theater, and I can see I saw a... a a figure uh, between his seats. I had to assume that it had to be the, the shooter from his stance and that I can tell that he was carrying a weapon uh, across his chest. <laughs> could, could you tell based on your experience with the M16 if that weapon was about that same shape and size as what you recall? During the time, I couldn't say if it was a M16 or any sort of a uh, uh, other weapon, but I can tell it had a long barrel. Okay, like an M16. Yes. You said you could see between the seats. If you would for us, can you hold your hands up in front of your eye to give us some idea of the spacing that you were looking through? Spacing is very narrow, which I would probably give myself maybe this much of uh, viewing distance between the seats. And you're holding up your hands there, and I'm going to ask you to guesstimate. I hate doing this, but... If you had to put a measurement on that distance, what would it be? I would say a few inches. Okay. As you're laying back there, you're looking through the seats, you see this figure, and I'll ask you to describe that figure in a moment. Uh, what's going through your mind? At the time, I believe the, the, uh, the figure, he was walking around, and I can see him pointing the, the gun in a circular motion looks like, that looked like he was searching for more people. Are you scared? Yes, and terribly scared. What are you thinking? My thought process was that he was searching for other people and that he was going to start going row by row and he was going to, anybody that he would see in that row that was still moving, he would shoot. This is your fear? Yes. Here's what I'm going to ask for you, sir, first. Two things. I want you, and we're going to have to do this, I think, twice to get the jury. Would you indicate for us where you and Denise and Brandon were sitting 
And then the next thing I want you to indicate, and you can speak into the mic, is tell us where you saw that figure moving around, okay? So the best of my recollection is that Brandon, Denise, and myself were sitting in this general facility here as close as we can to the, the middle of the seats. The figure that I saw was in this general facility here, the flattest part of right next to the entrance and the exits of the theater. We'll do it one more time, all right, sir? So yes, sir. I apologize for this. Sir, would you do that again for us? So Brandon, Denise, and myself were sitting in this general facility here of the theater seats. And the figure that I saw was in this area here closest to the exit and to the entrance of the theater. <laughs> Can I have that microphone? Because here's what I want to ask you to do. I want you to treat your cane, if you could, like the weapon that you saw that figure holding. If you can, and I don't know if you can move like this, can you show the jury how that figure was patrolling around this area there? Yes, sir. Go ahead, sir. So if my cane is the weapon, if my cane is the weapon, I can see him with the gun holstered up to his chest, and he was pointing down to the ground, looking for other people. <laughs> okay. Thank you. I remember that. Um, sorry, I just need a minute. I remember that there were um, the, the exit door actually opened again, and there were cops at the door that time, and they were yelling and screaming at us to come out of the exit door. Sorry. Nope, take your time. And what do you remember after the cops told you to come through the exit door? Well, I told Ashley that we had to make a decision, you know, we, I could stay or go, but because I was so pregnant, I had to save our unborn child because I knew if I thought Caleb was going to die and I thought to myself, that's going to be the last piece of him that I have. I have to save him. So I grabbed Caleb's hand and he actually squeezed my hand and I told him that I loved him and that I would take care of our of our baby if he didn't make it. And what, what do you remember after that? We ran towards the exit and we jumped over people that were laying on the ground. I don't know if they were alive or not, but we jumped over their bodies and we ran to the exit and I was wearing flip-flops. So I remember um, as we were running out the exit door that the I slipped in blood, and the cop actually caught me because it was a lot of blood. And so what happened when you were sitting out on the curb? They started to bring injured out. The cops started to pull people out onto the sidewalk, um, and some people they started to load into the car. I remember them loading one girl, and they said, I don't think that she's going to make it. I don't think she's going to make it to the hospital. And what do you remember after that? I remember that they pulled Caleb out onto the sidewalk and that um, I could see that he was still breathing, but they had to lay him on his face because of all the blood that was just pouring, and so they didn't want him to aspirate. And then what happened to Caleb when he was out there on the sidewalk? Um, we actually got moved before we were able to see him loaded anywhere. We, I had no idea what had happened to him at that time. So they didn't let you stay with your husband 
on the sidewalk? We stayed on the curb f for just a few minutes, enough for um, me to talk to Jansen. She had come out and she sat next to me and she told me that I think my boyfriend is dead. She's like, I'm pretty sure that he's dead. And I hugged her because I didn't know what else to do. We were all just in shock, I, not believing this was happening. And so I put my arm around her and I remember that when I took my arm off her that there were chunks of blood and of him on me. <laughs> and what do you remember after that? The cop who was with us told us that we had to move out of the location where we were at because they were worried that there was a bomb in a car right near where we were sitting. And where did they take you after that? They took us to, um, it was more towards like the front of the building but at the back of the parking lot. And that was the last time I saw Caleb at that time for, long, for many hours. And did you know what had happened to Caleb at that point in time? No. So what do you remember next after lying on the floor in the theater? We stay we stay there at the on the floor. Um, I remember thinking I was looking back towards the the right side towards the aisle and and, and just thinking to myself if someone comes up the aisle I have to do something and I was just I just I was like I'm going to die that's what I was thinking the entire time laying there on the floor um, we laid there and we laid there until we were told to get up I I stayed down even when the lights came on and they, they basically had to say if you're not hurt get up and get out of the theater. That, that's, when, that's when I got up, is when they told us to get up. What did you see when you got up? I seen Jesse laying there. I, I started yelling his name and I, and I shook him and I tried to pick him up. I could not pick, pick him up and I, I just kept yelling. They once again had to tell us to, um, to get out of the theater, and when you, when you were leaving, you saw bodies around, and um, right when going out of the exit, you saw like rounds on the on the ground going out of the exit when they took us out of the, out of the exit into the parking lot. What exactly were you saying when you were yelling Jesse's name? I, w I was yelling his name, Jesse, Jesse, and. Uh, and shaking him, like I said, I tried, I really tried to pick him up. I could not. And it was one of the big things stands out in my mind that I could not pick him up. I wanted him to come out with us. And you said when you were exiting, you saw some bodies. Do you know if those people were alive or dead at the time? I, I don't know. I don't. Mr. Sproul, sometimes you trail off. I'm going to ask you to speak right into the microphone, otherwise people can't hear you, okay? Yeah, I don't know if, um, I don't know if they were alive or dead. And then you also said you saw some rounds. What do you, yes. mean, by, what do you mean by that? Um, the casings from the bullets, I saw them when we were, we were leaving out, out of that, um, through that area, that exit area, out into the parking lot. Who were you able to leave the theater with? I, I was able to leave with uh, my wife, Chi-Chi, and, and, and Moni. We, we, we all were able to walk out. Was Jesse able to leave with you? No, Jesse could not leave with us. What happened when you got outside of the theater? Um, saw a lot of chaos. I saw uh, the um, Aurora police being awesome. They were they were in charge, you know. They were um, separate, separating everybody, attending the people. They wanted me to check myself, um, see if I got shot because I had so much blood on me. Um, there was there was blood all over the pavement, leading leading out. I, um, I saw the the auto rifle 
on the ground. And um, but um, like uh, the biggest thing that stand out honestly was how what Aurora, Aurora police did. Like the the police were awesome. So after you got outside the theater, what happened to you and your wife and Moni? Moni was separated from us. We spoke to her. She told us that she was shot. She was waiting in the hand and that she was waiting for a transport. Um, they took us away and um, I believe they were separating us into other groups of of uh, people who have family members that were injured and so forth. And then they took us to the uh, Gateway High School. Yes. Okay. Why do you remember while you were down on the ground? Um, I remember hearing screaming and uh, loud noises. Um, I would imagine the gun um, and just smelling um, the, the gunpowder and um, um, and that's it. Now, at any point in time, did you hear your wife say anything to you about what happened to her? Uh, yes. Um, I think, uh, I believe she said I got shot in the head. Now, could you see the injuries of anyone else around you? No. So while you're down on the ground, you're hearing all of these things, what's, what are you thinking? Um, I don't want to die. Can you say that again? I, I don't want to die. So what do you remember after that, when you're down on the ground? Uh, after that, uh, the Quella was in the ground, I, um, I remember um, getting shot. I don't know where. I just felt pressure in my entire body. And uh, I started getting really hot. Did you do or say anything as a result of getting shot at that point in time? No, I kept quiet. Because if he were to go up the stairs, I wanted to pretend like I was dead. What do you remember doing after that? Uh, once uh, uh, Eugene said, let's get up, and uh, we got up, and um, I took a step, and I completely collapsed. Mm -hmm. and, I, and where were you when you completely collapsed? Was this in your same aisle? Yes, in the same aisle, right in front of my seat. Did you tell why you were collapsing at that point in time? Yes, um, I, I collapsed because my leg was shot. Um, I looked at it and I, I knew it got shot there, so I thought my bone was just broken. So what did you do after you collapsed to the ground? Um, I pushed, uh, pulled myself up with my arms and started hopping on my left leg. And were you able to get out of your row while you were doing that? Yes. Okay. And how were you able to get out of the theater? Uh, uh, I, like I said, I hopped down, I was grabbing the uh, side bars that are down the stairs, um, and then we looked for the emergency exit in the back. Were you able to find it? Yes. Okay. What happened when you got to that area of the theater? Um, after we got out of the emergency exit, um, I fell down and I couldn't get up. Were you able to ever get the assistance of anyone to get up? Yes. Um, my friend, uh, Jonathan Luke, helped me, and uh, a stranger that came out of the theater with us, helped me as well. Where did they take you? They took me to the end of the building. And what happened when you got to the end of the building? Um, I collapsed again and I couldn't get up. Could you see at that point in time your injuries? Yes. What could you observe? Um, that a large portion of my leg was missing. Did you notice anything else at that point in time? Um, no. Could you tell if you had been injured in any other locations at that point in time? Okay. Uh, yes. Um, I felt like my back was burning, and I was thinking that I had been shot in my back as well. Now, what happened while you were out on that sidewalk? Do you recall if anyone came to assist you? Yes. Um, there was a, a lady. I don't recall her name. Uh, she said she was a nurse, and she took my wife's shirt and wrapped it around my leg. And why was she doing that? to try to stop the bleeding. Now, at any point in time, did any medical personnel come to assist you? Uh, yes, eventually um, a fireman. At some point, I remember feeling like a, like a sting go across my thigh and hearing like, 
like little beads like bouncing all around me and um, and I remember Jasmine letting out this screech and screaming for her mom Objection relevance. overruled and um, I was just telling her I was like you have to calm down and I kept telling myself that somebody's going to stop this, like this is going to stop. And when it wasn't stopping, I started thinking to myself, how am I going to get the two of them to be quiet so that we could play dead? And, um, and I remember hearing people say, run. And... I look and I looked down the aisle and I didn't see, I already seen that um, Bryson and Tony and Annalise were going and so I got up and I calmly grabbed my purse from underneath the seat and I grabbed my son's hand and we started walking towards the left aisle and at some point I lost Armando's hand he kind of just went and I got towards the end of the aisle and I s stepped down that first step and I looked back and I was yelling for Jasmine to run and I was just screaming I was like run Jasmine run and I looked and I saw her holding her legs and I couldn't understand why she was like, going and so I turned around and um and then I turn around and I look down and um, I see these hands and they're um, waving up at me like in a motion like this and um, I, I grab the person's hands and I lock them and I pull the person and I, and I think it was a male because when I put my hand on his shoulder it felt like strong and I pulled him in between the seats and I bent down and I said are you okay and then I looked up and I didn't see my kids and I and I panicked and then I went in to get up I saw a woman um, laying there on the steps and she appeared to be deceased with some head trauma and so I um, hopped over, I had to step over her, and um, I kind of stopped for a minute, and I kind of looked, because I was still not really sure what was going on, and um, I remember seeing, um, like, the reflection of the blood against the movie on the rail, you know how, how there's steps that go up and there's the rail seating and I can remember seeing the reflection of the blood shiny off of that and people and arms and yelling and when I kind of did I scanned down I could see people on the floor seats they were looking up from underneath their seats at me and um and I remember just thinking okay you know, where's, where's the kids? And then I look to go down and I see a, a male that appeared, appeared to be deceased um, at the bottom of the stairs and I um, jumped over him and I proceeded to go out the left exit out to the lobby. And I, um, when I left the lobby doors, I looked around and I saw people that they were just standing there and I didn't understand and I was just screaming at them to run and I remember running out the lobby doors and I was screaming I was like Armando Anna and I see Annalise she's standing there um, right in front of the doors next to a tree and she's like mom mom and then I start screaming for Armando and he comes running out from the right side there was like a brick partition wall he come running from behind there and um, 
so we get together. And I looked at Craig, and I knew something was really wrong when I looked at Craig. Why did you know something was really wrong when you looked at Craig? Um, because his face was... Um, it was covered in blood, and I could tell that Alex had been hit in the head because of what else was on his face. And what else was on Craig's face? <laughs> it was... Sorry. Okay, take a moment. The flesh of Alex. I don't know how else. So after you see Craig and you see that, what do you do? Um, I didn't want to leave. Craig was reaching his hand out to me, telling me to go. And the people behind me were telling me to go, too. And I didn't, I didn't want to leave him there. So what'd you do? I told Craig no at first, and he's, he said, no, we have to go. We have to go. And so I grabbed Craig's hand, but I grabbed Alex's hand, too. I wanted to take him. I wanted to try and take him with me. Were you able to take him with you? No. I had to run out with Craig holding his hand, and I had to drop his Alex's hand. At some point, there was a loud and like forceful something that hit nearby. It felt like something hit the seat really, really hard. Um, and I saw Alex um, slump to the ground. Um, Amanda started screaming his name and um, shaking him. Um, it was about then that I, I mean, obviously I realized what was going on at that point, um, that there's gunfire and I, I don't know whether consciously or subconsciously I knew that Alex was dead and that we had to get out of there. Um, I grabbed Amanda and said, we need to get out of here. And um, we ran out. So while you were outside of the theater, did someone alert you to the fact that maybe you had some injuries? Um, yes, while we were out in the parking lot, um, I kind of had sat Caitlin and Amanda down um, on a curb somewhere, and I kept going out to try to find someone who could kind of tell me what was going on, um, you know, see if I could find a, a police officer or EMS person to um, find out where Alex might be being taken or, or how we could find out how he was. Um, and I kept having people say, um, you're injured, you need help. Um, and I didn't think that I was, so I would tell them, no, I'm, I'm fine. I'm just trying to find out information. Um, eventually when they started kind of separating us out, um, to, to transport people, somebody finally grabbed me and said, Hey, you have shrapnel in you, you need to get help. And I think at that point, because they were ready to take, um, you know, someone else would take Amanda and Caitlin, um, I, finally realized, okay, I can let someone take me. Were you transported in an ambulance? I was. What do you remember about that ambulance ride? Um, the paramedic in the ambulance was uh, cleaning me off a little bit, wiping a little bit, wiping some of the, the blood and stuff from my face. Um, I remember at one point kind of turning to my right, and there was a, a panel of... Um, you know, medical equipment uh, with kind of a glass or plastic um, case, and I could see my reflection in it, and I could see bits of something on my head, on my face, and I thought it was Alex's brain, and I asked the paramedic um, what it was, and she said that uh, it probably wasn't that, that it was um, pieces of, of fat, but either way, it was pieces of Alex. 
What hospital were you transported to? Um, Parker Adventist. What happened when you got to the hospital? Um, they took me in there and started checking me out for injuries. Um, the detective came in and interviewed me. Um, and they, um, after doing some x-rays, um, removed a, a small metal fragment uh, from below my left eye. All right, if you could tell the jury what this represents. Me. All right. And could you point out some injuries on yourself at that point? Could you see any? Um, yes, on the left side of my face, um, you can still, I think, see some plastic in there. Um, and you can see some scrapes on my left shoulder. All right, if I could have 2968. Great, could you describe for the jury what you're seeing there. Uh, my left shoulder and um, some kind of wound on my left shoulder. I never was able to figure out exactly how I got that. I could have 2969. What does that describe? Uh, my left arm with uh, pieces of plastic and uh, cuts and scrapes on it. 2970. Two nine seven one. Right. So, and what is represented here in two nine seven zero? Uh, my left hand and the scrape on my middle finger. I could have two nine seven one. And what does this represent? Ah, uh, the left side of my face. Um, you can see um, some of the bits of plastic still around my ear and jawline and on my cheek. If I could please have one one two two. And uh, if you could describe for the jury where you notated on that, where you were seated. Um, a couple rows from the back of the theater um, towards the right side as we're facing the screen. Your Honor, if I may approach the witness, which what's already been admitted as 2653. Yes. Thank you. Do you recognize the person in that photograph? I do. Who is that person? Alex Teves. Is that the person you were with at the theater on July 20th of 2012? It is. Have you seen Mr. Teves alive since that date? No, I have not. I have no further questions. Thank you, Honor. What do you recall happening in the theater that night after you saw that canister? Um, well, that canister hit the ground, and you know, you can hear the kind of heavy metal clank of it. Um, heard some hissing after that. Um, and then, you know, very close to kind of that hissing sound coming out, um, definitely there was fire was open there. And what do you mean by fire was open in there? Um, uh, gunshot started firing from the front right of the theater. Um, Pierce got down right away. Um, for me, I've, I've never been around guns or anything like that. I don't come from a hunting family or anything, so I, I just thought, you know, what guy is lighting off firecrackers what's going on in here now were you able to actually see a figure of anyone or could you just see flashes of gunfire I could see flashes of gunfire but through that you could certainly see a, a silhouette behind behind the gun and how would you describe that um, just tall dark um, I you know what I thought at the time definitely was you know is that a gas mask or something over somebody's face and what area of the theater did you see that silhouette in? That looked to be front right towards the exit. What do you recall after Mr. O'Farrell's getting down on the ground? What do you recall you doing that? Um, after Pierce got down, that's when it kind of registered to me, you know, get down, this is actually gunfire. Um, from there, you know, Pierce and I just kind of ducked for cover. Um, you know, I could hear very, very consistent rapid gunfire at the time. Um, I had half of my body, my lower half of the body, my legs were out in, um, in the aisle with being that first seat in the aisle. Um, shortly after, you know, the rapid gunfire crying, um, you know, just a, a very frantic, chaotic scene at that point. And what do you mean by that? Um, you know, you, 
some people were getting up and, and trying to get out of there. Other people were ducked down at that point. Other people were hit and crying and, and screams. Um, things consistent with, with being in a situation like that, I would say. Have you been in a situation like that before, Mr. Robin? Not until that night. Now, what do you recall after you are down on the ground with your legs in the aisle? Um, you know, we're we're down on the ground at that point. I, you know, I asked Pierce, you know, what do we do at that point? He just said, he just said, pray. I could hear Pierce praying. Um, you know, he was kind of holding on to uh, to part of my lower half. I was kind of hanging on to his legs. Um, during that moment, the the consistency of the gunfire certainly certainly slowed down and and stopped for a second. Um, at that point, uh, I was, you know, pushing uh, Pierce and and whoever else was next to him. I was trying to push them in so I could um, get my legs covered. You know, in the meantime, you could hear uh, slightly more sporadic gunfire um, still going on, not as rapid as it was at the beginning. Um, and during this, during me kind of struggling to push these these people in to kind of take more cover, um, that's when I got shot through my leg. What did you feel when you got shot through your leg? Um, just an absolute intense burning pain. Um, I mean, the first thing that actually came to my mind, other than the pain, is just the immediate, you know, rush of blood out of my leg. You could just feel the warmth, you know, down that whole leg, down that whole side. Um, like I said, very intense, intense burning, you know, tore through the muscle. What are you thinking during this time? Um, honestly, there, there's not, there's not much going through my eye, uh, through my mind when I got hit, you know, I almost immediately said, you know, Pierce, I got shot, I got shot. Um, and you know, all Pierce said, he said, so did I. And that was, that was pretty much the last interaction that, that us two had. What do you recall after saying that to Pierce? Um, after saying that to Pierce, um, just whether, whether it was the case or not to me, I felt like, um, the gunfire was sporadic enough and far enough away. Um, so just instinctively, I just kind of, you know, I, I, I got up, um, I took a couple grabs on the back of Pierce's shirt at the time he wasn't responding to me and not able to, uh, to follow me at that time. I mean, I, you know, the, the, the time period, it's, it's hard to me. It feels like a very long time, but I'm sure it was just a couple seconds. A um, couple tugs, and, and that just turned and, and got out of there. What did you think had happened to Mr. O'Farrell at that point? I, I, I thought Pierce passed away at, at that point. You know, he, he didn't respond back to me pulling on him at that moment. Um, and just with the, the gravity of what was going on around us, that, that's just what I thought. What did you do after Mr. O'Farrell wasn't responding to you? Uh, I, I mean, that's, I just, I just turned around. Um, I was lucky enough. I was able to kind of, you know, I just had, I had my hand over the wound, um, just trying to put some pressure on it and uh, limp down and, and out of the theater. And as soon as the scene had started, um, I had heard a, heard just one Heard one loud bang, and then saw what I believe to have been f have been smoke from a fire from a fire fire a fire cracker. What did you do after you saw the smoke from what you thought at the time was a firecracker? Um, I had felt a sort of a sort of a warming numb pain on my on my forearm. What did you do after you felt that warming numb pain on your forearm? Um, I I. I looked and saw that there was that there was saw there was blood on my forearm and I wasn't sure I wasn't sure 
where it was uh, where it was uh, <coughs> coming from. What'd you do after that? I I st I st <laughs> I st stood up and and uh and said and said um said oh fuck what is this what the fuck is this and just kind of kept and just kind of kept just kind of kept wondering what it was and then what'd you do um uh, one of the people I was with uh, Steve um, turned around and saw that s something was wrong and uh, and pull and pulled me out of my seat and started to pull me out of the th And started to pull me out of the pull me out of the theater. But I do remember that same exact door swinging right open and a person dressed in black walked into the theater. How would you describe what that person in black looked like? Um, they definitely had a helmet on, goggles. The only thing that I could see that was not covered up was their eyes. I do remember seeing um, two, uh, uh, excuse me, a automatic rifle. And I do remember seeing something that looked like a shotgun. And I, they were strapped around his neck, kind of like a strap to hold it up. You just said his. Did you know whether it was a male or a female? Sorry, I did not catch that, no. Was there anything about the build that made you think that it was a male? Um, no. What happens when you see this figure walk into the theater? Um, I remember that the figure looked around for a bit. Through, I heard two canisters being, well, two containers were being thrown into the first row of the theater and two pops went off and it emitted a type of gas inside of the theater and then I immediately heard two gunshots at the ceiling and at that point I immediately went to the ground and Jennifer went to the ground behind me. Did you actually see the guns being fired? I saw the first round go up to the ceiling and then I immediately went to the, to the ground. Is it possible that it could have gone up into the stadium seating area of the theater, or do you think it went to the ceiling? I do remember seeing the gun being pointed up. I do not remember directly seeing being pointed this way. After you hear that first shot and you see that first shot, what do you do? I immediately uh, go to the ground uh, and within the aisle that I'm in, and Jennifer fell behind me because she fell on top of me. How are your bodies placed when you are on the floor? Um, Basically laying down, and my initial instinct was to crawl through to the other side. Now when you say to the other side, so if you're facing the screen, you're crawling towards the left side Correct. of the theater? Correct, towards the left side. Were you able to do that at that time? Yes, I was. Was Ms. Seeger able to do that at that time? Ms. Seeger was able to do that too. How far did you get moving down towards the left side? Um, it wasn't until about midway, sometime between where I was now and midway, where I started hearing people screaming for their lives. At the time, it was still processing in my mind if this was real. And at that same point when I was crawling through, the casing of the bullets slid up under the first row of the seats, and one of them did burn me in the leg. What did that feel like? It hurt. It, was, it, was, it, it burned. What do you remember going on? Was there still gunfire going there on? There was still gunfire going on. I do remember the first uh, shots that I heard sound like it came from a rifle. The second one was a shotgun, and then the third one was a pistol. 
Now, what else do you remember you and Miss Eager doing during that time period? Um, I do remember people running towards the left side of the auditorium, trying to make it through the exit of the left side. I was not in that group. I was still on the ground with Jennifer. The people in front of me were scared as well, too. I, in my mind process, I wanted to keep them calm because I didn't want the person to come back around and get us. Now, could you see where the shooter had gone in the theater? I did not want to look up. Did you ever notice if the shooter went to the rows behind you at any point in time? I heard the gunshots go behind me as I was crawling to the left. So I heard gunshots going up this way, but I did not see it because I did not want to look. Why didn't you want to look? I just wanted to keep my head down. <laughs> I did not want to make myself visible or anything. So what happens while you and Miss Eager are crawling towards the left side of the theater? So as we're crawling towards the left side of the theater, the group ahead of me are able, they were able to get up and run towards the exit. I did not see where the shooter was by that point. Um, we did not get up and run instantly. I told her I wanted her to stay close to the ground because my fear was what if the shooter was at the top of the auditorium and picking those off who were going through. So what did you do next? So we stayed on the ground. I told her not to move. Her asthma was getting worse, and she had begging me that we had to get out of here. We have to get out of here. But I did not want to move until I knew it was clear. So once it was clear, I got up. Um, I grabbed Jennifer, and I wanted to run out. An individual came back in and said he could possibly be coming back. And when I heard that, I grabbed Jennifer and went down towards the theater, towards the screen, and I told her to lay down and play dead. Is that what you did? Yes. What did you do after that? I remained quiet. Jennifer could not stop yelling about how bad her asthma was getting. So by the time it seemed clear again, I got up and I noticed behind me in the curtain that there was a gentleman hiding behind the curtain. I, it was not the shooter. It, it did not look like he was wearing the same shoes. In fact, the person came out and revealed himself. He did not want to leave. So when I heard the message that he could be coming back, he hid himself back behind the curtain. And then once, we, once I got the assumption that we were going to be okay, I ran out towards the auditorium. Now, just to be clear, this person who is hiding behind the movie theater screen, you believe to be another moviegoer who yes. is afraid of yes. the circumstances. And you said that you thought the shoes were different. What sort of shoes did you see the shooter wearing? They were more like boots. I remember they were black. Everything was all black. He, whatever shoes he was wearing, it was not all black. It did not match. So how were you finally able to get out of the theater? Um, once everything seemed clear, um, I saw some things that were very uncomfortable in the upper stadium and i'm going to stop here for a second what do you mean what did you see exactly if you could please tell the jury objection um, judge cumulative overruled you can go ahead and talk about tell the jury what you saw um i saw people i did not want to assume if they were alive or if they were already gone but i did see them laying over the chairs and i saw some there on the stairs and Oops, sorry. Yeah, there's some Kleenex up here if you need it. There was one person who was laying on the ground just right before the exit of the lobby. And Jennifer later recognized that that was a person we went to high school with. Do you know who that person is? Um, I heard the name, but we, me and that person were never actually friends. Okay. Did you see anything else before you left the theater? Uh, no. I ran to the auditorium, and as I was in the auditorium, a police cop was coming past me, and he had a shotgun in his hand as well, too. I looked behind me and noticed that Jennifer was not there, so I freaked out. What did you do after that? I ran back in to find Jennifer, and right before I got to the doors of Theater 9, Jennifer was just coming out. She said, I was trying to save him. I was trying to save him. I couldn't. So I grabbed her. We ran out to... The outside and in the parking lot, many people were on their cell phones. There were cop cars and people had, they were stunned at what was going on. My instinct was to get Jennifer to her car, get myself to my car. The fear of in my mind of what happened is what if the cars were rigged as well too with bombs. So, so were you able to leave the theater parking lot? Uh, the theater parking lot was 
where one of the exits was, it was crowded and blocked. I don't think the cops were trying to let everybody leave. But I took my, I was driving a Jeep at the time, and I took it off-road over the hill and climbed a median and left. At some point in time, were you able to go to Gateway High School and get interviewed by the police? Yes. The first place I went to afterwards was my mother's house to tell her everything that happened. And then I noticed that a door to my right, down towards the bottom, near the screen, it was an emergency exit opened, and a figure wandered in. How would you describe that figure for the jury? Um, judging by his posture and stuff, I had gathered that it was a man. Um, was wearing dark clothing, which appeared to be riot gear or combat gear, um, and had what I thought was some sort of toy gun or something with him. Did you notice that the person was wearing any sort of mask? It appeared that he was wearing some sort of gas mask. What do you recall after seeing that figure walk through the door? Um, I heard what seemed like a, a light popping noise, um, as if maybe someone was opening something. Um, and then I heard a hissing noise, and I saw a canister of, I didn't know what at the time until it landed, head towards me. The girl next to me and I both swatted at it, and then it landed at my feet. This actually landed at your feet? At my feet. Right? What do you recall after that? Um, immediately, my partner, Chris, asked, what is that? Um, I bent down to sniff it, and um, since I spent four years in the Navy, I knew... Your Honor, relevance in 403, excuse me. Um, what's the relevance? Your Honor, she spent four years in the Navy and has smelled tear gas as part of her basic training. Overruled? You can continue answering the question, Ms. Richards. Sorry. Um, so anyhow, I knew what tear gas smelled like, and I immediately uttered tear gas, and that was when I begin to stand up to leave my seat. What happened as you began to stand up? Did you realize anything? Um, I heard kind of a popping noise, and I felt like something warm. It felt like splatter my right arm as I was standing. What do you recall happening after that? Um, I recall immediately jumping out of my seat and exiting down the stairs, um, and I ran until I had reached the lobby. Did you recognize anything about yourself at that point in time when you got out in the parking lot? Yes. As soon as we got to the car, um, I realized that my arm was in pain. I said something about it, and Chris said, are you okay? And I said, hurry up, let's get in the car. Um, I was urging him to, and that's when I touched my arm because it was in pain. And when I pulled it away, I realized that my hand was covered with a red substance that I had assumed was fake blood or something. Did you find out if that was fake blood or if that was real blood eventually? It was my blood. Right? And where had you learned that you had been shot? Um, <clears throat> so after we had gotten into the car, we realized that there was a police officer doing construction traffic on the corner of Exposition and Sable. We decided to drive to him since we were new in the area to ask him to instruct us as to where a hospital was because I knew that I needed medical attention. Um, as soon as he flagged down uh, paramedics, I, it was all kind of blurry, that, that particular spot. Um, he flagged down paramedics, and they told me that I had been shot with buckshot. Were you able to get into the ambulance? Yes. What happened when you got into the ambulance? Um, I was immediately administered oxygen. Um, they had begun the beginning stages of the IV, started taking my vitals, and we went back to the movie theater to grab more people. How many more victims got in the car with you? Two. In relevance. Four or three. If you could just answer that question again, please. There were two more victims with, with me in the ambulance. Where did you go? I was taken to Denver Health. <clears throat> when you got to Denver Health, where, did you have any surgery for any injuries? Um, not immediately at Denver Health. They just did the usual x-rays. You're getting the wounds, uh, the terrifying CT scan. Um, the surgeries came later. Right. How many surgeries did you end up having, Ms. Richards? About four or five. Right, and what kind of surgeries did you have to have? I had to have pellets of birdshot removed from my body, um, usually a couple at a time. And could you describe for the jury where in your body you had these pellets removed? Yes, I had at least two in my right arm. Um, I had two or three in my left leg. Um, I had a couple in my back, and then I had at least two, one or two removed from my chest. What happened when you got outside that exit door? When I got outside the exit door, the um, paramedics were starting triage. 
And so I went and sat against the wall awaiting my color to be told how serious my injuries were. Did the paramedics give you guys different colors depending on the severity of your injuries that evening? Yes, they did. Were you able to observe your injuries at that point in time? I was able to observe the injury to my hand, and then I still just felt pain in my knee and my arm. What did you notice about your hand at that point in time? My fingers looked like they'd been put through a garbage disposal. What else did you recognize about your fingers at that point in time? Were they dangling or were they? Yeah, they were just dangling by skin. There was no bone or anything left on my fingers. At some point in time, did you get some medical treatment? Yes, I did. All right, so what happened for you to get medical treatment that night? Um, there was a police car that pulled up and they had put me in the front seat, in the passenger seat, and then they had pulled another um, injured victim in the back seat and drove us to ambulances. Did you know the victim who was placed in the back seat of that vehicle? Yes, I did. Who was that? That was Christina Blosch. Is she one of your coworkers from Red Robin? Yes. What happened after you got into that police car? We drove down the um, grass um, behind the movie theater and we found a row of ambulances. I was then placed in one ambulance and Christina Blosch was placed in another ambulance. Were there any other victims in the ambulance you were placed in? Yes, there was one other lady with an injury to her leg. What hospital were you taken to? I was taken to Denver Health. What happened when you got to Denver Health? When I got to Denver Health, they had started IVs and everything. They took me to do x-rays and admitted me into the ER. Did you have surgery when you were at Denver Health? Yes, I did. All right. What did you have surgery for? I had buckshot removed from my left knee and I had my fingers amputated. Did you have any other buckshot to your body as well? I had a gunshot wound that went in my forearm that went just in and out, straight through. Ms. Leonard, this time I'm going to ask you to raise your hand as high as you can to show the jury your fingers and your injuries. All right. And Good afternoon, everyone. This is the case of the people of the state of Colorado versus James Egan Holmes, case number 12, CR 1522. The records reflect that Mr. Holmes is present with Ms. Nelson and Ms. Spengler, and the people are represented by Mr. Orman, Ms. Pearson, Ms. Stitch McGuire, and Mr. Edson. And we are outside the presence of the jury to talk about instructions. Um, the record should reflect that we previously had a jury instructions conference, and so this is really the second formal jury instructions conference that we have in the case. Uh, before we start, I want to make a record about a couple of things related to instructions. Um, the first one is, uh, I want to confirm that the defense is asking the court to instruct the jury on some lesser included offenses. And, and my understanding, Ms. Nelson, and please correct me if I'm wrong, is that with respect to the counts of first degree murder in the first degree after deliberation and murder in the first degree extreme indifference, you're asking the court to instruct the jury on the lesser included offenses of murder in the second degree and manslaughter. And is that correct? That's correct. All right. And with respect to the charges of attempt to commit murder in the first degree after deliberation and attempt to commit murder in the first degree extreme indifference, you're asking the court to instruct the jury on the lesser included offenses of attempt to commit second degree murder and attempt to commit manslaughter. Is that correct? Also correct. Okay. And I want to make sure that although the people object to the court instructing the jury on, on these lesser included offenses that I just mentioned, uh, there's no dispute here that 
murder in the second degree and manslaughter are lesser, lesser included offenses of murder in the first degree after deliberation and murder in the first degree extreme indifference. The people agree with that, right? Yes, Your Honor, we do agree with that. Okay. And you agree with that as well, right, Ms. Nelson? Yes, Your Honor. Okay, there, there's also no dispute uh, with respect to attempt to commit murder in the second degree and attempt to commit manslaughter being lesser, lesser included offenses of attempt to commit murder in the first degree after deliberation and attempt to commit murder in the first degree extreme indifference. Is that right? They are, Your Honor. Okay, and you agree? Agreed. Okay. Uh, and the final thing is, I wanted to make sure we're all on the same page with respect to insanity being a defense to all the charges in this case, all 165 charges, as well as all of the lesser included offenses that have been requested by the defense, which the court is instructing the jury on. Do the people agree with that? Yes, Your Honor, unless the defendant wants to make it for less than all the charges, but I think it is for all the charges. All right, and Ms. Nelson, you agree with that? Yes, Your Honor. Okay, great. With that record then, let me make a record next about the request for lesser included offenses. The prosecution objected to the defendant's request for the lesser included uh, offenses that I mentioned a moment ago. And under Apodaca versus People, that's A P O D A C A 712 Pacific 2nd 467, Colorado Supreme Court case from 1985, a defendant is entitled to an instruction on a lesser included offense only if there's a rational basis for a verdict acquitting the defendant of the offense charged and convicting him of the included offense where the evidence is such that the defendant must either be guilty of the greater offense or not guilty of any criminal conduct at all, an instruction on a lesser included offense is inappropriate. Uh, and I'm also looking at section 18-1-408 subsection 6, which Apodaca relied on. That statute uh, or that subsection states as follows. The court shall not be obligated to charge the jury with respect to an included offense unless there is a rational basis for a verdict acquitting the defendant of the offense charged and convicting him of the included offense. And I found Ms. Nelson's argument uh, in support of her request for the lesser included offenses mentioned persuasive. Uh, what she said is it's possible and plausible based on the evidence presented that the jury here um, would find the defendant um, not guilty of the charge offenses uh, based on the insanity defense, but then would find uh, that he's guilty uh, of a lesser included offense, such as second degree murder, for example, or um, manslaughter. Um, and uh, it's given that part of the definition of insanity has to do with capacity to form the culpable mental state, uh, I think there's a rational basis for the jury to conclude um, that the defendant had the capacity to form the culpable mental state for after de uh, acting after deliberation and with intent with respect to the first degree murder charges, but then uh, concluding that um, he, um, he, he, um, that, that he might be, uh, excuse me, that the defendant did not have the capacity to form the culpable mental state of intent after deliberation, but he had the capacity uh, to form the culpable mental state, for example, of reckless or, for example, of knowingly with respect to certain types of first-degree murder charges. So um, I, I felt that it was appropriate to, to instruct on the lesser included offenses that were requested. I know that people objected, Mr. Orman, and I'm overruling the objection. Is there any other record that you want to make with respect to that? And Mr. Orman, I think in all uh, fairness, my recollection is that you uh, thought that at least with respect to the reckless, um, lesser included offenses, it was a, um, I thought you said it was a close call, but with respect to the other ones, it was not. And maybe I'm, I'm getting those mixed up. I know that you said at least one of the lessers, you thought it was a close call. It was a while ago, Your Honor. I don't exactly remember 
what our conversation was, but uh, the one comment I would make is, uh, and, I, and I understand the court's ruling, that for the charge of extreme indifference murder, both the, the charges where people were killed and the attempted murder charges, the culpable mental state portion of the offense of murder in a first degree and murder in a second degree or attempted uh, for those charges is both knowingly. The difference is um, for the second degree murder does not would not require uh, circumstances manifesting an extreme indifference to human life in general. I don't I don't know that the circumstances uh, evidencing uh, well you know what I'm saying is part of a couple mental state. I think it's probably a separate element. So um, the I'm not sure that the rationale of they could find him guilty of uh, a lesser offense because they felt that the insanity evidence negated the culpable mental state of knowingly would apply to those charges. Uh, but that's all I, all I have to say at this point, unless Your Honor wants to hear more from me. No, and I had the same um, thought that you had, and I, I, that was the one that caused me um, more concern uh, because... It's the same mental state. It's a mental state of knowingly. But it's one of them requires knowingly with respect to acting knowingly or having the capacity to act knowingly with respect to certain circumstances and results. And the other one, it's with respect to other circumstances and results. Frankly, I don't know whether that would make a difference. But um, And I couldn't find any case law on point that would answer that question. Uh, and I felt that it would be... Um, better to err on the side of uh, instructing on it than not. Uh, in terms of the reckless, it's a completely different mental state, and it's, I think, entirely uh, plausible that, uh, and I think there would be a rational basis for a verdict that would acquit the defendant of the offense's charge, but would find him guilty of a lesser included offense that has a mental, uh, a culpable mental state of reckless. Uh, it's possible that the jury uh, would say, um, the insanity defense uh, prevents a uh, prevented um, prevents a verdict of guilty on, on a, say a charged offense of first degree murder uh, because the defendant did not have the capacity to act with intent and after deliberation uh, or perhaps even to act knowingly, but that the defendant had the capacity to act recklessly. Uh, that to me to me the, the evidence here. Uh, allows for a rational basis for that type of result. And so I think definitely the manslaughter, I think, is the more difficult argument f by the, for the prosecution. And perhaps that's what you were saying last time. And I, I don't want to misconstrue what you said. And whatever you said, there's a record of it. But my recollection is that uh, I think you had a tougher time objecting to the request for a lesser included offense of manslaughter as opposed to the second degree murder. Uh, and um, similarly, um, you had a tougher time, I think, objecting to the request for the lesser included offense of attempted manslaughter as opposed to the uh, request for a lesser included offense of attempted second degree murder. Just for one clarification yes. for the record, Your Honor. I just think this is important because I know many victims may be watching this trial either here or elsewhere because of it being on TV, and I understood the court's remarks, and I know all the attorneys who are experienced trial attorneys understood the court's remarks, to be discussing the plausibility and the rational basis in terms of a hypothetical person looking at the evidence, and that the court was in no way commenting on the court's opinions about the evidence, and that is not what you were doing, and every lawyer in here understood that, but I just want to make it clear, I think we all know that the court was not in any way commenting on uh, its thoughts of the evidence or the charges in this case. Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. And this is this is the discussion we have to have with respect to the lesser included offenses, as you know. I mean, this is what the law requires, and this is what a court has to do. The court has to look at the evidence, and the court has to determine whether there is a rational basis for uh, a verdict acquitting the defendant of the offense charged but convicting him of a lesser offense. That doesn't mean that I have a, a, an opinion on, on the evidence. I'm, I'm neutral in these proceedings, as I have been repeating throughout. That doesn't mean that I believe that the jury is going to acquit or, or not acquit of any charge offense. I'm just um, making a finding based on 
what the law is that I'm required to make. And that is that I have to look at the evidence and decide, is it possible, uh, is it rational that it would be possible that the jury could look at this and say, well, we find the insanity defense convincing with respect to the charge offense of first degree murder, but um, that the jury could also say, uh, but we think he, the defendant would have had the culpable mental state to act recklessly, uh, although not after deliberation and with intent. So, Ms. Nelson, any other record that you want to make or any, anything you want to say in response to the um, dialogue that I've been having so far with Mr. Orman? Um, we do have some, I do have some additional argument to make about the specific language in the lesser included instructions that the court has generated. Right. But I don't know if you want to wait until we get, if we're going to go through each instruction one by one. Yes. Okay. We I will. I just was asking Fine. in general about the concepts. I, I couldn't find any case law on point on the issue that was raised by Mr. Orman, which is that if... If the defendant has the capacity to act knowingly under the first degree murder or extreme indifference charge, then doesn't that also mean that he necessarily had the capacity to act knowingly with respect to the first degree murder charge of, um, um, or with respect to the uh, lesser included of second degree murder? And, and in that case, should I be giving the jury that lesser included offense of second degree murder? Um, I don't. I don't think I need to wade into that area if the court is giving the instructions that we've requested. Okay, I like I said, Mr. Orman. I thought about that. I couldn't find any authority on point, um, and I just felt like it was um, the more appropriate course of action was to err on the side of caution. Um, but that is a, a thought process I had as well, and um, so. All right, let's get uh, to the instructions, and then if we can go. Uh, each instruction one by one, please. Before we uh, start, let me tell you about two things that I noticed. One is, and for the record, we're looking at the last draft uh, set of the instructions that we uh, that I gave the parties. Uh, I think it was on July second, um, so about a week ago, and they're posted. And so they're and they're they're not posted on the on the public website, but they're in the file. They've been filed. So I'm looking at the instruction that starts with In this case, a separate offense is charged against the defendant in each count. Each count charges a separate and distinct offense, and the evidence and the law applicable to each count should be considered separately. Um, that, that, um, that instruction, that sentence that I was just reading, and I'll read it in full, each count charges a separate and distinct offense, and the evidence and the law applicable to each count should be considered separately an influence by your decision as to any other count. Uh, I wondered if it made sense to have a comma after the word um, offense, distinct after the term distinct offense, and before and the evidence and the law applicable to each count. Uh, does either party have a position on that? Make, makes sense to me, Your Honor. Any objection, Ms. Nelson? No objection. All right, I'll, I'll do that. Give me just a sec. And the, the other thing I had was, after looking at the instructions again earlier today, or browsing through them earlier today, it occurred to me that it might make more sense to put the culpable mental state element instruction after the elemental instructions because the jury hasn't heard much, if anything, about the recklessly culpable mental state. And, and if they read that first, I wonder if they might be confused by that. Whereas 
if we put it after all the elemental instructions, then they will have heard the word recklessly um, when I talk about the lesser included offenses of each type of charge offense. Do the parties have a position on that? We're okay with that. All right. Are you okay with that as well, Ms. Nelson? Yes, sir. Okay. I'll do it that way. All right. And, Mr. Orman, I just had a thought. I, something just occurred to me in terms of the discussion we were having. I'm going to look at one other source and uh, do some more research. If I uh, happen to change my mind on the lesser included offense of second degree murder, I'll let you folks know. But uh, at this point, based on what I, uh, the research I've done, uh, I didn't find anything uh, on, on point. But I just thought of another source that I need to look at. And so I would, I would email you folks uh, through my staff if, if that comes up. I would request an opportunity to make an additional argument if the court does consider changing its mind. Absolutely. All right, let's go through the instructions. The first instruction is the members of the jury instruction. Any um, objections or suggestions from the people? No, Your Honor, we're fine with this. Ms. Nelson? I do have one. Your Honor, and I noticed that when the court gave the, this instruction to the jury today, it actually did modify it. Uh, just on the second page, um, in the first paragraph where it states, all you can tell family members, friends, acquaintances, and strangers is that you are on a jury in Arapahoe County that is anticipated to be completed by the end of August, um, especially because this instruction is going to be given to the jury in mid-July, right before they are deliberating, I think it's appropriate for, um, for it to say at the latest by the end of August or by the end of August at the latest. Okay, I will change that. Any objection? I think it's a distinction without a difference, Your Honor. I agree, Your Honor. I, I think that it implies that this case is necessarily going to go to a penalty phase if you keep that language in there stating that the case is not going to be completed until the end of August. I, I will change it. So it will read at the latest at the end of August, okay? I think that this is all part of one instruction. I, I have one more thing on this yes. one. Um, on the last page, um, second to last paragraph, it states, I have asked questions of witnesses during the trial. That did not mean I had any opinion about the facts in the case. I could be wrong, but I don't remember the court asking any substantive questions of any witnesses in the case, aside from reading the questions that jurors have submitted, which the jurors obviously know um, are their own questions that the court's just reading. And so I, I wasn't sure um, if we needed that in there, or if it was confusing to the jury in any way. I think I did ask a couple of clarifying questions uh, of witnesses during the trial. Uh, when they said something and I either did, didn't hear it or perhaps I wanted them to clarify the date or the year or something along those lines. So uh, uh, that's my recollection. Yeah, my recollection was I think a couple times a witness might have said like 2014 when they meant 2012 or, or something like that. And you said, did you mean 2012? Right, right. Okay. I just wanted to point that out. Okay, thank you. All right, let's go on to the next one then. The second instruction, this is... Uh, the charges against the defendant are not evidence, or it starts with that. And just so that it's clear, Ms. Nelson, are you asking to incorporate by reference the record that you made before so you don't have to repeat it again? Indeed, Your Honor, I was going to say, say that um, for each of these. But yes, I do incorporate by reference all of the arguments that I made at the previous charging conference in June. Okay. And same thing for the people, right? I don't remember making any objections, but... To the extent we did, yes, Your Honor. Okay, great. All right, anything additional then with respect to this instruction at this time from the people? No, Your Honor. From the defense? Nothing additional to what I argued previously. Okay, the next instruction is the uh, stock uh, presumption of innocence, reasonable doubt, uh, burden of proof. Uh, actually, the order is presumption of innocence, burden of proof, reasonable doubt. Anything from the people on this one, Mr. Orman? No, Your Honor. Anything from the defense on this one? Nothing additional. All right, the next one is the number of witnesses testifying for or against a certain fact. Anything additional from the people? No, Your Honor. Anything additional from the defense? No, Your Honor. The next one is the credibility instruction. Again, it's the stock instruction in the model uh, jury instructions. Anything from the people? No, Your Honor. Anything additional from the defense? No, Your Honor. The next one is expert testimony. Anything additional from the people? No, Your Honor. Thank you. Anything additional from the defense? No, Your Honor. 
The next one is the definition of direct and circumstantial evidence. Anything from the people on this one? No, Your Honor. Anything additional from you, Ms. Nelson? No, Your Honor. Next, we have the limited purpose instruction. Anything on behalf of the people on this one? No, Your Honor, can I make a request? Yes. Since we're going through these really fast and I, I feel sort of like a yo-yo, would it be possible for me to answer these your, your questions sitting down for this purpose? Yes. Okay. That's Thank fine. You. May I make the same request? Well, I don't know. Is it going to make you feel like a yo-yo if you don't <laughs> stay seated? Yes. I incorporate course. by reference Mr. Orman's arguments. Okay. I don't want anybody to feel like a yo-yo. Okay. All right. So, Mr. Orman, now that you're sitting down, uh, anything additional with respect to this one? No, Your Honor, Miss Miss uh, Pearson tells me it was more like a jack in the box. Jack in the box, yes. You sounded much more comfortable now, so I'm glad you're sitting down. All right, uh, Miss Nelson, what about you? Anything additional from you on this one? I'm sorry, are we talking about the right not to testify or the um, limited, limited purpose? purpose? No, nothing additional. Um, next one is the uh, right not to testify instruction. Anything additional from the people? No, Your Honor, thank you. Anything additional from you, Miss Nelson? Nothing additional. Okay. The next one is, uh, in this case, a separate offense is charged against a defendant in each count. Anything additional from the people? No, Your Honor. Anything additional from the defense? No. And you'll see, Ms. Nelson, that this one reflects that the prosecution, that it says that the fact that the jury may find the defendant guilty, not guilty, or not guilty by reason of insanity of one of the charged offenses should not control uh, its verdict as to any other charge offense against a defendant. It also says that the defendant may be found guilty, not guilty, or not guilty by reason of insanity of any one or all of the charge offenses. And that was important based on the case law that um, I cited to you last week when I gave you this set of instructions. Um, I think it was Collins, People versus Collins, a Colorado Supreme Court case. It was, and the other one is Bailecki, People versus Bailecki, B-I-E-L-E-C-K-I. -E -E Collins is cited at 752 Pacific 2nd, 93. Bailecki is cited at 964 Pacific 2nd um, at 598. And I don't know if that, I think it's 598 where it starts. And then also it's based on the statute that I cited last week, 16-8-104. Dash 105.5 subsection 3. And Your Honor, I, I do have some arguments I'd like to make about the verdict forms. I'll wait till we get there, but okay. I don't have an objection to this um, instruction in and of itself. Okay, great. Uh, for now, the next one in my stack is the culpable mental state um, instruction, although I'm going to move it to after all the elemental instructions and right before the insanity defense instruction. But since it's in this uh, order right now, uh, and I think this is the draft that's on file, let's just talk about it now. Anything additional with respect to this instruction uh, from the people? Yes, Your Honor. Um, the issue I see with this instruction, which I believe is taken from the new model jury instructions that the Supreme Court has promulgated, is that it uses the phrase culpable state of mind instead of culpable mental state. The insanity instruction uses the term culpable mental state. And I think that for consistency, they should be the same because it may be confusing to jurors when we say culpable mental state and they look and they say, then I could see a question from a juror coming back to the court. Is that the same thing? So I think we should just change this to culpable mental state. And that would mean changing it throughout then. Yeah, I think this is the only instruction that has that that phrase in it, but throughout this instruction, yes. Right. Okay. Ms. Nelson, any objection? No. All right. I agree with that suggestion, so I'll make that change. Give me a second. Uh, anything else from you, Ms. Nelson, with respect to this instruction? No, Your Honor. All right. Next, we have the definitional instruction. Anything additional from the people? No, Your Honor. Thank you. Anything additional from the defense? <coughs> Excuse me, Your Honor. I do have some issues with um, the part of the instruction that, that discusses the verdict form, but because it's all connected to my general objections and issues with the verdict form, Perhaps it would make sense to just wait and talk about the verdict form um, when we get to the end of these instructions and make one 
comprehensive argument about it. Oh, where it. it says verdict questions? It explain it, it, just the, the discussion of part A of the verdict form um, and, and how the jury should go about filling out the verdict form. Um, Wait, I, I think you're, you may be looking at the wrong one. I'm, oh. I'm, I'm looking at the definitional instruction that says, in this case, certain words and phrases have particular meanings. Oh, no, nothing. No, I'm sorry. I got ahead of you. No, nothing on that. Okay, so you're okay with that one, right? Okay. All right, let's go to the elemental instructions now. The first elemental instruction is related to the uh, charge uh, or the charges of murder in the first degree after deliberation, and it applies to counts 1 through 12. Is there anything additional on behalf of the people with respect to this instruction? No, Your Honor. Anything additional from the defense with respect to this instruction? This is the instruction I was referring to a moment ago. Um, I do have some, some things to say about the, about the verdict forms, and then that in turn relates to the last part of this instruction, telling the jury how to complete the verdict form. So I think it probably makes sense to talk, to, talk about the verdict forms when we get there and just make an argument about um, how the instructions relate to the verdict form when I make my argument about the, the verdict forms themselves, if that's okay with the court. That's okay with me, as long as you remind me to come back to this if we change anything in the verdict forms. Okay. Okay. All right, the next one is the lesser included offense, offenses with respect to the charges of murder in the first degree after deliberation. And Mr. Orman, other than the fact that you object to the lesser included offense of second degree murder, uh, anything additional with respect to this instruction? No, Your Honor. All right, Ms. Nelson, anything additional from you with respect to this instruction? Yes, Your Honor, this is the lesser included instruction. I'm yes. sorry, I, I got a little bit out of order again. Um, yes, this yes. Is the, this is the lesser included uh, instruction with respect to the charges of murder in the first degree after deliberation, and it includes the lesser included offenses of uh, murder in the second degree and manslaughter. Yes, Your Honor, I um, we object to the first paragraph. I understand that it's taken from the model instructions. I understand what the court's position is probably going to be. Nevertheless, I'd like to make a record that um, we do object to the language in that first paragraph. If you are not satisfied beyond a reasonable doubt that the defendant is guilty of the charged offense in account listed in instruction, etc. Um, because it doesn't c convey to the jury clearly enough what Colorado law is, which is that the jury need not acquit um, a defendant of a greater offense in order to consider a lesser included offense. And it was for that reason that we proposed the, um, the language that, that we submitted with our proposed instructions on the lesser included offenses. Um, and I'm referring specifically to the first and second paragraphs of those instructions, um, which read, our proposal would be to stay, simply state the offense of first degree murder after deliberation necessarily includes the lesser offenses of second degree murder and reckless manslaughter and then an additional paragraph stating you do not need to unanimously agree that Mr. Holmes is not guilty of a greater charge in order to consider whether he is guilty of a lesser offense. The law does not restrict the order in which you may consider the various offenses. Um, and we base our argument on the case law cited in our proposed instructions and um, also on Mr. Holmes's constitutional rights to um, to present a defense, to due process, to a fair and impartial jury, as well as the heightened reliability that's required by the Eighth Amendment and Article Two, Section Twenty of the Colorado Constitution, because this is a case in which um, the death penalty is um, is being sought. And I would specifically cite to uh, Beck versus Alabama, which is a case that we've cited throughout these proceedings, because the concern is that. Um, the instructions as they are written may in, um, increase the risk of an unwarranted conviction unless it's clearly explained to the jury that they need not acquit uh, Mr. Holmes of the greater offense in order to consider the lesser included. Okay. Mr. Orman, any response? The law of Colorado, Your Honor, it used to be. It used to be actually if a jury came back and they said they were hung and the court could send back a 
uh, instruction saying, hey, is it just about the degree of the offense or, or guilt or not guilty? And if it was um, about the degree of the offense, the jury could come back and you could instruct the jury to say, hey, just give us a verdict on what you can all agree on the highest charge. And uh, judges used to do that, and the legislature passed a statute, and it didn't occur to me to look it up until right now, and I haven't had a chance to do that, but there's actually a specific statute now that says you can't do that. So uh, it's just not the law. They do actually have to acquit on the higher charge before they can get to the lower one. And if they're hung on that, they're hung. All right. I, I, have, I, I am confident that this is an accurate statement of the law, and it is consistent with the model instructions, and so I'm going to stick with it. So the uh, objection is overruled. Let's go to the next uh, instruction. And the defense's standard instruction, I should say, remains rejected. Uh, the next instruction is the elemental instruction for murder in the first degree extreme indifference. Uh, Mr. Orman, is there anything uh, additional from the people with respect to this one, which, by the way, applies to counts 13 through 24? No, Your Honor. Anything additional from you with respect to this instruction, Ms. Nelson? Same issue, and I should have made that record um, with the last instruction on the lesser included offense as well. For all of these instructions, um, because of our issues with the verdict forms, I do have um, some argument to make about the, or some objections about um, the description of how to fill out the verdict form, but I'll, I'll reserve argument about that until we get to the verdict form itself. Okay. All right. Next, I have the lesser included offenses instruction with respect to murder in the first degree extreme indifference. Mr. Orman, other than the fact that you object to the lesser included offense of murder in the second degree, is there anything else with respect to this one? No, Your Honor. Anything in addition for you, Ms. Nelson, other than the same record that you made with respect to the last um, lesser included offense instruction? Same record. Same record? Okay, thank you. Next, we have the elemental instruction for attempt to commit murder in the first degree after deliberation, uh, which applies to the counts that are listed in this instruction. Um, anything uh, in a, additional for you, Mr. Orman? No, Your Honor. Thank you. Ms. Nelson, anything additional for you other than um, the record that you made before with respect to the references to Part A of the verdict form? Nothing additional that, to that. Okay. Next, we have the lesser included offenses instruction uh, for the uh, attempt to commit murder in the first degree after the deliber after deliberation char charges, and it includes attempt to commit murder in the second degree and attempt to commit manslaughter. Mr. Orman, other than the fact that you object to the lesser included offense of attempt to commit murder in the second degree. Any objection with respect to this one? No, Your Honor. And Ms. Nelson, anything uh, in addition from you uh, other than the record that you've made with respect to the previous lesser included offenses instructions that we've talked about? Same record. Same record. Okay. Next, we have the elemental instruction for attempt to commit murder in the first degree extreme indifference and all the counts that it applies to which are listed in the instruction. Anything additional from the people with respect to this instruction? No, Your Honor. Ms. Nelson, anything in addition to the record that you've made already with respect to the references to Part A of the verdict form? Nothing additional. All right. Next, we have the lesser included offenses with respect to attempt to commit murder in the first degree extreme indifference. Mr. Orman, other than the fact that you object to the lesser included offense of attempt to commit murder in the second degree. Anything additional with respect to this instruction? Nothing, Your Honor. Thank you. Ms. Nelson, any other record that you want to make with respect to this instruction that is uh, in addition to the record you've made with respect to the three prior lesser included offenses instructions that we've talked about? Same record. Thank you, Your Honor. Uh, next, we have the Elemental instruction for possession or control of an explosive or incendiary device. Uh, Mr. Orman, anything with respect to this instruction from the people? You know, it's not an objection, Your Honor. It's just something I noticed looking at this, is that the charge is titled possession or control, which I think is correct. But the element number four talks about more than possession or control. I don't know if that's confusing but I don't know of a way to fix that. 
that's I think that's the formal title that I saw in the uh, model instruction. That's also the formal title in the complaint and information that was filed by the people. I noticed that too. Um, and I'm not sure we want to call it possession or control or manufacture or giving or mailing or sending or causing. <laughs> Obviously, the only the first three apply, but we need to give the, the instruction as, the, as far as the six elements as they are. But I'm not saying we need to change it. It's just something I noticed that I thought I'd bring to the attention of the court. Well, if you, if you both agree, what we could do is we could change the title to um, possession, control, or manufacture of an explosive or incendiary device and then we could change element four by leaving, leaving only the relevant uh, portion, which is possessed, control, or manufactured, and then getting rid of the uh, stuff that doesn't apply. If the defense does not object, I, that is my preference. All right. Ms. Nelson, how would you like to proceed? I would like to keep it as it's written. Okay. Then we'll keep it as it's, as it's written. Uh, anything additional then from you, Mr. Orman, with respect to this instruction? No, Your Honor, thank you. All right, Ms. Nelson, anything in additional from you with respect to this instruction? Just the same record about the um, reference to Part A of the verdict form. All right, and the title doesn't bother you. In other words, the concern that was raised by Mr. Orman, um, you want to keep it the way it is, right? You would rather not change it as I proposed or to change it in, in a different way. Is that correct? I think that's, that's correct, Your Honor. I think that's the way that the model instruction has it laid out, and I think it's appropriate to keep it that way in this circumstance. Okay, we'll keep it that way. Uh, next would be the culpable mental state instructions, but we, instruction, but we've talked about that one already, so we'll go to the one that's next now, and that is the defense of insanity instruction. Mr. Orman, uh, you, you, and, and before I go to Mr. Orman, you, you folks may have noticed that uh, and for the record, I have deviated from the instructions, uh, in, from the model instructions for a couple of reasons. Um, maybe it's three reasons. Number one, we have numerous counts in this case. And so it, it becomes a challenge to speak in the singular. And I think it risks confusing the jury if I leave the instructions in the singular. And this is one in particular that... I felt like I, we needed to be careful in how we worded uh, the explanation to the jury so that the jury would understand that it applies to each act. So I've done my best to do that. And in this case, there is more than one alleged act. And so I think it's important to do that. Uh, that's one thing. Secondly, there are lesser included offenses in this case. And so that's another um, circumstance that I think warrants and perhaps requires the court deviating to some extent from the model instruction. Uh, and this is not the only model instruction that I deviated from, but when I got to this one, it reminded me that I wanted to make a record about this. The fact that I'm using or giving some lesser included offenses or I'm instructing the jury on, on some lesser included offenses requires me, frankly, to change some of the language in the instructions to account for the lesser included offenses and to avoid confusion of the issues. And so that was a, a second reason for doing that. Um, So those are the reasons that I that I think I, I um, those are the reasons that led me to change some of the language in the model instruction to the extent that I could. I tried to stay true to the model instructions wherever possible, and even where I changed language, I still tried to follow the structure in the model instructions because it was important to me to do that. Um, that's always the safest route to go. I know that they're only a guide. But I think it's always dangerous to deviate from them. In this case, there were certain instances where I had little choice but to do that. 
in order to avoid confusing the, the, the jury or misleading the jury. So having said that, with respect to this instruction on insanity, uh, oh, and that the other reason why I had to change some of the language in, in the instructions was that we have the defense of insanity in this case. Now, that doesn't apply to this particular instruction because this is the instruction on insanity, but it may apply to other instructions. And so at times I deviated from the model instructions based on that. Now, Mr. Orman, having uh, made that record, anything with respect to this instruction from the people? No, Your Honor, thank you. All right, anything from the defense with respect to this instruction, Ms. Nelson? I incorporate and maintain all of my previous objections and proposed revisions that we discussed at the last conference. I have one other thing, Your Honor, on the second page of the instruction with the paragraph that starts with, the prosecution has the burden to prove beyond a reasonable doubt. Yes. Um, it just struck me as it seemed a little bit repetitive and confusing, um, the sentence that's that states, in other words, the prosecution must disprove beyond a reasonable doubt both of the above number conditions with respect to the act alleged in the charge defense in each count and in each of the lesser included offenses of that charge defense. That seems to be almost entirely repetitive of the sentence just before that. And so I just wanted to propose amending it to state simply, in order to meet this burden of proof, the prosecution must disprove beyond a reasonable doubt both of the above numbered conditions with respect to the act alleged in the charged offense in each count and in each of the lesser included offenses of that charged offense. I don't have a problem with that. Are the people okay with that? I mean, look, I, I, I went to college, I went to law school, I've been a lawyer for longer than I care to think about. And when I see the term both of those above number conditions, that makes me think of some contract drawn up by somebody in 1872. And uh, I, I have a hard time figuring out what that is. And I've had a lot of legal training. So I think that the purpose of that next sentence and why the august body that came up with these jury instructions uh, put this second sentence in there is, well, third sentence in that paragraph, is because they realized that that first sentence was somewhat confusing and they needed to explain it further. I, I think that the... And I'm just trying to make it less confusing. It just repeats the sentence before it right, in part. Right, right. Hold on. Yeah, Mr. Orman, I don't, I don't see that we would lose anything if we delete that last sentence and if we amend the penultimate sentence in the paragraph. And I know that you know the definition of penultimate uh, because you explained it to Mr. Brockler. So, uh, but I don't think we lose anything if we make the change that Ms. Nelson is asking me to, to make and then delete the last sentence. Um, the penultimate sentence would read, in order to meet, meet this burden of proof, the prosecution must disprove beyond a reasonable doubt both of the above number conditions with respect to the act alleged in the charge offense in each count and in each of the lesser included offenses of that charge offense. Um, so that's exactly what the next line says right now. So it, it, it's repetitive and, and I don't think we need it. If we make the change that Ms. Nelson is suggesting. Well, frankly, Your Honor, I think maybe we only need the anti-penultimate sentence in that paragraph. In other words, the first sentence. Um, it's, I've just learned this word in the course of this trial. Anti-penultimate is third to last. Right. And, and I taught it to Mr. Yeah. Norman. Oh, okay. <laughs> um, because I just think this above number conditions language is dreadful. And um, it's really, now I'm looking at it, the more, I, what... It's, I think it's really hard for people to understand what that means, the above number conditions. That's like something out of a contract. I don't think it's that confusing, and I would object to taking it out. Yeah, I, 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 I'm not comfortable taking it out. I, I don't think it's confusing. I mean, the only number conditions are the two. I mean, um, both of the above number conditions, those are the two. So I, I don't. Um, I could say both of the above number conditions in this instruction or something, but... 
I, I think it's pretty clear what it refers to. So I don't think we... Uh, I'll make the change that Ms. Nelson is asking me to make. I think that makes sense. But I, I don't want to take out that, that sentence. I think it's an important sentence. And I think the committee was trying to make sure the jury understood that, that, it, that uh, the instruction is referring to where it says number one and number two in this instruction. So, all right. Anything else, Ms. Nelson? Again, there's just a reference to part A of the verdict form. So right. I have an argument about that when we get there. Okay. The next one is, the phrase incapable of distinguishing right from wrong um, and that instruction. Mr. Orman, anything in addition from you with respect to this instruction? I know you object to the word illegal instead of criminal, uh, and you made a record about that at the last conference. I still, the last bench comp or the last instructions conference, I still don't see um, a whole lot of difference between the two, um, and I don't think it changes the meaning of what the Supreme Court was trying to convey. Anything in addition from you? Nothing additional, Your Honor. Thank you. Anything additional from you, Ms. Nelson? Nothing additional to the arguments I made previously. All right. The next one is the informational instruction, um, which, I, again, every time I see it, I still find it odd. But, you know, there's not a whole lot I can do. I'm bound by the Supreme Court's decisions, and I know why the Supreme Court uh, asked us to give this instruction, uh, and um, but it is still a little bit of a, a, a strange instruction because we're telling the jury this is for information only, but we're giving it to you. And I don't know that there is any other, um, that there is a better solution, by the way. So I want to make clear that I'm not second-guessing the Supreme Court. I think the Supreme Court uh, saw this as the best solution possible, and frankly, I don't disagree with it. I, I can't come up with anything better, and I talked last time about the two competing and conflicting concerns that exist, and I think this was the middle ground that the court found, and I think it's as good a middle ground as, as anyone's going to be able to find. So, Mr. Orman, anything additional from you? I completely agree with Your Honor's sentiments on this. It almost seems like an exercise in cognitive dissonance, but I don't know what else we can do either. All right. Ms. Nelson, anything in addition from you? Nothing additional. Just incorporate all of our previous objections. Okay. The next one is this one um, is the instruction that talks about the um, verdict forms as, it, as they relate to the question on insanity. And it starts out with, if you find the defendant guilty of any charge offense or lesser included offense, you should disregard the remainder of this instruction as well as part B of each of the verdict forms. If, however, you find the defendant not guilty of all the charge offenses and lesser included offenses, you should answer the following verdict question in part B of the verdict forms, the verdict form for each count. Did you find the defendant not guilty solely based on the defense of insanity? Answer yes or no. And then it goes from there. So, uh, and again, this is one where I had to deviate from the model instruction in order to avoid risking confusing the jury or misleading the jury in any way. Uh, and I believe that this instruction uh, in general is, is consistent with the model instructions, but not identical to the model instruction. Uh, and I believe it's consistent with 16-8-105.5, subsection 3, by Leckie and Collins. All right, Mr. Orman, anything from you with respect to this instruction? No, Your Honor. I understand the necessity for this instruction and the procedure that it discusses. The only suggestion I would make, and I, and is, I, I can see someone reading this and, and being a little confused by any, just because it's sort of in the middle of the sentence there, I might suggest underlining that or something to give that particular word any and in the next sentence the word all uh, more significance. Uh, I think it might be easier to understand that way. All right, Ms. Nelson, first of all, do you have any objection to that request? He's talking about underlining any where it says in the first sentence, if you find the defendant guilty of any charge offense, and then underlining the word all in the second sentence, which says, if, however, you find the defendant not guilty of all the charge offenses. I have a comprehensive argument to make about these verdict forms, and I do, I object to this instruction in its entirety based on my argument about the verdict forms. So okay. 
Should we wait and talk about that when we get to the verdict forms? Um, we, get, we have a few more that we can- Why don't we do that? Breeze through pretty okay. quickly, probably. Well, um, is there anything else that you want to say with respect to this one? I'll, I'll reserve argument until I get to the verdict forms. Okay. I'll leave it on you then. Leave it to you to come back to this one and remind me of it, okay? The next one I have is the um, instruction related to the sentence enhancer, which is did the defendant use or possess and threaten the use of a deadly weapon? That question. So, any objection with respect to this one from the people? No, Your Honor. And again, this is one that I had to deviate, where I had to deviate from the language in the model instruction for some of the reasons that I stated before. And I was presented with a choice of either uh, staying true to the model instructions and risking confusing and misleading the jury, or making some changes uh, deviating from the model instruction in the hopes of reducing any risk and, frankly, eliminating uh, any risk of confusing or misleading the jury. And I'm comfortable that I've chosen the course of action that will eliminate any confusion uh, or any potential to mislead the jury. Ms. Nelson, anything from you with respect to this particular instruction? I do have one proposed change that's reflected in the... Um, I didn't submit an, a specific instruction on the special interrogatory, but I did in, include it in our proposed verdict forms. And, um, and, the, and our submitted verdict forms reflects this request. My request would be that the court phrase this special interrogatory in terms of proof. It's the prosecution's burden to prove, always. And so... Um, I, what part of the instruction are you on? Where it says, it says did the defendant use oh. or possess the, and threaten the use of a deadly weapon? Answer yes or no. So my request would be to phrase it in terms of proven or not proven. And so the first sentence would say, did the prosecution prove that the defendant used or possessed and threatened the use of a deadly weapon? Answer proven or not proven. And make the change to the um, verdict form accordingly and, and also change... Um, in the last paragraph where it states have the four-person mark, yes, it should say have the four-person mark proven. All right, Mr. Orman, any response to that? Your Honor, the concept of burden of proof is included in this instruction. It's included in the sentence um, underneath the two numbers. The prosecution has the burden to prove each number condition beyond a reasonable doubt. So that is included in the instruction already. I think the instruction, the way it's written, is much more clear and easy to understand than what counsel recommended. And I, I disagree, Your Honor. I, I, in fact, I think it's the opposite. I mean, I think that if you're saying that the prosecution has the burden of proving each number condition beyond a reasonable doubt, then it shouldn't be yes or no. It should be proven or not proven. It's, it's similar to how we don't ask juries to come back finding a, a defendant guilty or innocent. It's either guilty or not guilty. And so it should reflect proven or not proven because that's really the issue. But this is a verdict question. This isn't the same as a charge. And, and I agree with Mr. Orman. I think this is... Uh, plenty clear. Not only is it is the burden of proof included in the instruction, I've included it in the verdict form as well. Even though the model instruction didn't include it, I went and took the step to add it there, to repeat it there, to remind the jury that it's the prosecution that has the burden to prove the circumstance that this question asks about. So there's no need, in my view, to change it. And this is consistent uh, in terms of the instruction. It's consistent with the language uh, and the structure in the uh, model instruction. So the, the uh, objection is overruled. Your Anything Honor, else, Ms. Nelson, with respect to this particular instruction? I'm sorry, Your Honor. I just wanted to constitutionalize my objection. I'd make the objection under the 5th, 6th, 8th, and 14th Amendments to the United, Constitution, United States Constitution, as well as Article 2, Section 16, 20, 23, and 25 of the Colorado Constitutions. All right. The next one has to do with the uh, questions the jury was allowed to submit for me to ask of witnesses throughout the trial. And this is the uh, model instruction. Any objection, Mr. Orman? We do not object. Anything from you with respect to this one, Ms. Nelson? No. All right. The next one has to do with the four person being able to uh, submit a question for the court if the jury has a question. It's the stack instruction. Anything from the people on this one, Mr. Orman? Well, no, Your Honor, except... I have a feeling, even though Your Honor has already told them this, the first question we'll be, we'll be getting is, can we get a transcript of something? And it might be useful to cut that off at the pass and to say, if you ask for a transcript, you won't be able to get one. I'm pretty sure I emphasized it, but it's been three months. Um, 
Do you have a position on that request, Ms. Nelson? I think we should address that issue if it comes up, but not um, preemptively. Yeah, I'm going to stick with the um, model instruction. If it comes up, it comes up. Uh, hopefully one of the 12 was, uh, will remember <laughs> me saying it. I said it, and I repeated it like three times, and I remember telling them that I was repeating it because we often get a question, can we get a copy of the transcript? So hopefully they'll remember it. All right, the next instruction is the final instruction. And again, I've deviated a little or a lot, actually, from the model instruction, but it's for the reasons that I've stated. Um, in this case, I have multiple counts. I have lesser included offenses. I have the insanity defense. I have um, more than I have a sentence enhancer verdict question, and then of course with the insanity defense, uh, we have a verdict question uh, that relates to that as well. So you put it all together, and you have a bunch of stuff going on. And given that we have 165 counts and five different types of verdict forms. I wanted to be as detailed as I could, even at the risk of being somewhat repetitive, to make sure that the jury understood exactly what, um, what, uh, um, how to read the verdict forms and how to answer uh, the verdict forms, if you will, how to proceed in this case. Any objection from the people, Mr. Orman? No, you're right. Any objection from the defense? Ms. Nelson, do you want to talk about your record now? Sure, yes. Okay. This might be the appropriate time to talk about the verdict forms and our objections to the verdict forms. All right, go ahead. So I'll start by saying I, I read the statute, I read Bilecki, I read Collins. So I understand the, the basis for the court um, structuring the verdict form the way that the court did. However, um, I believe the defense maintains that, that structuring the verdict form in this unnecessarily confusing fashion would violate due process and the heightened reliability um, that's required under the Eighth Amendment and Article II, Section 20 of the Colorado Constitution. Um, given the issues in this case and given that this is a capital case in which um, a plea of not guilty by reason of insanity has been entered. Our first, my first concern, I have a couple of different concerns, two main concerns with the verdict forms. The first is the, um, the separation um, into part A and part B and the special interrogatory um, inquiring about the not guilty finding be base, being based solely on the um, a finding of the um, not guilty by reason of insanity. Our proposed verdict form, as I'm sure the court saw, breaks it down very simply. It gives the jury three choices. Not guilty, not guilty by reason of insanity, or guilty of either the charged offense or one of the lesser included offenses. I think that's totally compliant with the law, with the Constitution, and it clearly lays out for the jury that they essentially have three different options um, in terms of their verdict for each count. Uh, the way that the verdict form is currently structured it doesn't make that clear to the jurors. The jurors know, obviously, that we've entered a plea of not guilty by reason of insanity in this case. I understand that. I also understand that they've been instructed on the affirmative defense of insanity within the court's instructions. But when they get to the verdict form, the first page of the verdict form just simply asks them for um, a verdict as of not guilty or guilty. And it doesn't mention anything about insanity at all. Um, and furthermore, the instructions and the instruction um, that, that that it tries to explain how to fill out this form also doesn't make any mention of um, in filling out part A, you should mark the form, not you know, check the box, not guilty. If you find the defendant not guilty for any reason, including that the prosecution hasn't established um, the element of insanity beyond a reasonable doubt. So I I have a lot of concern about the way that the form is structured and the fact that this may, it's, it's really, it's a, it's a problem, I think, in some respects, it's analogous to the issue in Beck versus Alabama. Um, it's just, it's not made clear to the jury that they have this third option of not guilty by reason of insanity. I don't see any reason why we shouldn't make it abundantly clear to the jury that really a finding of not guilty and not guilty by reason of insanity just be separated out to make that very clear. Um, and so we object to the way that the court has um, structured the verdict forms as well as to the special interrogatory, as well as to the instructions on how to fill out the verdict forms. Our first proposal, so that's, well, I should say that's the, the first argument. And um, I, sh I should note that um, 
in an, another high-profile insanity case that happened a couple of years ago that Ms. Spengler was involved, when, involved in the Bruco Eastwood case, the court did the verdict forms the way that we proposed, um, laying them out um, separately, uh, the not guilty not option, not guilty by reason of insanity, and then the, the guilty. Um, and I have copies of those verdict forms if the court would like to see them at any point. Uh, second concern I have is with the interrogatory um, that states that the jury should only fill out this Part B, this interrogatory, if they have concluded, if they have found the defendant not guilty by reason of insanity on all, or not guilty on all counts, excuse me. Um, this, and again, I understand the case law, but to me this is a directed verdict and, and it would violate Mr. Holmes's right to due process and as well as the heightened reliability required by the Eighth Amendment and Article Two, Section 20 of the Colorado Constitution. Um, I, I also, I, I, I'm not convinced that this is a correct statement of the law because I think at least conceivably um, it's possible that the jury could find him guilty of the explosives count, not guilty of, by reason of insanity on the um, murder and attempted murder counts, and he could be sent to the Department of Corrections to serve a sentence for the explosives count and then later committed on the NGRI counts. So to the extent that the rationale in Balecki and the statute is that the, it's the only purpose for the special interrogatory is for the court to determine where to, uh, whether the defendant should be sent to um, the Department of Corrections or to the state hospital, I'm not concerned at all about this court's ability to determine where the defendant should be placed, certainly. Um, but what I am concerned about is totally confusing the jury. It, it's just, it doesn't, it, it doesn't, it's not necessary at all, and, and it's more than not necessary. It's a violation of, of Mr. Holmes's rights to due process in this case. So our, my first request would be that the court restructure the verdict forms in the way that we've proposed. My second request, if the court is not inclined to grant that request, would be to um, have the jury fill out just have them fill out that Part B interrogatory, um, regardless of, you know, for every count, regardless of how they, uh, you know, what verdict they render on each individual count. There's no harm in doing that. The court can certainly distinguish and, and take a look at the verdict forms and figure out, you know, what the result should be in terms of where Mr. Holmes goes. Uh, but that's just not a compelling reason to structure the, the verdict forms in that way. In addition, I would request that at a minimum, the court amend the instructions to make it clear that um, if their verdict is not guilty of the charged offense and its lesser included offenses, for any reason, including the prosecution's failure to prove sanity beyond a reasonable doubt, essentially men at least mentioning insanity at some point during the instruction, telling them how to fill out the verdict form so that they understand that if they find him not guilty by reason of insanity, they should still sign the not guilty section of part A of the verdict form. Without waiving our other objections, I think that would at least help make it a little clearer for the jury what they are to do if they have concluded that he is not guilty by reason of insanity. And I guess the last thing that I would add is um, just because this is a, a case in which the death penalty is being sought, it's going to um, withstand potentially years of appellate review. Um, the Colorado Supreme Court is going to have to take a, an independent look at the propriety of any death sentence, and that's necessarily going to require an evaluation of the actual verdicts rendered. And so I think that the verdict forms need to be very clear on each count whether the jury has found him not guilty, not, not guilty by reason of insanity, or guilty. And I would make my objections under um, Mr. Holmes's right to due process, right to present a defense, um, his right to a fair and impartial jury, and his right to a fair and reliable sentencing proceeding as protected by the 5th, 6th, 8th, and 14th Amendments, as well as the Colorado Constitution, Article 2, Section 16, 20, 23, and 25. All right, Mr. Orman. Stand up for this. All right. Your Honor, I, look, I, I'm not a big fan of this all or nothing thing for insanity, but that's the law of this state. It's all or nothing. You, you, there is no, no halfway. Either, um, 
that's just that's just the way it is. You know, he can't be insane on part of the counts. He can is he you know it just we can't have him guilty on some and insane on others. Um, it just doesn't work that way. So um, I, I, I this these instructions and the verdict form that is presented by this court accurately reflects the law of this state and does it in a fashion that it is easy for the jury to understand. One thing I think is important to note is the court has expressed its plans, and I've never seen a judge not do this in all the trials I've ever done or seen, is that you're going to read these verdict forms to the jury. And the verdict forms in and of themselves this are a type of instruction because the jurors see them and have them read to them while they're sitting in that jury box in the court. You, Your Honor, are reading them instructions. So they're going to have heard already have read to them already Part B. So they will know. It's not like they're going to get back there and they that'll be the first time they've seen these verdict forms and these interrogatories and get back there and have seen Part A and go, oh, gosh, where's insanity? I don't understand how this form is, is done. So it will, it will be clear to them. They will understand. All the court's instructions are clear. These don't violate any rights of the defendant and they accurately accurately describe Colorado law and are in accordance with our law. I thank you. And Your Honor, that is absolutely not the law in the state of Colorado. The law in the state of Colorado is that the jury can find him not guilty by reason of insanity on any one count and guilty on any other count, that they have to consider each count separately. And in fact, there's a, another instruction that, the, that we went through earlier today that states exactly that. And I would cite the, the court to People versus Balecki, in which it states um, that the defendant contended that a portion, there was a portion of the jury instruction in that case, it was a related issue to the special interrogatory form, um, in which, that stated, if the defendant is found guilty of one or more of the offenses charged, he cannot be found not guilty by reason of insanity as to any other offense charged. And the argument there was that that was a, amounted to a directed verdict on all counts as to the issue of sanity once the jury found him guilty of any charge. And the Court of Appeals... Was it the court, of, the court of Appeals held that they agreed that the inclusion of that language was error. And so it is not the case, as I'm sure the court is aware, that he can, that it's an all or nothing proposition. That is not the state of the law in Colorado. And that's exactly what I'm worried about. If Mr. Orman has misunderstood uh, the uh, verdict forms in that way, then what is the jury going to think when they're presented with these forms? Because that's not the case. That's simply not the case. They can find him NGRI on any given count or guilty on any other given count. They have to consider each count separately and that's why these forms are confusing um, I, I disagree that, that the uh, verdict forms are confusing I think they're really clear and I think they're as clear as they can be um, they are consistent with Colorado law I don't think Mr. Orman misunderstood the law I think um, what I understood is coming to mean is that uh, while the jury can find the defendant not guilty by reason of insanity of some counts and guilty of other counts, uh, the jury cannot return verdicts on some counts of not guilty by reason of insanity and then guilty on other counts. Um, and that's the law in Colorado. That's, uh, you know, it's, it's one thing to say, well, judge, you know, the law may be wrong. Well, that may be, but I can't disregard the Colorado Court of Appeals uh, or the Colorado Supreme Court or the Colorado legislature. In this case, there's authority from all three on this very point. I have the Colorado legislature telling me this is how it's done. I have the Colorado Court of Appeals telling me this is how it's done. And I have the Colorado Supreme Court telling me this is how it's done. I am in no position as a trial court judge to say they're all wrong and I'm going to do it differently or to say, well, this is a death penalty case, so I'm going to do it differently. It doesn't work like that. As a judge, I'm bound by the law, and I have to follow the law. And the law is, yes, the jury has to consider the defense of insanity with respect to each count separately and independently. And I tell the jury that. And that's why I emphasized the one instruction earlier that says exactly that. But in the end, we only care to know about the reason for a not guilty verdict if the jury finds the defendant not guilty of all the counts. Otherwise, we don't care. And that's the law in Colorado. The law in Colorado is, members of the jury, if you find the defendant guilty of even one count, then uh, we don't care 
about the reason uh, that you may find him not guilty of any other count. All we care about in terms of those other counts that you find the defendant not guilty of is that you're finding him not guilty. We don't care if it's because the prosecution failed to prove that the defendant was sane or if it's because the prosecution failed to prove any other element of that crime charged. We don't care and we don't want to know. That's the law in Colorado and that's what I have to follow. And this then avoids the situation where you have a guilty verdict, say for example, on the count of first degree murder and a not guilty by reason of insanity verdict, say for example, on possession of possession or control of incendiary devices. What is the court to do in that situation? Does the court send the defendant to the Colorado Mental Health Institute of Pueblo, or does the court proceed to a sentencing proceeding? Uh, and, and this is what the law, part of what the law wants to avoid, and part of what the law avoids, and what the law says in Colorado is, if he's found guilty of even one count, then we don't need to know as to the reason for any not guilty verdicts in the same case. All, all we need to know in that situation is that he was found not guilty of some other counts. And that's exactly what my verdict forms and the instructions um, as they have been drafted do. It is exactly consistent with Colorado law and it does exactly what Colorado law says. Uh, I don't find um, the uh, verdict forms confusing. I don't find the instructions confusing. Uh, and I don't believe the jury will find either confusing. Um, the defense's verdict forms, uh, Ms. Nelson asserted, are simpler or easier to understand. Well, this is not a, a contest for making it as simple as possible. The, the idea is I have to make them consistent with the law and then make them as simple as possible. I can't just say, I'm going to do it this way because this is the simplest way or this is going to be the clearest way for the jury. Forget the law. It's going to be clear to the jury or it may be inconsistent with the law, but it's going to be clear to the jury. That doesn't work. And so to the extent that another case that Ms. Spengler may have been involved in did it that way, I'm not going to follow that case. First of all, I'm not bound by other trial court judges. And secondly, I'm bound by the Court of Appeals, the Supreme Court, and the legislature. So... Uh, in terms of the verdict forms, uh, in part A, asking only about guilty or not guilty, that's exactly what uh, the model instructions say we should do. And that's exactly what Colorado law says we should do. And so that's what I'm doing. I don't think there's anything wrong with that. And I think the jury will get it. Um, in terms of the final instruction saying that uh, the jury should complete Part A of the verdict forms, if he finds the defendant not guilty, even if the only element that was not proven by the prosecution was sanity, uh, to make it clear that includes uh, the issue of um, in, um, insanity, I don't think that's necessary. I'll take another look at the verdict forms, but I don't, I don't see that as being something that's needed. I think that's only going to make the instructions more confusing, not less confusing. And that's not to say that I think there's any confusion in the instructions. I think they're clear, but I think that could uh, that risks making them confusing as opposed to making them clearer. Uh, let me see if there's anything else that I wrote down in my notes that I needed to respond to. Um, the separation between Part A and Part B of each verdict form is exactly what Colorado law tells me to do and is consistent with the um, model instructions. And by the way, I will read all the instructions to the jury. I will read uh, five sample verdict forms to the jury. I will go over all, all of that with the jury in addition. Counsel are free to go over all this with the jury as well. Uh, I mean, counsel are going to have two hours to make closing arguments. They can discuss the instructions. Uh, they can explain the instructions to the jury to make sure the jury understands them correctly. There's absolutely nothing wrong with that. As long as they uh, do it consistent with the instructions and the verdict forms in Colorado law. 
Um, and so there's that as well, and I wanted to mention that. Uh, so the first, based on, all, on my comments, the first request to restructure the verdict forms is denied. The second request to have the jury fill out Part B of all the verdict forms just because it does no harm is denied. And the request, the final request to at a minimum make it clear in the last instruction, the final instruction that if the verdict is not guilty of a charge offense, uh, and lesser included offenses in account for any reason, including because the people didn't prove the issue of sanity or solely because the people didn't prove the issue of sanity that the jury should still fill out Part A. Again, I don't think it's necessary. I'll take another look at, at it this weekend and, and make a final decision on that, but I, I don't see it that as necessary. I think it's, it's very clear as constituted. So that takes care, I think, of all the verdict forms, as well as the, um, I'm assuming, Ms. Nelson, that that was the record you wanted to make with respect to the verdict forms uh, or the reference. Let me back up. I'm assuming that's the record you wanted to make with respect to the verdict forms, with respect to the final instruction, and with respect to the instruction that follows the insanity instruction, as well as the references in any other instructions to part A of the verdict forms. Is that correct? Yes. So that's the basis for my objections to the, I'm sorry to repeat, but I just want to make sure the record's clear to my objections with respect to all the elemental instructions, the references in all the elemental instructions as to part A of the verdict form, um, the reference, similar references in all the lesser included instructions, similar references in the insanity instructions, as well as the final instruction. I also just wanted to um, add one additional um, request a change to that final instruction that I forgot to mention the first time around, Your Honor. Yes, which one? Which is just that, um, it's, I think it's on the second page. If you find the defendant guilty of any charged offense or lesser included offense, you should disregard Part B of all the verdict forms. It's just the, the paragraph that discusses in general Part B, our, my request would be to just explain what part B is, that it's a special interrogatory on your basis for the not guilty verdict. Just give some kind of sentence or explanation that indicates what part B is for. Where, where is that again? On page two, uh, it's the paragraph that starts, if you find the defendant guilty of any charged offense or lesser included offense, you should disregard part B of all the verdict forms. Okay. What do you want me to clarify? I'm sorry. Um, just somewhere in that paragraph, um, perhaps after the first sentence, something along the lines of explaining that Part B is a special interrogatory um, to determine the basis for your not guilty verdict or something like that or something explaining that Part B has to do with insanity, something to call the jury's attention that they're not, you know, by signing the not guilty section of part A of the form leads them to part B where they specify the basis for their not guilty verdict, um, just so that they're given a little bit more of an explanation as to what part B even is, if that makes sense. All right, do the people have a position on that? I would word that. This, it's not calling this an interrogatory. Right. Um, I, I don't think many people other than lawyers know what an interrogatory is. Um, so. Well, and they're called verdict questions now under the well, model instructions for that reason. Right. I, I don't mean to get hung up on the word interrogatory. I'm fine yeah. with verdict question form um, or a question form that um, is inquiring about the basis for your not guilty verdict or something like that just to indicate that, that if they find him not guilty, then they'll go on to specify as to whether or not the basis for their not guilty verdict is um, because they're finding him not guilty by reason of insanity. Well, by the time they get to that instruction, I will have given them the instruction that follows the insanity instruction, which tell, tells them exactly what Part B of the verdict form deals with. That, that's the one that says that they have to answer, if they find the defendant not guilty, they have to answer the question in Part B of the verdict form for each count. Did you find the defendant not guilty solely based on the defense of insanity? So that, you know, by the time we get to that last instruction, they will, have, they, they will know that. And then we'll go through the verdict forms again. They'll figure that out at that point. So I don't think it's necessary. And finally, Your Honor, and I just wanted to clarify this because I, I don't want anything that I said in perhaps an inartful way to be misconstrued for the record for an appellate court later. But 
our verdict forms that we propose to the court, the reason we propose them the way that we propose them is because we think that they're necessary to protect Mr. Holmes' constitutional rights, not because we simply think that they're easier to understand. Um, you know, that's, of course, the motivation behind it, but, but in the end, our argument is that in order to fully effectuate Mr. Holmes' constitutional rights to due process and a fair trial and a fair and reliable sentencing proceeding, the jury has to understand, um, com have a complete understanding of, of how the verdict forms work and, and, and what the effect of, of the verdict forms are. So I want to make sure the court understood and the record's clear that my basis um, for my arguments is the Constitution and not just, you know, it does no harm or anything like that. It's that my requests, I believe, are constitutionally required. Uh, I understand. I, and that's how I understood it before. But um, I also, as I said before, uh, I, I am bound by the law. I can't find, I don't have the authority to find that we have to do things differently than the way the legislature tells me to do them and the way the Supreme Court tells me to do them and the way the Colorado Court of Appeals tells me to do them. Even if, if I uh, think in my, on my own that this is the way that it's best to proceed or that it's appropriate to protect anyone's rights, I am bound by the law. I'm bound by the legislature the law the legislature uh, passes, I'm bound by the Supreme Court's opinions and I'm bound by the Court of Appeals' opinions. And I don't have the authority to disregard any of those three. Generally speaking, when the court is dealing with a difficult issue, there may be one authority, one out of those three. In this case, I have all three. And I can't disregard all that authority. There, there's a reason why the law is the way it is, and I understand the reason for it. I get it, and, and I, um, I don't think that... Um, I, uh, not only do I not have the authority to do it, but even if I had the authority, in this case, I don't believe it's necessary to deviate from the law in order to protect the defendant's rights. The defendant's rights are protected even under the law the way it exists in Colorado. Uh, that includes his constitutional rights, his statutory rights. That includes all his rights. Um, the law the way it is does not violate any of his rights and protects all of his rights. So, all right. Now, Ms. Nelson, do you want to, first of all, is there anything else in terms of the instructions and the verdict forms as they are constituted, anything else uh, from the people that the people want to state? Before, so I don't forget, can I make a request about this, Your Honor? Yes. Is that when we get the final set of these uh, instructions from the court, um, can we get another copy in, in Word because it will be easier to incorporate into slides if we yes. do that? And also, uh, I know the court said it wasn't posted on the website, but it didn't mention anything about these being uh, suppressed or anything like that, and I can't think of a reason for that. Uh, when we get the final set, um, is there any, would the court have any problem with us sending the instructions to victims so they would have an opportunity to read along as the court reads? Once they're final, uh, you can send them to them, Thank you. to the victims, yeah. All right, uh, anything else with respect to the instructions in the verdict forms as constituted in Mr. Orman? Nothing, Your Honor. Thank you. All right. You. Ms. Nelson, I know you have some tender instructions, but before we get to that, anything else with respect to these instructions and verdict forms as constituted? Not that I can think of at this time, Your Honor. Okay. And again, as I've said before, I'm going to read all the instructions. I'm going to read five verdict forms. Uh, those are the five sample verdict forms. I, I don't think it makes sense to read 165 verdict forms, or we'll be here till next month. So I, I, I'm going to read the five that are representative. There are five types of verdict forms, and I'm reading one of each type. So, all right, Ms. Nelson, so do you want to talk about the, uh, your theory of defense instruction and perhaps the other three instructions that you want to tender? I can do that, Your Honor. Um, I do have copies for both the court and the prosecution. And while she's I, doing that, Mr. Orman, the people don't have any tender, any instructions, additional instructions to tender. We do not. All right. Ms. Nelson, yes, you may approach. Okay. Sorry, I have them separated out into four different piles, so it might just take me a minute to take disassemble time. them. So, okay, here's one.
May I approach? You may. Thank you. And to be honest, Your Honor, I'm a bit, I'm a little bit at a loss about how to number these. I don't know if I need to number them. We didn't end up numbering the instructions that I submitted previously. We just referred to them by title. Um, at this point, maybe that's just the easiest thing to do, is to refer to them by title. Okay, I, I think, think so. I think that's what we did last time. The instructions that I submitted before, I think, should have started with number two, and um, and I. I could go back and number them and then number these, but at this, for the purposes of this hearing, I suppose we should just refer to them by their title, Do you know, if that's okay. I'm sorry. Do you know, Ms. Gerlings, what the last number was? The last number was one. So two? Okay. Well, but they, the defense submitted some instructions. They filed some. Did they number those? No, right? No. Yeah. Since you didn't number the last set, I think there is one that's number, number, that's number right. one, which was a tender instruction related, I think, to the model the physical model of the theater, and that was tendered during the trial. Right. Uh, I don't think that you number the ones that you tendered before uh, the first jury instructions conference. Since we stuck with the titles, why don't we just stick with the titles for this one too? Okay, I, you know, and, and what I could do, you if could it's file. necessary for record purposes, I, could, I suppose I could file a pleading at some point just designating numbers um, once we get through these. It's if, up to you, you file the last set uh, I, I think I might request, and I can let you file this set the same way without numbering them, but with the titles. And I think we, I know we spoke about all the ones you tendered last time. We just referred to them by title. And these ones, for the record, are, t are titled Theory of Defense, uh, Duration of Insanity Immaterial. Um, actually, this one doesn't, oh, it doesn't have, have a title. There's one that doesn't have a title. The next one is impact of psychotic delusion, an ability to distinguish right from wrong. And then the last one doesn't have a title, but it's the only one without a title uh, of all the ones that have been tendered. And it's titled Defendant's Proposed Jury Instruction Number Blank. Uh, and it reads as follows. You are instructed that following the conclusion of this trial, no juror is permitted to provide any person not involved in this case, including members of the media, with information about another juror including another juror's name or contact information or information concerning another juror's verdict and or comments during deliberation. So that, so that's the last one. So do you want to, um, so I'll leave it up to you, Ms. Nelson. It's however you want to do it. I think the record is pretty clear as to what your instructions are. I think you should definitely file, file these. these yeah. So why don't you file them? Then there will be a record of them. I've read them into the record in terms of title. And then I think your record is complete. But if you want to number them and refile them number, I'll let you do that as well. Okay. okay. Thank All you, right. Your Honor. Which... All right. Let's let's talk about these ones. See if we can talk about these ones. Uh, since I just read that one, let's talk about that one. Do the people have a position on this one, the one that I just read? Any objection? Well, just the fact that I think it would violate the jurors' First Amendment rights in perpetuity. Um, I don't think the court can do that. So. Um, I, I, the court instructed the jurors who, I mean, uh, I believe, I, re, I recall the, the court saying, hey, don't give, when, when, express was, when concern was expressed, you know, if you're concerned about your identity being disclosed, don't tell the other jurors your identity. Um, and uh, they don't have to tell the other jurors their names. And I don't think that this court has the power to say to the members of this jury, by the way, for the rest of your life, I'm, en I'm enjoining you from speaking to anyone on these topics. Um, I've never heard of a court doing that, and I don't think the court can do that. So um, I don't think, I think that this instruction in all aspects would violate the constitutional rights of the jurors. Ms. Nelson? And Your Honor, the, the reason why we're, we're requesting this instruction is because several, a number of prospective jurors um, raised issues concerning um, privacy and, and, um, and the media during voir dire. And so we know that that's a concern for um, at least some jurors. And in addition to the obviously high profile nature of this case, there have been other instances such as the Jody Arias case in Arizona stands out in which there was you know one holdout juror who was then outed by the other jurors and received death threats and it you know was all over the media and so we were simply trying to craft a way for the court to um, 
assurers that, you know, if they're free to speak to the media about their own verdict um, and about their own thoughts and feelings and opinions about the case after the case is concluded, um, but that they should respect the verdict of other, of other jurors and, and should not be permitted to speak um, about what other jurors' um, deliberation processes were like or what, you know, what the vote of other jurors in the jury room were. Um, and we think that this can also be just cleared up um, in the court's discharge instructions that this doesn't apply to the parties or the attorneys um, or anyone involved in the case, that they're free to speak about their um, involvement in the case, their del deliberations, and any other juror to the parties or the attorneys, but it simply applies to people who are not involved in the case. We would just make the request based on Mr. Holmes's right um, to due process into a fair and impartial jury um, as well as the heightened reliability required um, by the Eighth Amendment, and I'd say to the Fifth, Sixth, Eighth, and Fourteenth Amendments, um, as well as the Colorado Constitution, Article Two, Section 16, 20, 23, and 25. Um, you know, this is to protect all of the jurors. It's not. Um, it's not going to violate any rights. Okay, I agree with Mr. Orman. I don't have the authority to. Um, tell the jurors to do this. And furthermore, I'm not aware of any case law or statute that um, allows for this instruction to be given, much less requires it. So um, I don't think it's an appropriate instruction. And so that tendered instruction is rejected. Uh, the next instruction is the one that's titled Duration of Insanity Immaterial. And it reads as follows. The duration of insanity is immaterial so long as the defendant was insane at the time of the alleged crime. And apparently the uh, this comes from People versus Voth, V-O-T-H, 312 Pacific 3rd, 144, Colorado, 2013. I have not read, I may have read that case, but I haven't read it recently, much less with respect to this proposed instruction. Do the people have a position? I think this case says that the court needs to give this instruction. I think this is a throwaway line in this case. And I think the court had, at the last instruction conference mentioned the precedent in Colorado that warns the court about just pulling language out of cases and putting that in instructions. This instruction is not necessary. Insanity is defined quite clearly by the court. And this instruction could actually be confusing to the extent that there's been lots of testimony from various mental health professionals about duration of illnesses, onset, prodromal, blah, blah, blah. And uh, this almost, I, I understand insanity is different than mental illness, and that's pretty clear, but I think this could be construed by jurors to say, well, okay, the length of the mental illness isn't important. This is almost, almost instructing a jury that they could find some kind of temporary insanity. In fact, I think that's sort of what it does, and there is no such thing as temporary insanity in Colorado, so I object to this instruction. All right, Ms. Nelson, anything from you? Well, Your Honor, I think that that's essentially the holding of Voth, um, is the, the very proposition that Mr. Um, Orman just disavowed. But this is not a throwaway line from this case. I mean, this is, this is a correct statement of the law. And the reason we're requesting this instruction is because it's clear that it's an issue in this case. It's a correct statement of the law, and the jurors need to understand that this is part of Colorado law, and they need to understand so clearly in order to render an accurate and reliable verdict. We've had a lot of jury questions from, um, from the jury about um, posed to different psychiatric experts. When do you think that the defendant became insane, for example? And it's it's We've inferred from those questions that it's not clear to the jury, necessarily, that the only point at which it matters, a defendant's insanity matters, is the point at which, the, uh, at the time of the commission of the acts. Um, and in addition, we've heard a lot of testimony from the court-appointed experts that the basis for their insanity, uh, their finding that Mr. Holmes was sane, includes facts um, pertaining to events and issues in the months leading up to July 20th. So, you know, the court appointed experts, for example, I know relied upon in part the fact that Mr. H the, the Google chat with Ms. Dada in March of 2012 in which Mr. Holmes describes killing other people as evil. That was a basis for their finding that he was sane on July 20th. Um, they also found significant, you know, his ambivalence about disclosing um, details about his homicidal thoughts to doctors Fenton and Feinstein. Again, that was in the months leading up to July 20th. Um, 
and they're relying on these events preceding um, the the act itself uh, to reach their conclusions about sanity. And so it's important for the jurors to understand very clearly that even if Mr. Holmes was sane in March, in April, in May, in June, in the early part of July, that if they find that by the at the point at which he stepped into that theater, he could not distinguish between right and wrong, then he is insane. And so it's the time of the commission of the acts, and that's the only time that matters under Colorado law. So it's an accurate statement of the law, and it's a very important issue in this case. And so we would um, request that the instruction be given and rely on Mr. Holmes's rights to due process, to present a defense to a fair and impartial jury, and to uh, the heightened reliability um, required by the 5th, 6th, 8th, and 14th Amendments to the United States Constitution, as well as Article 2, Section um, 16, 20, 23, and 25 of the United States, Consti or, I'm sorry, of the Colorado Constitutions. Hey, Your Honor. Yeah. It's not dispositive. Sure. It's not dispositive when the quote-unquote insanity arose. Obviously, our position is it never did and never has. Uh, the defendant's own expert, their own handpicked expert, Dr. Woodcock, came in here and said the defendant was legally sane until July 8th. Then he became legally insane. That was what he said. Um, we're talking about the allegations and assertions of some mental disorder um, that caused the defendant to lose the ability to distinguish between right and wrong. Well, as various experts have testified, these disorders are not something that arise in an instant in a puff of smoke, that they, are, they take a while to develop, that they go through various phases, and that at some point, according to the defense experts, the defendant lost this ability. Well, if it's irrelevant, that means that pretty much all the testimony regarding insanity is irrelevant, that all we should have had is, is someone come in and say, in this particular second, in this particular moment of time, he was insane. Well, obviously, that would be a nonsense. And uh, the jury has to consider the premeditation. The jury has to consider the events leading up to the crime, to determine under the totality of the circumstances whether they believe the defendant was insane when he committed the crimes. And this discussion, this instruction, would sort of tell them the opposite, that they don't, they don't need to consider that. The instructions that the court has already on insanity adequately and correctly inform the jury of the law. I agree and with Mr. Orman. I agree with Ms. Nelson that, that the law is that the people have to prove that the defendant was not insane at the time of the commission of the act. But that's going to be clear from the instructions. In fact, I think it's been made clear to the jury. This is a smart jury. They have revealed that through their questions. They're not stupid. And um, I think that the questions that they have submitted about when do you think the defendant became insane or when do you think the defendant became mentally ill are not a reflection of their misunderstanding of the law, but rather their attempt to question witnesses about their opinions, their, their attempt to uh, try to figure out where the witness is coming from and what the witness is relying on. Similarly, opinions from experts about different time frames doesn't mean that the defendant was uh, sane, has to be uh, sane or insane at times other than the time of the alleged act. That just goes to whether he was sane or insane at the time of the alleged act. It's probative of that, and that's why it was admitted, and I think that's why, and that's how the, the jury understands it, and, and certainly that's how the instructions will read, that's how they do read, and that's how the jury will be told uh, the law is in Colorado, and so it's unnecessary. I think I do remember Voth, V-O-T-H. I think I do remember the discussion about the fact that although there is no temporary insanity defense in Colorado, uh, in a way, it's sort of temporary because the only thing that's relevant is whether the defendant was sane or, or insane at the time of the commission of the act. That's what you're looking at. That's what the issue is. But I, I, it's an instruction that is not necessary. It's an instruction that I think has the potential to confuse the jury. And um, it is not an instruction that is in the model instructions or that the Colorado Supreme Court or the Colorado Court of Appeals tells me that I should instruct on so or that I should give the jury. So it is rejected. Uh, the last one we'll talk about before we take a break, we'll take a break so that everyone can take some time with the theory of defense instruction. Um, 
but also because my court reporter needs a break. Uh, but the next instruction is titled Impact of Psychotic Delusion and Ability to Distinguish Right from Wrong. And it reads as follows. A defendant may be judged legally insane under Colorado law where his cognitive ability to distinguish right from wrong with respect to an act charged as a crime has been destroyed as a result of a psychotic delusion. And the um, authority cited uh, is as follows. People versus Cerravo, S-E-R-R-A-V-O, 823 Pacific 2nd, 128 Colorado Supreme Court, 1992. And People versus Gallimanis, G-A-L-I-M-A-N-I-S, 944 Pacific 2nd, 626, Colorado Court of Appeals, 1997. What's the people's position on this one, Mr. Orman? Your Honor, the definition of insanity is correctly set forth in the instructions that the court has presented. The definition of insanity, the things that we, as the prosecution, have to disprove beyond a reasonable doubt, are defined in language that has been passed by the legislature of this state and signed by the governor. This is language taken from a couple of precedents in Colorado. This is not what we have to prove. What we have to prove is outlined already in these instructions and in the statute. Uh, we, this would essentially give us an extra element to disprove that the defendant's uh, cognitive ability to distinguish right from wrong with respect to an act charged as a crime has not been destroyed as a result of a psychotic delusion. In other words, we sort of have to disprove a psychotic delusion, which we don't, because that is not an element of insanity, that we would then have to prove this destroyed thing, which is not defined, which no expert has testified about, which no one has been asked a question about. It's extremely confusing. We don't have to prove it. It would be grossly improper of this court to give it, and we would object. All right, Ms. Nelson, anything from you? This is an accurate statement of the law. It is the law that uh, delusions can render someone insane. And again, this issue is directly pertinent to this case. Mr. Holmes's delusions form a critical part of his psychopathology. Um, and the question in this case, the essential question that the jury has to decide is what is the effect of these delusions? And how did it affect his cognitive process? And it's, this is law not only that applies directly to this case, but that the jury otherwise not, would not be aware of if they were not instructed specifically on it. Jurors must be fully informed about the law in order to reach a reliable verdict and a unanimous verdict. And so we would um, request that the court give the instruction pursuant to the 5th, 6th, 8th, and 14th Amendments, the United States Constitution, as well as Article 2, Section 16, 20, 23, and 25 of the Colorado Constitution. Well, as I said the other day, there are a lot of cases in Colorado, all of those cases constitute case law. That's part of the law, but we don't give it all to the jury, and it is improper to give it all to the jury. I think this is a, an unnecessary and improper instruction. It is confusing, it's, and, and it's not part of the model instructions. There's no authority that says that the jury should be instructed on this instruction, and um, so for all those reasons, it is rejected. All right, let's go ahead and take a break. And then uh, we'll continue with the uh, last standard instruction, which is the theory of defense instruction, all right? The court will be in recess. Thank you. Good afternoon. Welcome back inside our 7 News newsroom. Phil Tenser joining you again. Um, I've proven time and time again that I am no lawyer. I ask lots of dumb questions. I'm learning this along with you. But in this argument that we were just leaving off on, I thought um, I might add this one thought. The idea that the defense wanted an instruction to include the, the word delusion. Um, in that 2,000, more than 2,000 page document of model instructions for jurors, released by the Colorado Supreme Court in 2014, rather a committee of the Supreme Court in 2014. 20, more than 2,100 pages, I ran a search. Uh, my trusty handy dandy laptop says the word delusion appears in that document nowhere. Absolutely nowhere. Word insanity is in there hundreds of times. There's chapters about what it means to be uh, sane or insane, but the word delusion, not in there at all. And of course you heard District Court Judge Carlos Samore outright denying that request. Of course, you heard 
Mr. Orman coming out very strongly against it, and uh, rightfully so. It is nowhere in these um, not statutory but highly recommended and certainly, um, I guess traditional might be a safe word, uh, model instructions that are approved uh, most recently in 2014 by the Colorado Supreme Court. What else has happened today? Let's take just a quick moment to review. The defense rested their case after showing us some uh, videos of the gunman, one in a jail cell um, and another in a uh, hospital room, and um, both of those were uh, certainly intended to show his sanity, but of course the prosecution with their final cr question in cross-examination, uh, actually the final question of their testimony at all, was these were taken in November of 2012? Answer, yes. That's four months after the shooting? Again, yes. They're re-emphasizing the prosecution for the jury that these things are four months afterward. Of course, if you believe the defense's theory, the defense's theory is that the mental illness that was pre-existing that caused the shooting itself in July 20th of 2012 became exacerbated and led to all of this insanity, uh, insane you know, poop smearing and uh, hospital antics that we saw on these videos. It is the defense's argument that those symptoms were exacerbated by the incarceration that happened as a result of the shooting. And it's going to be up to the jury to decide which theory of this that they are going to believe. After that, the defense rested their case as expected. But unlike we expected, George Brockler stood up and announced he would not be calling his rebuttal witness. Uh, so no Dr. Philip Resnick, despite previous discussions, making sure that there was time and the ability and uh, days allotted to have him testify, George Brockler stood up and said, we don't need to do it. And uh, that certainly means that he was very confident with his cross-examination of Dr. Gurr. Uh, Dr. Resnick was introduced into the case files, the case literature, as an expert specifically to counter Dr. Gurr. Uh, and so they, they apparently believe that they handled Dr. Gurr well enough to not need the testimony of Dr. Resnick to not need that rebuttal at all. So what does that mean now? We're doing these jury instructions. If we're done by the end of the day tonight, that will give everyone, the lawyers and all of our team here at 7 News, a nice, well-deserved long weekend. Uh, we'll have the day off on Monday. Of no, if it's not done, we'll be back covering these hearings. Again, the jury is not in the room for these hearings. Hearings about the jury instructions, we'll be back on covering that if necessary on Monday. Tuesday at 9 a.m., we're going to start with jury instructions, move in from there to the prosecution, uh, their first section of their opening statement. Uh, we'll have a 15-minute break. The defense will have their two hours to do their closing, another 15 minutes. The prosecution has the opportunity to do a rebuttal as long as they've reserved time from their first appearance, uh, which we believe will happen. And then the jury will be sent off. We'll, we'll finally hear for the first time the numbers and seats of the 12 voting jurors and then the other seven alternates, the remaining seven alternates uh, who weren't dismissed, will be put into a separate room to wait just in case something does happen to the other jurors. And then we'll be on jury, we'll be on jury watch, verdict watch, waiting together collectively for that to happen. Um, I, I can tell you this now, 7 News is committed to bringing you complete coverage from beginning to end of those closing arguments, complete coverage of any hearings that happen in between, uh, and then certainly on the day of the verdict, we expect a three-hour warning. Our online coverage will start as soon as possible after we receive that three-hour warning. We'll send you all a push, push alert. We'll send you all an email alert, so please do subscribe. We'll let you know as soon as possible so that you can receive that alert and make your plans to get online and watch alongside us because this will certainly be something that's momentous. Marshall and I were talking earlier and pointed out if they take four or five days to deliberate, the verdict in this case could very easily fall on Monday, July 20th, which would be the three-year anniversary of the shooting itself. Uh, and so there's obviously no guarantee that that would happen, but it is certainly a possibility on our horizon three years afterward to the day, getting an answer, getting justice in one form or the other, whatever the jury decides, uh, falling that verdict on that Monday. But the judge has said he does not want 
uh, an announcement that they've reached a verdict to wait overnight or wait until the next day or n wait through a weekend or wait till the next morning or anything like that. If the verdict comes in at 4.30 p.m. on an afternoon, we're going to have a late night along with all of you folks waiting for that verdict to be read aloud in court. There are 165 counts. The judge mentioned uh, taking at least an hour to read them all aloud. Uh, certainly he has. Uh, there are a lot of things for the jury to decide. Dan Recht, speaking to our legal expert earlier, talked about um, they are very unlikely to come back uh, with a verdict, anything shorter than a few days. Because there are so many counts, there is so much evidence, and this case has been so long in the making, in the phase of reaching this. If you count jury selection, this case began in January, so certainly it, certainly a contender for the longest case in Colorado. I, I don't know if it is the longest case at this point, but it's definitely going to be a contender up there. So with that, we've had some uh, contentious discussions today about how these jury instructions are to be handled and the verdict forms themselves that the judge will have to read aloud when the verdict is reached. And Andrew has prepared that for us. Uh, and then, Andrew, let's, uh, let's go listen to that. Each count. Uh, the way that the verdict form is currently structured, it doesn't make that clear to the jurors. The jurors know, obviously, that we've entered a plea of not guilty by reason of insanity in this case. I understand that. I also understand that they've been instructed on the affirmative defense of insanity within the court's instructions. But when they get to the verdict form, the first page of the verdict form just simply asks them for um, a verdict as of not guilty or guilty. And it doesn't mention anything about insanity at all. Um, and furthermore, the instructions and the instruction um, that, that, that it tries to explain how to fill out this form also doesn't make any mention of um, in filling out part A, you should mark the form, not, you know, check the box, not guilty. If you find the defendant not guilty for any reason, including that the prosecution hasn't established um, the element of insanity beyond a reasonable doubt. So I, I have a lot of concern about the way that the form is structured and the fact that this may, it's, it's really, it's a, it's a problem I think in some respects it's analogous to the issue in Beck versus Alabama. Um, it's just, it's not made clear to the jury that they have this third option of not guilty by reason of insanity. I don't see any reason why we shouldn't make it abundantly clear to the jury that really a finding of not guilty and not guilty by reason of insanity just be separated out to make that very clear. Um, and so we object to the way that the court has um, structured the verdict forms as well as to the special interrogatory, as well as to the instructions on how to fill out the verdict forms. Our first proposal, so that's, well, I should say that's the, f the first argument. And um, I, sh I should note that um, in an another high-profile insanity case that happened a couple of years ago that Ms. Spengler was involved, when, involved in the Bruco Eastwood case, the court did the verdict forms the way that we proposed, um, laying them out um, separately, uh, the not guilty not option, not guilty by reason of insanity, and then the, the guilty. Um, and I have copies of those verdict forms if the court would like to see them at any point. Uh, second concern I have is with the interrogatory um, that states that the jury should only fill out this Part B, this interrogatory, if they have concluded, if they have found the defendant not guilty by reason of insanity on all, or not guilty on all counts, excuse me. Um, this, and again, I understand the case law, but to me this is a directed verdict and, and it would violate Mr. Holmes's right to due process and as well as the heightened reliability required by the Eighth Amendment in Article 2, Section 20 of the Colorado Constitution. Um, I, I also, I, I, I'm not convinced that this is a correct statement of the law because I think at least conceivably um, it's possible that the jury could find him guilty of the explosives count, not guilty of, by reason of insanity on the um, murder and attempted murder counts, and he could be sent to the Department of Corrections to serve a sentence for the explosives count and then later committed on the NGRI counts. So to the extent that the rationale in Balecki and the statute is that the, it's the only purpose for the special interrogatory is for the court to determine where to, uh, whether the defendant should be sent to um, the Department of Corrections or to the state hospital, 
I'm not concerned at all about this court's ability to determine where the defendant should be placed, certainly. Um, but what I am concerned about is totally confusing the jury. It's just, it doesn't, it, it doesn't, it's not necessary at all, and, and it's more than not necessary. It's a violation of, of Mr. Holmes' rights to due process in this case. So our, my first request would be that the court restructure the verdict forms in the way that we've proposed. My second request, if the court is not inclined to grant that request, would be to um, have the jury fill out, just have them fill out that Part B interrogatory, um, regardless of, you know, for every count, regardless of how they, uh, you know, what verdict they render on each individual count. There's no harm in doing that. The court can certainly distinguish and, and take a look at the verdict forms and figure out you know, what the result should be in terms of where Mr. Holmes goes. Uh, but that's just not a compelling reason to structure the, the verdict forms in that way. In addition, I would request that at a minimum, the court amend the instructions to make it clear that um, if their verdict is not guilty of the charged offense and its lesser included offenses for any reason, including the prosecution's failure to prove sanity beyond a reasonable doubt, essentially men at least mentioning insanity at some point during the instruction telling them how to fill out the verdict form so that they understand that if they find him not guilty by reason of insanity, they should still sign the not guilty section of part A of the verdict form. Without waiving our other objections, I think that would at least help make it a little clearer for the jury what they are to do if they have concluded that he is not guilty by reason of insanity. And I guess the last thing that I would add is um, just because this is a, a case in which the death penalty is being sought, it's going to um, withstand potentially years of appellate review. Um, the Colorado Supreme Court is going to have to take a, an independent look at the propriety of any death sentence, and that's necessarily going to require an evaluation of the actual verdicts rendered. And so I think that the verdict forms need to be very clear on each count, whether the jury has found him not guilty, not, not guilty by reason of insanity, or guilty. And I would make my objections under um, Mr. Holmes' right to due process, right to present a defense, um, his right to a fair and impartial jury, and his right to a fair and reliable sentencing proceeding as protected by the 5th, 6th, 8th, and 14th Amendments, as well as the Colorado Constitution, Article 2, Section 16, 20, 23, and 25. All right, Mr. Orman. Stand up, please. All right. Your Honor, I, look, I, I'm not a big fan of this all or nothing thing for insanity, but that's the law of this state. It's all or nothing. You, there is there's no halfway either. Um, that's, just, that's just the way it is. You know, he can't be insane on part of the counts. He can, is he, you know, it just, you can't have him guilty on some and insane on others. Um, it just doesn't work that way. So, um, I, I, this, these instructions and the verdict form that is presented by this court accurately reflects the law of this state and does it in a fashion that it is easy for the jury to understand. One thing I think is important to note is the court has expressed its plans, and I've never seen a judge not do this in all the trials I've ever done or seen, is that you're going to read these verdict forms to the jury. And the verdict forms in and of themselves this are a type of instruction because the jurors see them and have them read to them while they're sitting in that jury box in the court. You, Your Honor, are reading them instructions. So they're going to have heard already, have read to them already Part B, so they will know. It's not like they're going to get back there and they that'll be the first time they've seen these verdict forms and these interrogatories and get back there and have seen part A and go, oh, gosh, where's insanity? I don't understand how this form is, is done. So it will, it will be clear to them. They will understand. All the court's instructions are clear. These don't violate any rights of the defendant, and they accurately, accurately describe Colorado law and are in accordance with our law. I thank you. And Your Honor, that is absolutely not the law in the state of Colorado. The law in the state of Colorado is that the jury can find him not guilty by reason of insanity on any one count, 
and guilty on any other count, that they have to consider each count separately. And in fact, there's a, another instruction that, the, that we went through earlier today that states exactly that. And I would cite the, the court to People v. Balecki, in which it states um, that the defendant contended that a portion, there was a portion of the jury instruction in that case, it was a related issue to the special interrogatory form, um, in which, that stated, if the defendant is found guilty of one or more of the offenses charged, he cannot be found not guilty by reason of insanity as to any other offense charged. And the argument there was that that was a, amounted to a directed verdict on all counts as to the issue of sanity once the jury found him guilty of any charge. And the Court of Appeals, was it the Court of, the court of Appeals, held that they agreed that the inclusion of that language was error. And so it is not the case, as I'm sure the court is aware, that he can, that it's an all or nothing proposition. That is not the state of the law in Colorado. And that's exactly what I'm worried about. If Mr. Orman has misunderstood uh, the uh, verdict forms in that way, then what is the jury going to think when they're presented with these forms? Because that's not the case. That's simply not the case. They can find him NGRI on any given count or guilty on any other given count. They have to consider each count separately. And that's why these forms are confusing. Um, I, I disagree that, that the uh, verdict forms are confusing. I think they're really clear and I think they're as clear as they can be. Um, they are consistent with Colorado law. I don't think Mr. Orman misunderstood the law. I think um, what I understood is coming to mean is that uh, while the jury can find the defendant not guilty by reason of insanity of some counts and guilty of other counts, uh, the jury cannot return verdicts on some counts of not guilty by reason of insanity and then guilty on other counts. Um, and that's the law in Colorado. That's, uh, you know, it's, it's one thing to say, well, judge, you know, the law may be wrong. Well, that may be, but I can't disregard the Colorado Court of Appeals uh, or the Colorado Supreme Court or the Colorado legislature. In this case, there's authority from all three on this very point. I have the Colorado legislature telling me this is how it's done. I have the Colorado Court of Appeals telling me this is how it's done. And I have the Colorado Supreme Court telling me this is how it's done. I am in no position as a trial court judge to say they're all wrong and I'm going to do it differently or to say, well, this is a death penalty case, so I'm going to do it differently. It doesn't work like that. As a judge, I'm bound by the law, and I have to follow the law. And the law is, yes, the jury has to consider the defense of insanity with respect to each count separately and independently. And I tell the jury that. That's why I emphasized the one instruction earlier that says exactly that. But in the end, we only care to know about the reason for a not guilty verdict if the jury finds the defendant not guilty of all the counts. Otherwise, we don't care. And that's the law in Colorado. The law in Colorado is, members of the jury, if you find the defendant guilty of even one count, then uh, we don't care about the reason uh, that you may find him not guilty of any other count. All we care about in terms of those other counts that you find the defendant not guilty of is that you're finding him not guilty. We don't care if it's because... The prosecution failed to prove that the defendant was sane or if it's because the prosecution failed to prove any other element of that crime charged. We don't care and we don't want to know. That's the law in Colorado and that's what I have to follow. And this then avoids the situation where you have a guilty verdict, say for example, on the count of first degree murder and a not guilty by reason of insanity verdict say, for example, on possession of possession or control of incendiary devices. What is the court to do in that situation? Does the court send the defendant to the Colorado Mental Health Institute of Pueblo, or does the court proceed to a sentencing proceeding? Uh, and, and this is what the law, part of what the law wants to avoid, and part of what the law avoids, and what the law says in Colorado is, if he's found guilty of even one count, then... We don't need to know as to the reason for any not guilty verdicts in the same case. All, all we need to know in that situation is that he was found not guilty of some other counts. And that's exactly what my verdict forms and the instructions um, as they have been drafted do. It is exactly consistent with Colorado law and it does exactly what Colorado law says. Uh, I don't find um, the uh, verdict forms confusing. I don't find the instructions confusing. 
Uh, and I don't believe the jury will find either confusing. Um, the defense's verdict forms, uh, Ms. Nelson asserted, are simpler or easier to understand. Well, this is not a, a contest for making it as simple as possible. It, the, the idea is I have to make them consistent with the law and then make them as simple as possible. I can't just say... I'm going to do it this way. Back on the record, this is the people of the state of Colorado versus James Egan Holmes, case number 12 CR 1522. The record should reflect that Mr. Holmes is present with Ms. Nelson and Ms. Spengler, and the people are represented now by Mr. Orman, Ms. Pearson, and Ms. Teach McGuire. Mr. Orman, before uh, we proceed to the theory of defense proposed instruction, during the break I was thinking more about the discussion we had on lesser included offenses and um, at the risk of giving everyone a headache. Uh, it seems to me that your argument would only apply with respect to the counts of first degree murder, extreme indifference, right? And attempted First degree murder, extreme indifference. Yes. Right, and and so in that case, we would be giving the jury lesser included offenses that are different for the different counts. Uh, so, with respect to first degree murder, after deliberation, an attempt to commit first degree murder after deliberation. Uh, I would be instructing on the lesser included offenses of second degree murder and manslaughter. Uh, but then with respect to the counts of first degree murder, extreme indifference, and attempt to commit first degree murder, extreme indifference, I would only be instructing on the lesser included offense of uh, manslaughter and attempt to commit manslaughter. And I meant to say with respect to the first said attempt, also. You know, Your Honor, I was actually thinking about that during the break, and I was, I think, too focused on the argument that tied it to insanity. And I am aware of precedent in Colorado that says that second-degree murder is a lesser-included offense of first-degree murder extreme indifference. And I, I still sort of agree with my I will not sort of I still agree with my argument regarding the insanity thing, but thinking about it more because we have that case that clearly says it's a lesser included. I it, I would rather if the court is going to give any lesser included, uh, give both of them rather than just manslaughter. Okay, all right, that solves it for me because I I think I have to give it with respect to manslaughter. Uh, given the state of the case law and given the, the state of the evidence. And again, that's not a statement on what I think about the evidence or what I think in terms of how the jury is going to come out on this. That's just a statement based on what the law requires me to analyze at this juncture in the proceedings. So, uh, and, and you hit the nail on the head because my concern was if we do it that way, then aren't we going to confuse the jury uh, and and I think we, we would, and so um, that solves it for me. So we will stick with the lesser included offenses that, that I said that I would give. All right, in terms of the uh, tender uh, theory of defense instruction, do the people have a position on this instruction, Mr. Orman? Yes, Your, yes, Your Honor, we do. We object, uh, at least in part. Uh, if, I, if I may, Your Honor, just to give the court some citations that I think are relevant, uh, Colorado does recognize that the defendant has the opportunity, if not the right, to present a theory of the defense instruction. However, the defendant cannot just present anything as a theory of the defense instruction. Uh, I, would, I would cite to a number of cases, and, and the, the cases discussing these concepts, Your Honor, are legion, and uh, I've just pulled out a couple of recent ones. People versus... Amwanda, O-M-W-A-N-D-A, which is 338 Pacific 3rd, 1145, Colorado Court of Appeals, 2014. And the, the pinpoint site to the language I'm going to quote is on page, well, Your Honor, 
there, with, since we have these numbered paragraphs, I'll just give you those. Numbered paragraphs 40 and 41. Uh, it ex explains, Your Honor, that a theory of defense instruction must be general and brief and must explain the evidence and its legal effect. Um, a defendant is generally entitled to a theory of defense instruction when the evidence in the record supports the instruction. A trial court must cooperate with counsel to correct an improper theory of defense instruction or draft an instruction that incorporates the substance of the defendant's theory. Uh, it goes on to say, a trial court may reject a theory of defense instruction that is argumentative or merely highlights specific pieces of evidence. A similar language, Your Honor, is found in People v. Hart, H-A-R-T-E, 131 Pacific 3rd, 1180, from the Colorado Court of Appeals, 2005. And that, Your Honor, is found on page 1186 of that decision. And... Um, it says a, a jury instruction on the theory of the case that explains evidence must be general and brief and must instruct the jury on the legal effect of the explanation. Um, it is not error, I'm skipping a sentence, it is not error for a trial court to refuse to give a theory of the case instruction that simply calls attention to specific points of evidence or contains argumentative matter. So uh, in light of sort of that overarching law on what a theory of the case or a theory of defense instruction is supposed to be, I will tell the court what my objections are to this. First of all, Your Honor, the entire instruction is improper in that it would read as the court finding and asserting specific facts. This instruction just sort of would have the court read to the defendant the defendant's own assertions about what his mental illness is. In other words, the first sentence reads currently in this instruction, Mr. Holmes suffers from a chronic and serious mental illness with psychotic features, period. The way this reads, it would be as if Your Honor is telling a jury that that's a fact. Theory of the case, theory of the defense instruction is not supposed to read that way. It should not read where it is interpreted by the jury that Your Honor is telling the jury that that's a fact, because in the United States, Your Honor, Everywhere in the United States, judges can't tell the jury what the facts are. The facts are for the jury to decide. And I mean no disrespect when I say that, Your Honor. It's just not something that judges are supposed to do. So to the extent that any portion of this is proper and it talks about factual assertions, I would say instead of Mr. Holmes suffers or something along those lines, it would need to read the defendant, which is the name of the party, the defendant asserts that he suffers, etc., cetera, et cetera, or something along those lines, to make it clear that this is not some type of factual finding where the court is telling the jury that this is what the facts are. So that's uh, one thing. Second thing is, Your Honor, the cases indicate a theory of the case, theory of the defense instruction should be brief. This isn't brief. This is pretty long. Also, Your Honor, it's argumentative, and a theory of the case, theory of the defense instruction, is not supposed to be argumentative. So if we look at this, Your Honor, uh, many paragraphs, uh, many paragraphs of the uh, proposed instruction from the defense are argumentative. Let's, let's start with the first one. I would say the first sentence of the first paragraph, if it is corrected to read, the defendant asserts that he uh, suffers from, etc. That first sentence would not be argumentative, and I would not have an objection to that one sentence if it is modified, as I said. The rest of it, Your Honor, is pure argument. It is essentially a pre-closing argument made under the guise of jury instructions. That is not the purpose of a theory of the defense instruction. Um, th this is just argumentative assertions by defense counsel in the guise of a jury instruction. Second paragraph, also, Your Honor, it's just part of an argument. It, is not, it does not say, here are some facts that the law should apply to, which I think is what a theory of the defense instruction is supposed to say, which is sort of what we would get in with that first sentence there. Same thing for the third paragraph, Your Honor. It's pure argument. Fourth paragraph, I assert, Your Honor, 
pure argument. Fifth paragraph, I assert, Your Honor, pure argument, as is the sixth paragraph and the seventh paragraph. Um, although, Your Honor, I guess I'd be okay with the uh, penultimate, which I think is the six paragraphs, first sentence, if it started with the defendant asserts that his, as opposed to this sort of factual statement that the court is supposed to give to the jury. The last sentence, Your Honor, is not only argumentative, it's irrelevant. Maybe that's, maybe that's a factor that should be considered by the jury as mitigation in a sentencing phase of this trial, but this but-for thing, that's not the law. That's not the law in this state. That's not the law as included in the other jury instructions and is irrelevant for purposes of the law. So uh, I, I, there's two sentences in this, as I said, Your Honor, that I'm okay with as long as they're modified so that they don't appear as factual statements on behalf of the court. Uh, otherwise, Your Honor, I object to the rest of this instruction. The second sentence that you're okay with, I think you said the sixth paragraph. Were you referring to the penultimate sentence? Your in- Honor, you're right. It's the seventh paragraph. It's I a- apologize. <laughs> it's the penultimate paragraph. All right. So which? tell me the sentence it's, so that we're all clear. Okay. It's a sentence that starts with Mr. Holmes's delusional belief system, etc., it's in the second to last paragraph. Gotcha. Okay. So uh, as long as that started with the defendant asserts that, I'd be okay with that sentence. So uh, hold on one second. And, Your Honor, I, I, I don't know if there would be a title to this instruction, but I would request that there would be. I know that counsel put that in there, but I think that was probably just for uh, convenience purposes so that we could differentiate it. But I would request that it actually say the defendant's theory of the case at the top. So it's really clear that this is something from the defendant, that the court is instructing them, and this is what the defendant's theory is. But this isn't the court's position, because the court has no position on any of these issues. Unless you have any questions for me, Your Honor, I don't have anything else to say. No, um, I do not have anything. Thank you. Ms. Nelson, any response? Yes, Your Honor. I am aware of the case law surrounding the defense's theory of the case um, instruction, and it's our position that this does comply with the case law. Um, First, with respect to Mr. Orman's first objection that it reads as though it's a fact and that the judge is telling the jury the facts, we don't have any objection to adding something to the first, um, you know, prior to the first paragraph that states it is Mr. Holmes's theory of the case. Uh, I do disagree with Mr. Orman that Mr. Holmes's name is the defendant. He has a name. His name is James Holmes. And so we would request that it would read Mr. Holmes's theory of the case. But I don't have a problem um, adding something that makes it clear that it's not the judge, uh, it's not the court telling the jury um, you know, what to believe, but that this is our theory of the case. So I think that would be appropriate. Um, with respect to his... Um, his position that this is not brief, I disagree. I think that given the length and complexity of this case, this um, this is a very brief uh, statement and summary of what our theory is. I mean, this case has been going on now for about three months. We've been in jury selection since January. Um, the case has been going on for three years. It's obviously a tremend- a case with a tremendous amount of evidence. And so we, the, you know, perhaps this would be a, a long, uh, overly long theory of defense instruction if this were a simple burglary case that lasted two days. But given what type of case this is and the magnitude of this case, I, I, I think it's a, it's a perfectly appropriate, um, perfectly appropriate in length. Uh, I disagree that that the instruction is argumentative. The instruction is supported by um, facts that are in evidence, and to the extent that it um, recites certain facts, I mean, those are facts that have been elicited from witnesses. I don't think there's anything in this instruction that is factually inaccurate. Uh, And I also disagree, just a moment, let me just check my notes here. I, I, I also disagree that the last sentence, with respect to the last sentence, that that, that is irrelevant. Certainly, the role that Mr. Holmes' mental illness played in this, the commission of these acts is the central issue for the jury. 
And this is not, this, the purpose of a theory of defense instruction is to set forth what our theory is. Um, our theory, which is supported by the testimony of doctors Reed, Metzner, Woodcock, and Gurr, is that Mr. Holmes's mental illness caused these tragic events to take place. That is what the testimony is, Your Honor. And if it wasn't relevant, then I don't know why the prosecution didn't object to that testimony being elicited. Um, it's the position of all four of the um, of the psychiatrists who examined Mr. Holmes in this case, and it's certainly relevant for the jury to consider how and to what extent his mental illness factored into the commission of these acts. If I may just have a moment um, to confer with Ms. Spengler. Yes. Um, I think just to revise uh, what I said earlier with respect to um, putting something in advising the, th the jury that it's uh, Mr. Holmes's position, I think instead of saying um, our request would be to um, include language before the first paragraph that says Mr. Holmes asserts that he suffers from a chronic and serious mental illness and, and take it from there. Rather than saying theory of defense, I think it would be more appropriate and more accurate to simply say, and simpler to say, Mr. Holmes asserts. And lastly, um, I would I would note, as the court knows, that if if there's any part of this instruction that the court finds to be improper, that the court has a positive duty to cooperate with defense counsel to either correct the tendered instruction or to incorporate the substance of this instruction into one that's drafted by the court. So we would make that request. And finally, I would rely on uh, Mr. Holmes's constitutional rights to due process, to a fair and reliable uh, sentencing proceeding, to um, a fair and impartial jury, uh, as protected by the 5th, 6th, 8th, and to present a defense, as protected by the 5th, 6th, 8th, and 14th Amendments of the United States Constitution and Colorado Constitution, Article 2, Sections 16, 20, 23, and 25. OK, thank you. Uh, my reaction uh, was similar to what Mr. Orman said. It reads more like a closing argument than, than a theory of defense instruction. Um, so I will um, look at it more closely over the weekend, and I will redraft it uh, pursuant to what the law says I should do. Um, I do think it makes sense to use theory of defense in the first sentence. That way we avoid having to use a title. I'm not using any titles on any of the other instructions. So I don't think it, it, it's appropriate to use a title on this particular instruction. Um, but um, I think it is appropriate then after that to, to talk about Mr. Holmes's assertions or contentions or um, claims or things to that effect. Um, but I'll need to uh, sit down and, and try to figure out how to redraft it uh, so as to um, make it an appropriate instruction. As tender, I find that it is improper. This is not a, a proper theory of defense instruction. This is more a closing argument. Um, in terms of whether to use Mr. Holmes or the defendant, uh, to be consistent with the rest of the instructions, I'm going to use the defendant. That's what, that's what I'm using in all the uh, other instructions, and I'm going to be consistent throughout. So the instruction is rejected. However, I will um, work on it and attempt to redraft it uh, to make it appropriate and to correct it. And what I propose is that we plan to meet again on Monday at some point. I don't need everyone to be here, but um, at least uh, one representative from each party to be here. So are the people available on Monday? We are at your service, Your Honor. All right. Uh, is the defense available, Ms. Nelson? Yes, sir. Okay. What time works best for you folks? One o'clock. One o'clock? Standing up, Ms. Teach McGuire whispered one o'clock, so I'm okay. going with one o'clock. Is my, one o'clock okay for you? My preference would be the morning. Morning. Um, you want to do I, nine I or ten or? I'm instructed that that's fine, Your Honor. Okay, what time? Do you, do you care? Nine, ten? Nine. 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 Is nine good? That's fine, Your Honor. All right, nine o'clock on, on Monday. Okay, is there anything else we uh, need to talk about at this time on behalf of the people, Mr. Orman? Not on behalf of me. I thought we were going to talk about their argument about opening statements for the penalty phase. Although I don't oh, know if that's right. Monday morning. 
Yeah, um, you know what? Actually, the more I, th I thought about this, um, the more I think I want to wait on this. So uh, let's just wait. And um, I, I don't feel comfortable discussing it, uh, especially um, right before closing arguments. I, I also don't feel comfortable having any discussions about this as the jury is deliberating. So just so that you know, I know that we had talked about maybe doing some work. I just it just doesn't feel right to me. I don't think it's appropriate to be having discussions about uh, penalty phase uh, while the jury is deliberating uh, on the guilt phase of the trial. So we'll just we'll just wait. Uh, I know that the people have submitted some tendered instructions for the penalty phase. If the defense wants to submit um, a red line version of those instructions, that you can do that. Uh, or if you want to submit different ones to add to those. You can do that. I'm not asking you to um, reinvent the wheel, uh, but I'm saying if you want to submit um, something ahead of time um, uh, in terms of any differences that you have from the pro prosecutions, you can do that, but um, you don't have to do that. I'll leave it up to you. We will be, Your Honor, and I have been working on them, and I, I regret to inform the court I probably will be in re reinventing the wheel. Uh, Fine. But, I, you know, I, some of them... I don't know, I'll have to give it some thought because we obviously we, we don't have a verdict yet. We don't know what the jury's verdict is going to be. There are a number of different ways that the verdict could come back given the different um, theories of murder alleged and whatnot. And um, so I, I don't know that it, I don't know, that, I certainly don't know that I can submit all of my proposed penalty phase instructions before a verdict, but um, you know, I can take take a look at them over the weekend and on Monday and um, I'm happy to get the get the court what I can get, what I feel I can submit as soon as I, as soon as I can. Okay, um, it's up to you. What I'm saying is, what would be most helpful to me is, to the extent you can, is point out differences between yours and theirs, if if that's possible. But if if not, then I'll have to try to figure it out. I mean, there are a ton of them, and it's it's difficult to try to figure out um, where you differ. <laughs> And that's what's important, uh, or most important. Uh, there are no model instructions here. The law is somewhat murky in this area. It's not as clear as it is uh, with respect to instructions on the guilt phase. So um, that, that's why I was suggesting that in terms of, you know, I don't need to have, for example, if there's a particular instruction that the people have submitted, I don't need to have an identical instruction submitted by you uh, if, if you don't disagree with theirs just to just because it's included in your set. That's not helpful to, to me. What's most helpful is to say, these are the ones we have an issue with, and these are the issues we have with them in terms of, that's why I, I mentioned red line, or even if it's not a red line version, even if they're separate, to say, uh, these are the ones that we take issue with, and, and this is how we think we, it should be done on those that we take issue with, or these are the particular places where we have issues with the ones tendered by the people, something along those lines. But again, I'm not going to require you to do that. I'm telling you what would be most helpful. I understand, Your Honor. And, and just so the court knows, we will be submitting our own set. Um, I mean, that's what we feel we need to do to provide Mr. Holmes with effective assistance of counsel and to preserve all of his, um, his constitutional rights. I'm also planning to go through the prosecution's um, proposed instructions as well, and I can identify um, places where I, I object specifically, but I, I agree this is going to be a little bit trickier than, than the, the merits phase instructions, assuming that we do get to a penalty phase. Um, Mr. Orman, the ones that you submitted, uh, wh what's the source for those? Is that, uh, does that come from prior cases that your office has done, death penalty cases, and have they been um, subject to review by the appellate court, by the Colorado Supreme Court. I wrote those up a long time ago, Your Honor. I'm trying to remember. My, here's what I did. I contacted the capital case um, unit at the AG's office, and I, they sent me a set of instructions that, that they have. I modified them slightly and obviously modified them so that they were uh, consistent with this case and that and I looked up a few things on my own and that's what I presented to the court okay well and miss Nelson what about your source or do you know yet 
or does that just come from um, breakers that you have in your office from past cases? Yes, I, I've, I've been working from um, some proposed instructions that were submitted in other capital cases that our office has, has done, but you know, mine, mine are, they're not identical to any of those, but I've, I've used those as sort of a, base, a baseline to get started, so. Well, to the extent you can provide that information, if they've been uh, scrutinized by an appellate court, then that would be helpful. Um, and, uh, you know, I know that uh, some opinions may refer to some instructions, but not necessarily all of them. But if they've been subjected to any kind of review, whichever one is being submitted um, by either side, it would be helpful for me to know. So. What I will do, I don't know if this would be helpful to the court, but next week I will try to get someone to go down to probably the state archives and maybe try to pull um, records on cases that have gone up to the Supreme Court. And maybe just, if it might be helpful to the court if I could just so get like the, uh, the Dunlap jury instructions or the Harlan jury instructions and give a complete set that were sub or, or subject to Supreme Court review. Um, I don't know if that would be helpful to the court. Just give the court a complete set so you can see what they look like. Maybe. I don't know. It's hard to say. It might be helpful. All right. Anything else, Ms. Nelson, from you before we adjourn? Yes, Your Honor. Well, two things. Um, I would request to make my argument about um, why we're entitled to an, why we believe we're entitled to an opening statement during um, any potential penalty phase now. We need to be able to plan, Your Honor, and you know, obviously, we don't know how the what the jury's verdict is going to be, but it's not like, I mean, we're going to be completely surprised and then put together, a, a, you know, a sentencing hearing in a day. I mean, you know, we've obviously been planning all along, and 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 so we need to we we, we need to be able to know, um, you know, in order to provide Mr. Holmes with effective assistance. And so my request would be to, to submit this additional authority and make this brief argument now so that we can get this issue resolved. Okay, that's fine. Tell me what the authority is. Well, I, Your Honor, I looked, and then just so the court knows, I also have one other matter after this uh, that I don't want to forget. Um, I did some research, and I could not find any rule or statute in Colorado um, that explicitly affords parties in criminal actions an opening statement, but it's clear that that the right to an opening statement in a criminal matter um, has has deep roots in common law in Colorado. Um, it's been cited in case law that goes back as far as 1904. Um, I found a case, Mulligan versus Smith, um, from 1904, 32 Colorado 404, that discusses the rules for opening statements. And so it's clear that in a in a typical criminal matter. Um, it's, it's a very long-standing right um, under Colorado law. It's hard to imagine a court depriving a defendant of an opening statement in any ordinary criminal trial in the state of Colorado. Um, the excuse me, model instructions um, describe an opening statement and its purpose, um, and it's clear that an opening statement is contemplated in criminal proceedings in Colorado. And my argument is that a, a sentencing hearing, a capital sentencing hearing, is essentially has all of the features of a trial. Um, it, we will be presenting evidence. There will be cross-examination. The rules of hearsay apply. There will be exhibits admitted. At the end, there will be a closing argument. The jury will be asked to deliberate. Again, assuming that we get to a penalty phase, if we get to a penalty phase. But in every respect, it's a full-fledged formal criminal proceeding at, with the, at which the jury will be asked to make the most important decision that a jury can be asked to make in a criminal matter. It, it, this isn't even just a question of whether Mr. Holmes would lose his liberty. It's a question of whether he, um, it, it's a, they're deciding the question of whether another human being should live or die. And so Mr. Holmes should be afforded all of the procedural rules and rights that a typical criminal trial has, given the heightened reliability that's required under the Eighth Amendment, as well as Article 2, Section 20 of the Colorado Constitution. And I'd say to Beck versus Alabama, Gardner versus Florida, Woodson versus North Carolina, and all of the other cases that we've relied upon for that proposition during the course of these proceedings. I was only able to find one Colorado capital case that references penalty phase opening, which is Dunlap 3, which is the 2007 decision um, from the Colorado Supreme Court 
at 173 P3, 1054. And that was um, uh, the point of the proceedings in which the case was on post-conviction review. And the issue presented was whether trial counsel um, was ineffective because of the arguments that he made during the, the penalty phase opening statement. So we know that a, an opening statement was given during um, that capital trial. And the argument was that um, the counsel's statement was constitutionally deficient because the attorney promised expert testimony and studies um, that were ultimately not produced. And the court analyzed the issue and concluded that there was no ineffective assistance of counsel but what's notable, or what was notable about the case to me, is that the uh, claim was resolved on the merits, and there was nothing in that court's opinion to suggest that it wasn't possible for counsel to have provided an effective assistance because a defendant doesn't have a right to an opening statement during a penalty phase of a trial to begin with. In other words, the implication um, that one can draw from that case is that Dunlap was entitled to a penalty phase opening and had the right to uh, effective assistance of counsel during that opening, but that you know, counsel was const performed in a constitutionally sufficient manner. Um, the statute, 18.1.3, uh, 1201.1b, capital sentencing statute in Colorado states that the prosecuting attorney and the defendant or the defendant's counsel shall be permitted to present arguments for or against a sentence of death. So that's a little bit ambiguous. I know that an opening is technically a statement and not an argument. Um, and, but what, a, what an opening statement is, is a factual presentation of the matters that the party expects to prove. And it, the purpose is to help the, prepare the jury to better understand that the, the evidence that they're going to hear. And so in a broad sense, you know, an opening statement relates to a closing argument. An opening statement is the part of the counsel's case in which we're arguing against the death penalty. We're giving the jury a roadmap um, about why they might be hearing from certain witnesses. Um, and it could inhibit the jury's full consider consideration of mitigation if we just start the hearing, start putting witnesses up, um, and the jury hasn't heard any kind of explanation from us, any kind of roadmap or introduction about you know why or what the purpose of, of, of this particular evidence that we would expect them to hear is, is going to be presented to them. We, you know, I know this issue is, uh, when Ms. Brady first brought this issue up, there was some concern about us making reference in an opening statement to different phases of the proceeding or whatever. We're happy to do two short openings or three short openings, however the court wants to structure it and limit our arguments or our statements to evidence that we intend, um, expect to be presented during each particular phase, we can structure it however the court would like, um, but we do um, believe that we are entitled to this very simple, basic, long-standing right in a criminal proceeding, given that the sentencing proceeding has all of the features of a, um, of a, of a criminal trial um, that I discussed earlier. Um, we'd rely on due process, right to a fair trial, fair and reliable sentencing proceeding, uh, Mr. Holmes's right to the effective assistance of counsel, his right to present a defense, and right to fundamental fairness under the 5th, 6th, 8th, 14th Amendments to the United States Constitution and Colorado Constitution, Article 2, Sections 16, 20, 23, and 25, and the heightened re reliability that is required because this, is, this would be a proceeding in which the, um, the prosecution is seeking the death penalty against Mr. Holmes. Again, all premised on the... Um, the possibility that the, of, a, of a penalty phase in this case, which, as we know, um, is a possibility, but we don't obviously know how the jury is going to, um, what verdict the jury will render at this point. Okay. Your Honor, so what now the defense appears to be asking for is many opening statements, numerous little mini opening statements for various phases of any potential sentencing phase in this case, but they have not presented the court with any authority that they have a right to that. The defendant has had an opening statement in this case and gave one in this case. The sentencing phase of this case is not a separate trial. It is a continuation of this trial. It is a continuation of these proceedings. There is no rule of criminal procedure nor precedent that has been cited to this court that affords the defendant the relief that he seeks. Also, Your Honor, I, I, I just think of this from a logistical perspective. I guess it would be easy if there were opening statements in the first phase, which 
we've presented all the evidence we need. We're not going to present any additional evidence in the first phase. Um, okay, so we would. So you're anticipating only argument in the first. Only phase. argument. So right. So given that, Ms. Nelson, um, it's it's sort of this is sort of more relevant to phase two and phase three. If we get to phase two and phase three, assuming there is a sentencing hearing, right? Correct. Okay. Right. So let's get to phase two. Who goes first? And I don't mean that in the Abbott and Costello sense. I mean who goes first? Who goes second? Because, um, as the court knows and as we've litigated, neither party has a burden of proof. Uh, it would be ridiculous, I would assert, for the court to make us go first because the defendant is going to present mitigation evidence first and we'll have an opportunity to rebut that. If the defendant goes first, um, does that sort of imply to the jury that they have a burden of proof because we went first in the guilt phase of the trial? I, I don't know. Also, Your Honor, it sort of puts us behind the eight ball on this because the court, and I'm not disagreeing with the court's decision, I'm just stating that this is like the rules of football. I might want a 15 yards for a first down, but it's 10. The court has said the defendant did not have to give us statements from their potential expert witnesses, and there's at least one important, important expert witness that they even told us they intend to call where we got nothing, nothing about what he's going to say. Nothing. So any rebuttal that we got to make up is going to be on the fly. We have our experts endorsed. They're going to watch. They're going to be ready. But we don't know what they're going to say because we don't know what the defendant's expert's going to say. So we would be expected to say, okay, here's what you're going to hear from us. We don't know. You're going to hear something. You're going to hear something from us on that point. But we don't know what it is because the defendant didn't give us a statement from this key expert witness that they have. That places us in an extremely unfair situation, Your Honor. Unfair situation. That's for phase two. There, for phase three, it'd be easier for us because we know what evidence we're going to present in the third phase, um, assuming the defendant knows. But then again, who goes first? I don't know. I guess the court could flip a coin or whatever, make a decision, because both sides are going to present their evidence in phase three. But uh, the jury is going to hear it. And the jury's going to be instructed. And I don't think they need to hear, frankly, lawyers speak to them any more than necessary. What they need to hear is evidence. And they need to hear instructions from the court. And then they can hear our arguments. But counsel's right when she says arguments, opening statements, are not arguments. And a statute that provides the parties with the opportunity to make argument does not afford them the opportunity to make an opening statement. So I, I don't think that it's necessary. I don't think that the defendant is entitled to it. I don't think the court will be denying the defendant any right, much less a constitutional right, by saying, well, let's just put on evidence in these phases. Um, that's all I got to say unless you have any questions for me, Your Honor. No, thank you. Well, Ms. Nelson, my understanding from Ms. Brady and from what you said just now is that um, the reason you're asking for an opening statement is to be able to tell the jury what to expect and to introduce the mitigation that you're intending to present and to be able to orient the jury in terms of um, what mitigating factors you're presenting evidence on. For example, uh, this evidence goes to this particular mitigating factor. This evidence will go to this particular mitigating factor. Uh, that's how I have understood Ms. Brady, Ms. Brady's comments and your comments. And frankly, I think that would be helpful. Uh, I've thought some about this, and I think it would be helpful to have that. But it, it doesn't need to be more than something that's very brief, simply to introduce what's about to happen uh, in general. And so I'll give you uh, a couple of minutes uh, to introduce your case in phase two, but you'll go first. The prosecution will go second. And then in phase three, the prosecution will go first and you'll go second, and you'll each have a couple of minutes for opening statements as well. Again, just to provide a general roadmap about what you anticipate the uh, evidence uh, will be in that particular phase, assuming that we have a sentencing hearing, or in case we have a sentencing hearing and we get, we get to that phase of the sentencing hearing. There's no need for opening statements in the first phase because the people are not going to introduce evidence, and both sides agree that it's just going to be arguments. So it's just one set of arguments. All right? Okay, is there anything else? Ms. Nelson, you said you, you had one other thing. What, what is it? Can I ask a clarification on one yes. brief thing, Your Honor? You said a couple minutes. I'm assuming that means two minutes flat. That's what I mean, two minutes, yes. 
Ms. Nelson, what else? Your Honor, I just wanted to make a record that we renew our motion for judgment of acquittal now that um, at the close of all the evidence. Okay. And for the same reasons that I denied it at the close of the people's evidence, it is denied now. It's the same standard that applies and the same uh, reasons um, apply as well. And I incorporate by reference um, the comments Mr. Orman made in response to the motion, which I agreed with at the time of the, uh, at the end of the people's case in chief. Anything else? Sorry, I do have one more thing. Um, we did confer a little bit about the exhibit discrepancies, and I have a couple of things that um, I can bring to your staff's attention. Um, there were just a few pieces of evidence that that were described one way in our chart, and described another way um, in the court's chart, and and if we could maybe have um, your staff like pull those pieces of evidence just so we can resolve any discrepancies maybe on Monday morning or something? Actually, why don't you do it way? today and then that way if I need to get involved then I can get involved on Monday morning. That would okay. be my preference. So if you would stay back for a little bit, I'll have my staff come out and talk to you folks and then sure. let's try to figure out where the discrepancies are and then if there's a need to make a record on Monday, I can make a record. Your Honor, I don't object to that in principle, but um, as, as Your Honor indicated, we don't have all the attorneys here and one of them I think would be necessary for a couple pieces of the evidence and also your honor our paralegal was the one who was keeping track of our exhibit list and everything and I'd really want her to be here for this and we sent her back to the office because there really That's wasn't anything to do actually she went home so uh, I understand your honor's position but my request would be to do this Monday morning are you okay doing it Monday morning and I'm happy to email Ms. Robinson just to give her a heads up about which of the you know what the they're pretty minor issues but I just want to make sure we're accurate so that would be helpful. Why don't we do it that way? And then Monday morning, have whoever needs to be here for that be present. Okay? All right. The court will be in recess. Thank you, everyone. Please rise. Good afternoon. It seems like everyone in that courtroom was getting tired, and so they're wrapping up the day about an hour earlier than expected, but still work to be done on Monday. Got to finish these instructions, got to deal now with some question of evidence descriptions on the chart, uh, as the defense uh, was just pointing out there. So things yet to be done before closing arguments on Tuesday. Because of this early hour, because it has been uh, s several long weeks in a row, we are going to wrap up our coverage in just a minute. But let's take just one quick second to review, to talk about the things that happened today, because it was a momentous day, major progress and surprises earlier today. Just before lunchtime, finding out the defense was definitively done, resting their case. They have made their case for this phase of the trial. The prosecution, with a surprise to all of us, deciding that they would not call a rebuttal witness. And now, suddenly, we are on the cusp of closing arguments days ahead of what we had previously expected. We now have then uh, Monday, these hearings to get these final issues out of the way. And then Tuesday morning, uh, 9 a.m., we're going to start with those instructions being read to the jury for the first time. And then we'll get into the meat of it, George Brockler, with his uh, chance to go first in that closing argument, followed by the defense, followed by uh, probably a lunch break somewhere in there. Uh, and then uh, George Brockler will get a chance to use a rebuttal, assuming he saved time the way he plans to. And then that's it. The jury's going to be deliberating, and we're going to be waiting for their answers to how they find on these 165 counts, will the gunman be found guilty or not guilty by reason of insanity? That is the question the 12 voting jurors will face. Of course, we're also going to find out which of the 19 remaining members of the panel are our voting jurors and which seven are the alternates. All of this is a mystery to be solved on Tuesday. So we do hope you'll join us at that point. And we do hope you'll join us on Monday. This has certainly been a, a tiring afternoon for all of us. And certainly it appears to be tiring for everyone there in that courtroom. But we are having a lesson in the process of the law and certainly all of these things are important to carrying out the law to its fullest extent and it's something that we're going to uh, continue to carry
for all of you live on our webcasts here through YouTube, through the 7 News Denver app, and through the denverchannel.com, and anywhere else you might be finding our embedded video stream today. We thank you for joining us throughout all of this week and through all of the breaking news that happened this week. We will see you all again bright and early Monday morning. Have a great weekend.